Chapter One of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Must we part? Or may I linger? Wax the shadows, wanes the day. Then with voice of sweetest singer, That hath all but died away. Go, she said, but tighten finger, Said articulately, stay. Chapter 1 Philosophy triumphs easily over past and over future evils, But present evils triumph over philosophy. A letter from my father, says Mr. Monkton, flinging the letter in question across the breakfast table to his wife. A letter from Sir George? Her dark, pretty face flushes crimson. And such a letter after eight years of obstinate silence. There, read it, says her husband contemptuously. The contempt is all for the writer of the letter. Mrs. Monkton taking it up with a most honest curiosity that might almost be termed anxiety, reads it through, and in turn flings it from her as though it had been a scorpion. Never mind, Jack, says she with a great assumption of indifference that does not hide from her husband the fact that her eyes are full of tears. Butter that bit of toast for me before it is quite cold and give Joyce some ham. Ham, darling, or an egg? To Joyce, with a forced smile that makes her charming face quite sad. Have you two been married eight whole years? asked Joyce, laying her elbows on the table, and staring at her sister with an astonished gaze. It seems like yesterday. What a swindler old time is! To look at Barbara, one would not believe she could have been born eight years ago. Nonsense, says Mrs. Monkton, laughing, and looking as pleased as married women, even the happiest, always do, when they are told they look unmarried. Why, Tommy is seven years old. Oh, that's nothing, says Joyce airily, turning her dark eyes that are lovelier, if possible, than her sister's, upon the sturdy child who is sitting at her father's right hand. Tommy, we all know, is much older than his mother, much more advanced, more learned in the wisdom of this world, aren't you, Tommy? But Tommy at this present moment is deaf to the charms of conversation, his young mind being nobly bent on proving to his sister a priceless treasure of six that the salt cellar planted between them belongs not to her, but to him. This sounds reasonable, but the difficulty lies in making Mabel believe it. There comes the pause, eloquent at last, and then, I regret to say, the free fight. It might perhaps have been even freer, but for the swift intervention of the paternal relative, who, swooping down upon the two belligerence with a promptitude worthy of all praise seizes upon his daughter and in spite of her kicks which are noble removes her to the seat on his left hand thus separated hope springs within the breasts of the lookers-on that peace may soon be restored and indeed after a sob or two from mabel and a few passes of the most rehensible sort from tommy entirely of the facial order a great calm falls upon the breakfast room when i was your age tommy said mr monkton addressing his son and striving to be all that the orthodox parent ought to be i should have been soundly whipped if i had behaved to my sister as you have just now behaved to yours you haven't a sister says tommy after which the argument falls flat. It is true. Mr. Monkton is innocent of a sister, 
But how did the little demon remember that so apropos? Nevertheless, said Mr. Monkton, if I had a sister, I know I should not have been unkind to her. Then she'd have been unkind to you, said Tommy, who is evidently not afraid to enter upon a discussion of the rights and wrongs of mankind with his paternal relative. Look at Mabel, and I don't care what she says, with a vindictive glance at the angelic featured Mabel, who glares back at him with infinite promise of a future settlement of all their disputes in their ethereal eyes. Twas my salt cellar, not hers. Ladies first, pleasure afterwards, says his father somewhat idly. Oh, Freddy, says his wife. Situdious language, I call it, says Jocelyn with a laugh. Eh? said Mr. Monkton. Why, what on earth have I been saying now? I quite believed I was doing the heavy father to perfection and teaching Tommy his duty. Nice duty, says Jocelyn, with a pretense of indignation that makes her charming face a perfect picture, teaching him to regard us as second best. I like that. Good heavens! Did I give that impression? I must have swooned, said Mr. Monkton penitently. When last in my senses I thought, I had been telling Tommy that he deserved a good whipping, and that if good old time could so manage as to make me my own father, he would assuredly have got it. Oh, your father! said Mrs. Monkton in a low tone. There is enough expression in it, however, to convey the idea to everyone present that, in her opinion, her husband's father would be guilty of any atrocity at a moment's notice. Well, twas my salt cellar, says Tommy again stoutly, and as if totally undismayed by the vision of the grandfatherly scourge held out to him. After all, we none of us feel things much unless they come personally home to us. Was it? said Mr. Monkton mildly. Do you know I really quite fancied it was mine? What? says Tommy, cocking his ear. He, like his sister, is in a certain sense of fraud. For Tommy has the face of a seraph with the heart of a hoardy Norseman. There is nothing indeed that Tommy would not dare. Mine, you know, says his father, even more mildly still. No, it wasn't, says Tommy, with decision. It was at my side of the table. Yours is over there. Thomas, says his father, with a rueful shake of the head that signifies his resignation of the argument. It is indeed a pity that I am not like my father. Like him? Oh, no, said Mrs. Monkton emphatically, impulsively. The latent dislike to the family who had refused to recognize her on her marriage with her, their son taking fire at this speech. Her voice sounds almost hard, the gentle voice that in truth was only meant by Mother Nature to give expression to all things kind and loving. She has leant a little forward, and a swift flush is dying in her cheek. She is, of all women, the youngest looking, for her years, as a matron indeed, she seems absurd. The delicate bloom of girlhood seems never to have left her, but, as though in love of her beauty, has clung to her day by day, so that now, when she has known eight years of married life, and some of them deeply tinctured with care, the cruel care that want of money brings, she looks as though the morning of womanhood was as yet but dawning for her. And this is because love the beautifuler went with her all the way. Hand in hand he has traveled with her on the stony paths that those who marry must undoubtedly pursue. Never once 
had he let go his hold and so it is that her lovely face has defied time though after all that obnoxious ancient has not yet had much opportunity given him to spoil it and at twenty-five she looks but a little older than her sister who is just eighteen and seven years younger than she is her pretty soft grey irish eyes that are nearly not black as it is possible for them to be are still filled with the dews of youth her mouth is red and happy her hair so distinctly chestnut at is to be almost guilty of a shade of red in it here and there covers her dainty head in rippling masses that fall lightly forward and rest upon a brow snow-white and low and broad as any greeks might be she has spoken a little hurriedly with some touch of anger but quick as the anger was born so quickly does it die i shouldn't have said that perhaps says she sending a little tremendous glance at her husband from behind the urn but i shouldn't help it i can't bear to hear you say you would like to be like him she smiles a little gentle don't be angry with me smile scarcely to be resisted by any man and certainly not by her husband who adores her it is scarcely necessary to record this last fact as all who run may read it for themselves but it saves time to put it in black and white but why not my dear said mr monkton magisterically surely considering all things you have reason to be deeply grateful to sir george why then abuse him grateful to sir george to your father cries his wife hotly and quick and freddy from his sister-in-law brings him to a full stop for a moment do you mean to tell me says he thus brought to bay that you have nothing to thank sir george for he is addressing his wife nothing nothing declared she vehemently to the remembrance that last letter from her husband's father that still lies within reach of her view lending a suspicion of passion to her voice oh my dear girl consider says mr monkton lively reproach in his tone has he not given you me the best husband in europe ah what is it to be modest says joyce with her little quick brilliant laugh well it's not true said mr monkton who has laughed also in spite of herself and the soreness at her heart he did not give you to me you made me that gift of your own free will i have as i have said before nothing to thank him for i always think he must be a silly old man says joyce which seems to put a fitting termination to the conversation the silence that ensues annoyed tommy who dearly loves to hear the human voice divine as expressed by himself first but if that can be impractical when then by somebody else anything is better than dull silence is he that asks he eagerly of his aunt though i speak of her as his aunt i hope it will not be misunderstood for a moment that tommy totally declines to regard her in any reverential light whatsoever a playmate a close friend a confidant a useful sort of person if you will but certainly not an aunt in the general acceptation of that term from the very first year that speech fell on them both mabel and he refused to regard miss kavanagh as anything but a confederate in all their scrapes a friend to rejoice with in all their triumphs she had never been aunt never indeed even so much as the milder ante to them she had been joyce only for the very commencement of their acquaintance 
the united commands of her both father and mother feebly enforced had been insufficient to compel them to address this most charming specimen of girlhood by any grown-up title to them their aunt was just such as one as themselves only perhaps a little more so in lovely creature at all events and lovable as lovely a little inconsequent perhaps at times but always amiable to reason when put into a corner and full of the glad laughter of youth is he what says she now returning tommy's eager gaze the best husband in europe he says that with a doubtful stare at his father why the very best of course says joyce nodding emphatically always remember that tommy it's a good thing to be you know you'll want to be that won't you but if she has to hope to make a successful appeal to tommy's noble quantities hitherto it must be confessed carefully kept hidden she finds herself greatly mistaken no i won't says the truculent person distinctly i want to be a big general with a cocked hat and to kill people i don't want to be a husband at all what's the good of that to pursue this object would be to court defeat said mr monkton meekly he rises from the table and seeing him move his wife rises too you are going to your study asked she a little anxiously he is about to say no to this but a glance at her face checks him you come with me says he instead answering the lovely silent appeal in her eyes that letter has no doubt distressed her she will be happier when she has talked it over with him they two alone as for you thomas says his father i am quite aware that you ought to be consigned to the dungeon keep after your late behavior but as we don't keep one on the premises i'll let you off this time meanwhile i haste to my study to pen with the assistance of your enraged mother a letter to our landlord that will induce him to add one on at once to this building after which we shall be able to incarcerate you at our pleasure but not at yours on any and every hour of the day who's don john asked tommy totally unimpressed but filled with lively memories of those spaniards and other foreign powers who unkindly made more difficult his hateful lessons off and on End of chapter one recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit CompleteAudiobooks.com for more quality content. Chapter 2 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Fox April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 2 No Laugh Lasts Between Us Well, says Mr. Monkton, turning to his wife, as the study, a rather nondescript place, is reached. He has closed the door, and is now looking at her, with a distinctly quizzical light in his eyes, and in a smile that parts his lips. Now for it. Have no qualms. I've been preparing myself all through breakfast, and I think I shall survive it. You are going to have it out with me, aren't you? Not with you, says she, returning his smile indeed, but faintly and without heart. That horrid letter. I felt I must talk of it to someone, and... I was that mythical person. I quite understand. 
I take it as a special compliment. I know it is hard on you, but when I am really vexed about anything, you know, I always want to tell you about it. I should feel it a great deal harder if you didn't want to tell me about it, says he. He has come nearer to her and has pressed her into a chair. A dilapidated affair that if ever it had a best day has forgotten it by now, and yet for all that is full of comfort. I am only sorry, moving away again and leaning against the chimney piece, that you should be so foolish as to let my father's absurd prejudices annoy you at this time of day. He will always have it in his power to annoy me, says she quickly, that perhaps, with a little burst of feeling, is why I can't forgive him. If I could forget, or grow indifferent to it all, I should not have this hurt feeling in my heart. But he is your father, and though he is the most unjust, the cruelest man on earth, I still hate to think he should regard me as he does. There is one thing, however, you do forget, says Mr. Monkton gravely. I don't want to apologize for him, but I would remind you that he has never seen you. That's only an aggravation of his offense her colour heightening. The very fact that he should condemn me, unseen, unhurt, adds to the wrong he has done me instead of taking from it. She rises abruptly and begins to pace up and down the room. The hot Irish blood in her veins of fire. No. With a little impatient gesture of her small hand, I can't sit still. Every pulse seems throbbing. He has opened up all the old wounds and... She passes and then turns upon her husband two lovely flashing eyes. Why? Why should he suppose that I am Fogger, lowly born, unfit to be your wife? My darling girl, what can it matter what he thinks? A ridiculous, headstrong old man in one scale, and... But it does matter. I want to convince him that I am not, not what he believes me to be. Then come over to England and see him. No, never. I shall never go to England. I shall always stay in Ireland. Always. My own land. The land whose people he detests because he knows nothing about them. It was one of his chief objections to your marriage with me that I was an Irish girl. She stopped short, as though her wrath and indignation and contempt is too much for her. Barbara, says Monkton, very gently, but with a certain reproach. Do you know you almost make me think that you regret our marriage? No, I don't, quickly. If I talked forever, I shouldn't be able to make you think that. But, she turns to him suddenly and gazes at him through large eyes that are heavy with tears. I shall always be sorry for one thing, and that is that you first met me where you did. And your aunt's, Mrs. Burke's. She is not my aunt with a little frown of distaste. She is nothing to me so far as blood is concerned. Oh, Freddy! She stops close to him and gives him a grief-stricken glance. I wish my poor father had been alive when first you saw me, that we could have met for the first time in the old home. It was shabby, faded, her face paling now with intense emotion. But you would have known at once that it had been a fine old place and that the owner of it... She breaks down, very slightly, almost imperceptibly, but Monkton understands that even one more word is beyond her. That the owner of it, like St. Patrick, came of decent people, quotes he, with an assumption of gaiety he is far from feeling. My good child, I don't want to see anyone to know that of you. You carry the sign manual. It is written in large characters all over you. Yet I wish you had known me before my father died, says she, her grief and fright still unassuaged. He was so unlike anybody else. His manners were so lovely. He was offered a baronetcy at the end of that white boy business on account of his loyalty. That nearly cost him his life, but he refused it, thinking the old name good enough without a handle to it. Kavanagh, we all know, is a good name. If he had accepted that title... He would have been, as, the same as your father. There is defiance in this sentence. Quite the same. No, no, he would not. Her defiance now changes into sorrowful honesty. Your father has been a baronet for centuries. 
my father would have only been a baronet for a few years. For centuries, repeats Mr. Monkton with an alarmed air. There is a latent sense of humour, or rather an appreciation of humour, about him that hardly endears him to the opposite sex. His wife, being Irish, condones it, because she happens to understand it. But there are moments, we all know, when even the very best and most appreciative women refuse to understand anything. This is one of them. "'Condemn my father, if you will,' says Mr. Monkton. "'Accuse him of all the crimes in the calendar. "'But for my sake, give up the belief that he is the real and original wandering Jew, "'Debrett, Burke, either of those immaculate people, "'will prove to you that my father ascended his throne in—' "'You can laugh at me if you like, Freddy,' says Mrs. Monkton, "'with severity tempered, with dignity. "'But if you laughed until this day month, "'you couldn't make me forget the things that make me unhappy.' "'I don't want to,' says Mr. Monkton, "'still disgracefully frivolous. "'I'm one of the things, and yet—' "'Don't,' says his wife, so abruptly, "'and with such an evident determination to give way to mirth, "'coupled with an equally strong determination to give way to tears.' "'that he at once lays down his arms. "'Go on, then,' says he, seating himself beside her. "'She is not in the armchair now, but on an ancient and respectable sofa "'that gives ample room for the accommodation of two, "'a luxury denied by that old curmudgeon, the armchair. "'Well, it is this, Freddy, when I think of that dreadful old woman, Mrs. Burke. "'I feel as though you thought she was a fair sample of the rest of my family.' But she is not a sample. She has nothing to do with us. An uncle of my mother married her because she was rich, and there her relationship to us began and ended. Still, yes, I know, you needn't remind me. It seems burnt into my brain. I know she took us in after my father's death, and covered me in joys with benefits when we hadn't a penny in the world we could call our own. I quite understand, indeed. "'that we should have starved but for her. "'And yet, yet, passionately, "'I cannot forgive her for perpetually reminding us "'that we had not that penny. "'It must have been a bad time,' says Monkton slowly. "'He takes her hand and smooths it lovingly between both of his. "'She was vulgar. "'That was not her fault. "'I forgive her that. "'What I can't forgive her is the fact "'that you should have met me in her house.' A little unfair, isn't it? Is it? You will always now associate me with her. I shan't indeed. Do you think I have up to this? Nonsense. A more absurd amalgamation I couldn't fancy. She was not one of us, feverishly. I have never spoken to you about this, Freddy, since that first letter your father wrote to you just after our marriage. You remember it? And then, I couldn't explain somehow. But now... This last letter has upset me dreadfully. I feel as if it was all different, and that it was my duty to make you aware of the real truth. Sir George thinks of me as one beneath him. That is not true. He may have heard that I lived with Mrs. Burke, and that she was my aunt. But if my mother's brother chose to marry a woman of no family because she had money, contemptuously, that might disgrace him, but would not make her kin to us. You saw her, you, lifting distressed eyes to his, you thought her dreadful, didn't you? I have only had one thought about her, that she was good to you in your trouble, and that but for her I should never have met you. That is like you, says she gratefully, yet impatiently, but it isn't enough. I want you to understand that she is quite unlike my own real people, my father, who was like a prince. "'throwing up her hat. "'And my uncle, his brother. "'You have an uncle, then?' "'With some surprise. "'Oh, no, hat, sadly. "'He is dead, then. "'Yes, I suppose so. "'You are wondering, says she quickly, "'that I have never spoken to you of him "'or my father before. "'But I could not. "'The thought that your family objected to me, "'despised me, "'seemed to compel me to silence. "'And you, you asked me very little.' How could I, Barbara? Any attempt I made was repulsed. I thought it kinder to. Yes, I was wrong. I see it now. But I couldn't bear to explain myself. 
I told you what I could about my father, and that seemed to me sufficient. Your people's determination to regard me as impossible tied my tongue. I don't believe it was that, says he laughing. I believe we were so happy that we didn't care to discuss anything but each other. Delightful subjects full of infinite variety. We have sat so lightly to the world all these years, that if my father's letter had not come this morning, I honestly think we should never have thought about him again. This is scarcely true, but he is bent on giving her mind a happier turn if possible. What's the good of talking to me like that, Freddy? says she reproachfully. You know one never gets anything of that sort. A slight, I mean, and from one's own family. You are always thinking of it. You know you are. Well, not always, my dear, certainly, says Mr. Monkton, temporizing, and if even I do give way to retrospection, it is to feel indignant with both my parents. Yes, and I don't want you to feel like that. It must be dreadful, and it is my fault. When I think how I felt towards my dear old dad and my uncle, I... Well, never mind that. I've got you, and without meaning any gross flattery, I consider you worth a dozen dads. Tell me about your uncle. He died? We don't know. He went abroad fifteen years ago. He must be dead, I think, because if he were alive, he would certainly have written to us. He was very fond of Joyce and me, but no letter from him has reached us for years. He was charming. I wish you could have known him. So do I, if you wish it. But, coming over, and sitting down beside her, don't you think it is a little absurd, Barbara, after all these years, to think it necessary to tell me that you have good blood in your veins? Is it not a self-evident fact? And one more word, dearest. Surely you might do me the credit to understand that I could never have fallen in love with anyone who hadn't an ancestor or two. And yet your father. I know, rising to his feet, his brow darkening. Do you think I don't suffer doubly on your account, that I don't feel the insolence of his behavior toward you, fourfold? There is but one excuse for him and my mother, and that lies in their terrible disappointment about my brother, their eldest son. I know you have told me, begins she quickly, but he interrupts her. Yes, I have been more open with you than you with me. I feel no pride where you are concerned. Of course, my brother's conduct towards them is no excuse for their conduct towards you. But when one has a sore heart, one is apt to be unjust and many other things. You know what a heartbreak he has been to the old people, and is. A gambler, a dishonorable gambler. He turns away from her, and his nostrils dilate a little. His right hand grows clenched. Every spare penny they possess has been paid over to him of his creditors. And they are not overburdened with riches. They had set their hearts on him, and all their hopes, and when he filled them, they fell back on me. The name is an old one. Money was wanted. They had arranged a marriage for me. That would have been worldly wise. I too disappoint them. Oh! She has sprung to her feet, and is staring at him with horrified eyes. A marriage! There was someone else! You accuse me of want of candor. And now, you, did you ever mention this before? Now, Barbara, don't be the baby your name implies, says he, placing her firmly back in her seat. I didn't marry that heiress, you know, which is proof positive that I loved you, not her. But she, she, she stammers and ceases suddenly, looking at him with a glance full of question. Woman-like, everything has given way to the awful thought that this unknown had not been unknown to him, and that perhaps he had admired, loved. "'Couldn't hold a candle to you,' says he, laughing in spite of himself at her expression, which indeed is nearly tragic. "'You needn't suffocate yourself with charcoal because of her. She had made her pal, or rather her father had, at Birmingham or elsewhere. I never took the trouble to inquire, and she was undoubtedly solid in every way. But I don't care for the female giant.' And so I, you know the rest, I met you. I tell you this only to soften your heart, if possible, towards these lonely and bitter old people of mine. Do you mean that when your brother disappointed them that they... She pauses. No, they couldn't make me their heir. 
The property is strictly entailed. What is left of it? You need not make yourself miserable, imagining you have done me out of anything more than their good will. George will inherit whatever he has left them to leave. It is sad, says she, with downcast eyes. Yes. He has been a constant source of annoyance to them ever since he left Eton. Where is he now? Abroad, I believe. In Italy, somewhere, or France. Not far from a gaming table, you may be sure. But I know nothing very exactly, as he does not correspond with me. And that letter of this morning is the first I have received from my father for four years. He must indeed hate me, says she, in a low tone. His elder son. Such a failure. And you... He considers you a failure, too. Well, I don't consider myself so, says he gaily. They were in want of money, and you, you married a girl without a penny. I married a girl who was herself a mine of gold, returns he, laying his hands on her shoulders, and giving her a little shake. Come, never mind that letter, darling. What does it matter when all is said and done? The first, after all these years, and the last. You remember it. It was terrible. Am I unreasonable if I remember it? It was a cruel letter, says he slowly. To forget it would be impossible, either for you or me. But as I said just now, how does it affect us? You have me, and I have you, and they, those foolish old people, they have, he passes abruptly, and then goes on in a changed tone, their memories. Oh, and sad ones, cries she sharply as if hurt it is a terrible picture you have conjured up you and i so happy and they how poor old people they have wronged you slighted you ill-treated you says he looking at her but they are unhappy they must be wretched always about your brother their first child oh what a grief is theirs what a heart is yours says he drawing her to him barbara Surely I shall not die until they have met you and learned why I love you. End of chapter 2《Three of April's Lady》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Foss. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter Three. It was a lover and his lass, with a hey and a ho and a hey no ni no, that o'er the green cornfield did pass in the springtime, the only pretty ring time, when birds do sing hey ding a ding, sweet lovers laugh to spring. Joyce is running through the garden, all the sweet wild winds of heaven playing round her. They are a little wild still. It is the end of lovely May. But though languid summer is almost with us, a suspicion of a more sparkling sister, spring fills all the air. Miss Kavanagh has caught up the tail of her gown and is flying as if for dear life. Behind her come the foe, fast and furious. Tommy, indeed, is now dangerously close at her heels, armed with a ferocious-looking garden fork, his face crimson, his eyes glowing with the ardor of the chase. Mabel, much in the background, is making a bad third. Miss Kavanagh is growing distinctly out of breath. In another moment, Tommy will have her. By this time he has fully worked himself into the belief that he is a red Indian, and she his lawful prey, and is prepared to make a tomahawk of his fork, and having felt her, to scalp her somehow when Providence shows her a corner round a rhododendron bush that may save her for the moment. She makes for it, gains it, turns it, dashes round it, and all but precipitates herself into the arms of a young man who has been walking leisurely towards her. He is a tall young man, not strictly handsome, but decidedly good to look at with honest hazel eyes and a shapely head and altogether very well set up as a rule, he is one of the most cheerful people alive, and a tremendous favourite in his regiment, the Hussars, though just now it might suggest itself to the intelligent observer that he considers he has been hardly used. A very little more haste, and that precipitation must have taken place. 
he had made an instinctive movement towards her with protective arms outstretched but though a little cry had escaped her she had maintained her balance and now stands looking at him with laughing eyes and panting breath and two pretty hands pressed against her bosom mr dissert lets his disappointed arms fall to his sides and assumes the aggrieved air of one who has been done out of a good thing you says she when at last she can speak i suppose so returns he discontentedly he might just as well have been any one else or anywhere else such a chance and gone never were you so welcome cries she darching behind him as tommy fully armed and all alive comes staring round the corner ah ha tommy salt i've got a champion now i'm no longer shivering in my shoes mr dissert will protect me won't you mr dissert to the young man who says yes without stirring a muscle the heaviest bribe would not have induced him to move because standing behind him she has laid her dainty fingers on his shoulders from which safe position she mocks at tommy with security were the owners of the shoulders to stir the owners of the fingers might remove the delightful members need it be said that with this awful possibility before him mr dissert is prepared to die at his post rather than budge an inch and indeed death seems eminent tommy charging round the rhododendron finding himself robbed of his expected scalp grows frantic and makes desperate passes at mr dissert's legs which that hero being determined as i have said not to stir on any provocation circumstance with a considerable display of policy such as i say tommy old boy is that you how do you do glad to see me aren't you this last very artfully with a few to softening the attacks you don't know what i've brought you this is more artful still and distinctly a swindle as he has brought him nothing but on the spot he determines to redeem himself with the help of the small toy shops and sweetie shops down in the village put down that fork like a good boy and let me tell you how oh bother you says tommy indignantly i'd have had her only for you what brought you here now couldn't you have waited a bit yes what brought you says miss kavanagh most disgracefully going over to the other side now that danger is at an end and tommy has planted his impromptu tomahawk in a bed close by do you want to know says he quickly the fingers have been removed from his shoulders and he is now at liberty to turn round and look at the charming face beside him no no says she shaking her head i've been rude i suppose but it is such a wonderful thing to see you here so soon again why should i not be here of course that is the one unanswerable question but you must confess it is puzzling to those who thought of you as being elsewhere if you are one of those you fill me with gratitude that you should think of me even for a moment well i haven't been thinking much says she frankly and with the most delightful if scarcely satisfactory little smile i don't believe i was thinking of you at all until i turned the corner just now and then i confess i was startled because i believed you at the antipodes perhaps your belief was mother to your thought oh no don't make me out so nasty well but were you there perhaps so where are they asks he gloomily one hears a good deal about them but they comprise so many places that nowadays one is hardly sure where they exactly lie at all events no one has made them clear to me does it rest with me to enlighten you asks she with a little aggravating half glance from under her long lashes well the north pole kamchatka smyrna timbuktu Maoriland, margate we'll stop there i think says he with a faint grimace there at margate no thanks you can if you like but as for me i don't suppose you would stop anywhere with me says he i have occasional glimmerings that i hope mean common sense 
No, I have not been so adventurous as to wander towards Margate. I have only been to town and back again. What town? Eh? What town? says he astonished. London, you know. No, I don't know, says Miss Kavanagh, a little petulantly. One would think there was only one town in the world, and that all you English people had the monopoly of it. There are other towns, I suppose. Even we poor Irish insignificants have a town or two. Dublin comes under that head, I suppose. Undoubtedly, of course. Make a great haste to abase himself. This mass snobbery are making so much of London. A kind of despicable count, you know. Well, after all, I expect it is a big place in every way, says Miss Kavanagh, so far mollified by his submission as to be able to allow him something. It's a desert, says Tommy, turning to his aunt, with all the air of one who is about to impart to her useful information. It's raging with wild beasts. They roam to and fro and are at their wit's end. Here Tommy who is great on Bible history, but who occasionally gets mixed, stops short. Father says they're there, he winds up defiantly. Wild beasts, echoes Mr. Dissert, bewildered. Is this the teaching about their sex and neighbors that the Irish children receive at the hands of their parents and guardians? Oh, well, come now, Tommy, really, you know. Yes, they are there, says Tommy rebelliously. Frightful beasts! Bears! They tear you in bits if they could get at you. They have no reason in them, father says, and they climb up posts and roar at people. Oh, nonsense, says Mr. Dissert. One would think we were having a French revolution all over again in England. Don't you think? Glancing severely at Joyce, who is giving way to unrestrained mirth. That it is not only wrong, but dangerous to implant such ideas about the English in the breast of Irish children. There isn't a word of truth in it, Tommy. There is, says Monkton Jr., wagging his head indignantly. Father told me. Father told us, repeats the small Mabel, who has just come up. And Father says, too, that the reason they are so wicked is because they want their freedom, says Tommy as though this is an unanswerable argument. Oh, I see, the socialists, says Mr. Dissert. Yes, a troublesome pack, but still, to call them wild beasts. They are wild beasts, says Tommy, prepared to defend his position to the last. They've got manes and horns and tails. He's romancing, says Mr. Dissert, looking at Joyce. He's not, she says demurely. He's only trying to describe to you the zoological gardens. His father gives him a graphic description of them every evening, and the result you see. Here both she and he, after a glance at each other, burst out laughing. No wonder you were amused, says he. But you might have given me a hint. You were unkind to me, as usual. Now that you have been to London says she, a little hurriedly, as if to cover his last words and pretend she hasn't heard them. You will find our poor Ireland duller than ever. At Christmas, it is not so bad, but just now, and in the height of your season too. Do you call this place dull? interrupts he. Then let me tell you, you misjudge your native land. This little bit of it at all events. I think it is not only the loveliest, but the liveliest place on earth. You are easily pleased, says she, with a rather embarrassed smile. He isn't, says Tommy, breaking into the conversation with great aplomb. He has been holding on vigorously to Mr. Dissert's right hand for the last five minutes, after a brief but brilliant skirmish with Mabel as to the possession of it, a skirmish brought to a bloodless conclusion by the surrender on Mr. Dissert's part of his left hand to the weaker belligerent. He hates Miss Maleficent, nurse says, though Lady Baltimore wants him to marry her. And she's a fine girl, nurse says, and real smart, and with the git or the gap and a lot of tin. Tell me, says his aunt frantically, it is indeed plain to everybody that Tommy is now quoting nurse, or naturel, 
and that he is betraying confidences in a perfectly reckless manner. Don't stop him, says Mr. Dissert, glancing at Joyce's crimson cheeks with something of disfavor. What's Hecuba to me, or I to Hecuba? I defy you, a little stormily, to think I care a farthing for Miss Maleficent or for any other woman on earth, save one. Oh, you mustn't press your confidences on me, says she, smiling and dissembling rather finally. I know nothing. I accuse you of nothing. Only, Tommy, you were a little rude, weren't you? I wasn't, says Tommy promptly, in warm the inborn instinct of self-defense has been largely developed. It's true. Nurse says she has a voice like a cow. Is that true? Turning unabashed to desert. She's expected at the castle next week. You shall come up and judge for yourself, says he, laughing, and turning to Joyce. You will come too, I hope. It is manners to wait to be asked, returns she, smiling. Oh, as for that, says he, Lady Baltimore crossed last night with me and her husband, and here is a letter for you. He pulls a note of the cocked hat order out of one of his pockets. End of chapter 3《Chapter Number Four of April's Lady》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.《April's Lady》by Margaret Wolf Hungerford, Chapter Four. Tell me. Where is fancy bred, or in the heart, or in the head? How begot, how nourished? Reply, reply. An invitation from Lady Baltimore, says Joyce, looking at the big red crest and coloring slightly. Yes, how do you know? asks she, rather suspiciously. The young man raises his hands and eyes. I swear I had nothing to do with it, says he. I didn't so much as hint at it. Lady Baltimore spent her time crossing the channel in declaring to all who were well enough to hear her that she lived only in the expectation of soon seeing you again. Nonsense, scornfully. It is only a month ago since I was staying there just before they went to London. By the by, what brings them home now, in the very beginning of their season? I don't know, and it is as well not to inquire, perhaps. Baltimore and my cousin, as all the world knows, have not hit it off together. Yet when Isabel married him, we all thought it was quite an ideal marriage." They were so much in love with each other. Hot love soon cools, says Miss Cavanaugh, in a general sort of way. I don't believe it, certainly, if it's the right sort of love. However, to go back to your letter, which you haven't even deigned to open, you will accept the invitation, won't you? I don't know, hesitating. Oh, I say, do come. It is only for a week, and even if it does bore you, still, as a Christian, you ought to consider how much, even in that short time, you will be able to add to the happiness of your fellow creatures. Flattery means insincerity, says she, tilting her chin. Keep all that sort of thing for your Miss Maleficent. It is thrown away upon me. My, Miss Maleficent, really, I must protest against your accrediting me with such a possession. But look here, don't disappoint us all, and you won't be dull either. There are lots of people coming, Dickie Brown for one. Oh, will he be there, brightened visibly? Yes, rather gloomily and perhaps a little sorry that he has said anything about Mr. Brown's possible arrival, 
though to feel jealousy about that social butterfly is indeed to sound the depths of folly you like him i love him says miss kavanagh promptly and with sufficient enthusiasm to restore hope in the bosom of any man except a lover he is blessed indeed says he stiffly beyond his deserts i can't help thinking i really think he is the biggest fool i ever met oh not the biggest surely says she so saucily and with such a reprehensible tendency towards laughter that he gives way and laughs too though unwillingly true i am a bigger says he but as that is your fault you should be the last to taunt me with it foolish people always talk folly says she with an assumption of indifference that does not hide her red cheeks well go on who is to be at the court besides dicky lady swansdon i like her too but not so well as you like dicky you love him according to your own statement don't be matter of fact said miss kavanagh giving him a well-deserved snub do you always say exactly what you mean always to you i dare say you would be more interesting if you didn't says she with a little lovely smile that quite spoils the harshness of her words of her few faults perhaps the greatest is that she seldom knows her own mind where her lovers are concerned and will blow hot and cold and merry and sad and cheerful and petulant all in one breath as it were poor lovers they have a hard time of it with her as a rule but youth is often so and the cold still years as they creep on us with dull common sense and deadly reason in their train cure us all too soon of our pretty idle follies just now she was bent on rebuffing him but at, but you see her strength failed her and she spoiled her effect by the smile she mingled with the rebuff the smile indeed was so charming that he remembers nothing but it and so she not only gains nothing but loses something to the other side well i'll try to mend all that says he but so lovingly and with such unaffected tenderness that she quails beneath his glance coquette as undoubtedly nature has made her she has still so gentle a soul within her bosom that she shrinks from inflicting actual pain a pang or two a passing regret to be forgotten the next hour or at all events in the next change of scene she is not above imparting but when people grow earnest like like mr dysart for example they grow troublesome and she hasn't made up her mind to marry and there are other people the clotarfs are to be there too goes on dysart who is a cousin of lady baltimore's and knows all about her arrangements and the brownings and norman beauclerk the clontarfs says joyce in a hurried way that might almost be called confused to the man who loves her and who is watching her is quite plain that she is not thinking of lord and lady clontarf who are quite an ordinary couple and devoted to each other but of that last name spoken norman beauclerk lady baltimore's brother a man handsome and agreeable aristocratic the man whose attentions to her a month ago had made a little topic for conversation amongst the country people dull country people who never go anywhere or see anything beyond their stupid selves and who are therefore driven to do something or other to avoid suicide or the murdering of each other 
Gossip unlimited is their sa safety valve. Yes, and Beauclerk, persists Dysart, a touch of despair at his heart. You and he were good friends when last he was over, eh? I am generally very good friends with everybody, not an altogether desirable character, not a strong one, says she smiling, and still openly parrying the question. You light Beauclerk, says he, a little doggedly, perhaps. Yes, very well. Very much. Why can't you be honest, says he, flashing out at her. I don't know what you mean, coldly. If, however, you persist on my looking into it, I definitely, yes, I do like Mr. Beauclerk very much. Well, I don't know what you see in that fellow. Nothing, airily, having now recovered herself, that's his charm. If, gravely, you gave that as your opinion of Dicky Brown, I could believe you. She laughs. Poor Dicky, says she, what a cruel judgment, and yet you are right. She has changed her whole manner, and is now evidently bent on restoring him to good humor, and compelling him to forget all about Mr. Beauclerk. I must give in to you about Dicky. There isn't even the vaguest suggestion of meaning about him. I, with a deliberate friendly glance flung straight into his eyes, don't often give in to you, do I? On this occasion, however, her coquetry, so generally successful, is completely thrown away. Dysart, with his dark eyes fixed uncompromisingly upon hers, makes the next move an antagonistic one. You have a very high opinion of Beauclerk, says he. Have I? Laughing uneasily and refusing to let her rising temper give way. We all have our opinions on every subject that comes under our notice. You have one on this subject, evidently. Yes, but it is not a high one, says he unpleasantly. After all, what does that matter? I don't pretend to understand you. I will only suggest to you that our opinions are but weak things, mere prejudices, no more. I am not prejudiced against Beauclerk, if you mean that, a little hotly. I didn't, with a light shrug. Believe me, you think a great deal more about him than I do. Are you sure of that? I am at all events sure of one thing, says she quickly, darting at him a frowning glance, that you have no right to ask me that question. I have not, indeed, acknowledges he stiffly still, but with so open an apology in his whole air that she forgives him. Many conflicting thoughts led me astray. I must ask your pardon. Why, granted, says she, and... I was cross, wasn't I? After all, an old friend like you might be allowed a little laxity. There, never mind, holding out her hand, let us make up. Dysart grasps the little extended hand with avidity, and peace seems restored when Tommy puts an end to all things. To anyone acquainted with children, I need hardly remark that he has been listening to the foregoing conversation with all his ears and all his eyes and every bit of his puzzled intelligence. Well, go on, says he, giving his aunt a push when the friendly handshake has come to an end. Go on? Where? asks she, with apparent unconcern but a deadly foreboding at her breast. She knows her Tommy. You said you were going to make it up with him, said that hero, regarding her with disapproving eyes. Well, 
I have made it up. No, you haven't. When you make it up with me, you always kiss me. Why don't you kiss him? Concertation on the part of the principal actors. Dysart, strange to say, is the first to recover. Why indeed, says he, giving way all at once to a fatal desire for laughter. This Miss Kavanagh, being vexed with herself for her late confusion, resents strongly. I am sure, Tommy, says she, with a mildness that would not have imposed upon an infant, that your lesson hour has arrived. Come, say good-bye to Mr. Dysart, and let us begin at once. You know I am going to teach you today. Good-bye, Mr. Dysart. If you want to see Barbara, you will find her very probably in the study. Don't go like this, says he anxiously, or if you will go, at least tell me that you will accept Lady Baltimore's invitation. I don't know, smiling coldly. I think not. You see, I was there for such a long time in the beginning of the year, and Barbara always wants me, and one should not be selfish, you know. One should not, indeed, says he, with slow meaning. What answer, then, must I give my cousin? You know, in a low tone, that she is not altogether happy. You can lighten her burden a little. She is fond of you. I can lighten Barbara's burden also. Think me the very incarnation of selfishness, if you will, says she rather unjustly. But still, if Barbara says don't go, I shall stay here. Mrs. Monkton won't say that. Perhaps not, toying idly with a rose, in such a careless fashion as drives him to despair. Brushing it to and fro across her lips, she seems to have lost all interest in the question in hand. If she says to you, go, how then? Why then, I may still remain here. Well, stay then, of course, if you so desire it, cries he angrily. If to make all your world unhappy is to make you happy, why be so by all means? All my world? Do you suppose then it will make Barbara and Freddy unhappy to have my company? What a gallant speech, says she, with a provoking little laugh and a swift lifting of her eyes to his. No, but it will make other people more than twice, too, miserable to be deprived of it. Are you one of that quartet? asked she, so saucily, yet withal so merrily, that the hardest-hearted lover might forgive her. A little irresistible laugh breaks from her lips. Rather, rather ruefully he joins in it. I don't think I need answer that question, says he. To you, at all events. To me, of all people, rather, says she, still laughing, seeing I am the interested party. No, that character belongs to me. You have no interest in it. To me, it is life or death. To you... No, no, you mustn't talk to me like that. You know I forbid you last time we met and you promised me to be good. I promised then the most difficult thing in the world. But never mind me. The principal thing is your acceptance or rejection of that note. Joyce, in a low tone, say you will accept it. Well, relenting visibly, and now refusing to meet his eyes, I'll ask Barbara, and if she says I may go, I, pause, you will then accept, eagerly? I shall then think about it. You look like an angel, says he, and you have the heart of a flint. This remark, that might have presumably annoyed another girl, 
seems to fill Miss Kavanagh with mirth. "'Am I so bad as that?' cries she gaily. "'Why, I shall make amends then. I shall change my evil ways. As a beginning, see here. If Barbara says go to the court, go I will. Now, stern moralist, where are you?' In the seventh heaven, says he promptly. Be it fool's paradise, or otherwise, I shall take up my abode there for the present. And now you will go and ask Mrs. Monkton? In what a hurry to get rid of me, says this coquette of all coquettes. Well, good-bye then. Oh, no, don't go. To the court? Was ever man so unreasonable? In one breath do and don't. Was ever woman so tormenting? Tormenting? No, so discerning, if you will, or else so adorable. You can't find fault with that at all events. And therefore my mission is at an end. Goodbye again. Goodbye. He is holding her hand as though he never means to let her have it again. That rose, says he, pointing to the flower that has kissed her lips so often, it is nothing to you. You can pick yourself another. Give it to me. I can pick you another too, a nice fresh one, says she, here, moving towards a glowing bush. Here is a bud worth having. No, not that one, hastily. Not one this garden or any other garden holds. Save the one in your hand. It is the only one in the world of roses worth having. I hate to give a faded gift, says she, looking at the rose she holds with apparent disfavor. Then I shall take it returns he with decision. He opens her pretty pink palm, releases the dying rosebud from it, and places it triumphantly in his coat. You haven't got any manners, says she, but she laughs again as she says it. Except bad ones you should add. Yes, I forgot that. A point lost. Goodbye now. Goodbye indeed. She waves her hand lightly to him, and calling to the children runs toward the house. It seems as if she has carried all the beauty and brightness and sweetness of the day with her. As Dysart turns back again, the afternoon appears gray and gloomy. End of chapter 4 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 5 of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ruhi Huck. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter 5. Chapter 5. Look ere thou leap, see ere thou go. Well, Barbara, can I go? I don't know, doubtfully. There is a doubt on Mrs. Monkton's brow. She is staring out of the window instead of into her sister's face. And she is evidently a little distressed or uncertain. You have been there so lately, and... You want to say something, says the younger sister, seating herself on the sofa and drawing Mrs. Monkton down beside her. Why don't you do it? "'You can't want to go so very much, can you now?' asks the latter, anxiously, almost entreatingly. "'It is I who don't know this time,' says Joyce with a smile. "'And yet, it seems only like yesterday that you came back after spending a month there. "'A yesterday that dates from six weeks ago?' a little reproachfully. "'I know. You like being there. It is a very amusing house to be at.' I don't blame you in any way. Lord and Lady Baltimore are more charming in their ways and very kind. And yet, there, 
don't stop you are coming to it now the very heart of the meaning go on authoritatively and seizing her sister in her arms or i'll shake it out of you it is this then says mrs monkton slowly i don't think it is a wise thing for you to go there so often oh barbara owl of wisdom as thou art why not the girl is laughing yet a deep flush of colour has crept into each cheek never mind the why not perhaps it is unwise to go anywhere too often and you must acknowledge that you spent almost the entire spring there well i hinted all that to mr dysart was he there yes he came down from the court with the note and who else is to be there oh the clontarfs and dicky brown and lady swanstown and a great many others mr beauclerk and she does not look at joyce as she asks this question yes a little silence follows broken at last by joyce may i go do you think it is the best thing for you to do says mrs monkton flushing delicately think darling you know you must know because you have it always before you flushing even deeper that to marry into a family where you are not welcomed with open heart is to know much private discomfiture i know this too says the girl petulantly that to be married to a man like freddy who consults your lightest wish and is your lover always is worth the enduring of anything i think that too says mrs monkton who has now grown rather pale that there is still one more thing to know that in making such a marriage as we have described a woman lays out a thorny path for her husband she separates him from his family and as all good men have strong home ties she naturally compels him to feel many a secret pang but he has his compensations do you think if freddy got the chance he would give you up and go back to his family no not that but to rejoice in that thought is to be selfish why should he not have my love and the love of his people too there is a want somewhere what i wish to impress upon you joyce is this that a woman who marries a man against his parents wishes has much to regret much to endure i think you are ungrateful says the girl a little vehemently freddy has made you endure nothing you are the happiest married woman i know yes but i have made him endure a great deal says mrs monkton in a low tone she rises and going to the window stands there looking out upon the sunny landscape but seeing nothing barbara you are crying says joyce going up to her abruptly and folding her arms around her it is nothing dear nothing at all darling only i wish he and his father were friends again freddy is too good a man not to regret the estrangement i believe you think freddy is a little god says joyce laughing oh not a little one says mrs monkton and as freddy stands six foot one in his socks they both laugh at this still you don't answer me says the girl presently you don't say you may or you shan't which is it to be barbara her tone is distinctly coaxing now and as she speaks she gives her sister a little squeeze that is plainly meant to press the desired permission out of her still mrs monkton hesitates you see says he temporizing there are so many reasons the court pausing and flushing is not quite the house for so young a girl as you oh barbara you can't misunderstand me says her sister with agitation you know how i like love lady baltimore and how good lord baltimore has been to freddy when his father cast him off there was very little left to us for beginning housekeeping with and when lord baltimore gave him his agency oh well it isn't likely we shall either of us forget to be grateful for that if it was only for ourselves i should say nothing but it is for you dear and this unfortunate affair this determined hostility that exists between lord and lady baltimore makes it unpleasant for the guests you know nervously i hate gossip of any sort but one must defend one's own but there is nothing unpleasant one sees nothing 
they are charming to each other i have been staying there and i know have i not stayed there too it is impossible joyce to fight against facts all the world knows they are not on good terms well a great many other people aren't perhaps when they aren't the tone of the house gets lowered and i have noticed of late that they have people there who who what barbara oh yes i know they are all right they are received everywhere but are they good companions for a girl of yours of your years it is not a healthy atmosphere for you they are rich people who think less of a hundred guineas than you do of five it is wise i ask you again to accustom yourself to their ways nonsense barbara says her sister looking at her with a growing surprise that is not like you why should we despise the rich why should we seek to emulate them surely both you and i have too good blood in our veins to give way to such follies she leans towards mrs monkton and with a swift gesture gentle as firm turns her face to her own now for the real reason says she unthinkingly she has brought confusion on herself barbara as though stung to cruel candor gives her the real reason in a sentence tell me this says she which do you like best mr dysart or mr beauclerk joyce taking her arm from round her sister's neck moves back from her a deep color has flamed into her cheeks then died away again she looks quite calm now what a question says she well feverishly answer it oh no says the girl quickly why not why not answer it to me your chief friend you think the question indelicate but why should i shrink from asking a question on which perhaps the happiness of your life depends if if you have set your heart on mr beauclerk she stops checked by something in miss cavanagh's face well what then asked the latter coldly it will bring you unhappiness he is lady baltimore's brother she already plans for him the beauclerks are poor he is bound to marry money that is a good deal about mr beauclerk but what about the other possible suitor whom you suppose i am madly in love with don't talk to me like that joyce do you think i have anything at heart except your interests as to mr dysart if you like him i confess i should be glad of it he is only a cousin of the baltimores and of such moderate means that they would scarcely object to his marrying a penniless girl you rate me highly says joyce with a sudden rather sharp little laugh i am good enough for the cousin i am not good enough for the brother who may reasonably look higher not higher haughtily he can only marry a girl of good birth you are that but he in his position will look for money or else his people will look for it for him whereas mr dysart yes you needn't go over it all mr dysart is about on a level with me he will never have any money neither shall i suddenly she looks round at her sister her eyes very bright tell me then says she what does it all come to that i am bound to refuse to marry a man because he has money and because i have none that is not the argument says barbara anxiously i think it is it is not i advise you strongly not to think of mr beauclerk yet he has no money to speak of he has more than freddy but he is a different man from freddy with different tastes different aspirations different he is different emphatically in every way to be different from the person one loves is not to be a bad man says joyce slowly her eyes on the ground my dear girl who has called mr beauclerk a bad man you don't like him says miss cavanagh still more slowly still with thoughtful eyes downcast i like mr dysart better if you mean that no i don't mean that and besides that is no answer was there a question yes why don't you like mr beauclerk have i said i didn't like him not in so many words but well why don't you i don't know rather lamely miss cavanagh laughs a little satirically and mrs monkton objecting to mirth of that description takes fire why do you like him asks she defiantly i don't know either returns joyce with a rueful smile and after all i'm not sure that i like him so very much you evidently imagine me to be head over ears in love with him yet i myself scarcely know whether i like him or not you always look at him so kindly and you always pull your skirts aside to give him a place by your side i should do that for tommy 
would you that would be too kind says tommy's mother laughing it would mean ruin to wear your skirts in two minutes but consider the gain the priceless scraps of wisdom i should hear even whilst my clothes were being demolished this has been a mere interlude unintentional on the part of either and once over neither knows how to go on the question must be settled one way or the other there is one thing says mrs monkton at length you certainly prefer mr beauclerk to mr dysart do i i wish i knew as much about myself as you know about me and after all it is of no consequence whom i like the real thing is come barbara you who know so much can tell me this well says mrs monkton seeing she has grown very red and is evidently hesitating no this absurd conversation has gone far enough i was going to ask you to solve a riddle but but what you are too serious about it not too serious it is very important oh barbara how do you know what you are saying cries the girl with an angry little stamp turning to her a face pale and indignant you have been telling me in so many words that i am in love with either mr beauclerk or mr dysart pray now for a change tell me which of them is in love with me mr dysart says barbara quietly her sister laughs angrily you think everybody who looks at me is in love with me not everyone meaning mr beauclerk no slowly i think he likes you too but he is a man who will always think you know he has come in for that property in hampshire through his uncle's death but he got no money with it it is a large place impossible to keep up without a large income and his uncle left every penny away from him it is in great disrepair the house specially i hear it is falling to pieces mr beauclerk is an ambitious man he will seek means to rebuild his house well what of that it is an interesting bit of history but how does it concern me take that troubled look out of your eyes barbara i assure you mr beauclerk is as little to me as i am to him she speaks with such evident sincerity with such an undeniable belief in the truth of her own words that mrs monkton looking at her and reading her soul through her clear eyes feels a weight lifted from her heart that is all right then says she limp simply she turns as if to go away but miss cavanagh has still a word or two to say i may go to the court says she yes i suppose so but you won't be vexed if i go barby no not now well slipping her arm through hers with an audible sigh of delight that's settled things generally do get settled the way you want them to be says mrs monkton laughing come what about your frocks eh from this out they spend a most enjoyable hour or two End of chapter 5chapter 6 of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kath grace san clemente california april's lady by margaret wolf hungerford chapter 6 or if they sing tis with so dull a cheer that leaves look pale thinking the winter's near the visit to the court being decided on miss cavanagh undertakes life afresh with a joyous heart lord and lady baltimore are the best host and hostess in the world and a visit to them means unmixed pleasure while it lasts the court is indeed the pleasantest house in the county the most desirable in all respects and the gayest yet strange and sad to add happiness has found no bed within its walls this is the more remarkable in that the marriage of lord and lady baltimore had been an almost idealistic one they had been very much in love with each other all the hosts of friends and relations that belonged to either side had been delighted with the engagement so many imprudent marriages were made so many disastrous ones but here was a marriage where birth and money went together and left no guardians or parents lamenting all belgravia stood still and stared at the young couple with genuine admiration it wasn't often 
that love pure and simple fell into their midst and such a satisfactory love too none of your erratic darts that struck the wrong breasts and created confusion for miles around but a thoroughly proper respectable winged arrow that pierced the bosoms of those who might safely be congratulated on the reception of it they had indeed been very much in love with each other few people have known such extreme happiness as fell to their lot for two whole years they were wrapped up in each other and when the little son came at the end of that time nothing seemed wanted they grew so strong in their belief in the immutability of their own relations one to the other that when the blow fell that separated them it proved a very lightning stroke dividing soul from body lady baltimore could be at no time called a beautiful woman but there is always a charm in her face a strength an attractiveness that might well defy the more material charms of a lovelier woman than herself with a soul as pure as her face and a mind entirely innocent of the world's evil ways and the sad and foolish secrets she is compelled to bear upon her tired bosom from century to century she took with a bitter hardness the revelations of her husband's former life before he married her related to her by of course a devoted friend unfortunately the authority was an undeniable one it was impossible for lady baltimore to refuse to believe the past too she might have condoned though believing in her husband as she did it would always have been bitter to her but the devoted friend may all such meet their just reward had not stopped there she had gone a step further a fatal step she had told her something that had not occurred since their marriage perhaps the devoted friend believed in her lie perhaps she did not anyway the mischief was done indeed from the beginning seeds of distrust had been laid and buried in so young and unlearned a bosom had taken a fatal grip the more fatal in that there was truth in them as a fact lord baltimore had been the hero of several ugly passages in his life his early life certainly but a young wife who has begun by thinking him immaculate would hardly be the one to lay stress upon that and when her friend who had tried unsuccessfully to marry lord baltimore and had failed had in the kindliest spirit of course opened her eyes to his misdoings she at first passionately refused to listen then had listened and after that was ready to listen to anything one episode in his past history had been made much of the sorry heroine of it had been an actress and this was bad enough but when the disinterested friend went on to say that lord baltimore had been seen in her company only so long as last week matters came to a climax that was a long time ago from today but the shock when it came shattered all the sacred feelings in lady baltimore's heart she grew cold callous indifferent her mouth a really beautiful feature that used to be a picture of serenity and charity personified hardened she became austere cold not difficult so much as unsympathetic she was still a good hostess and those who had known her before her misfortune still loved her but she made no new friends and she sat down within herself as it were and gave herself up to her fate and would probably have died or grown reckless but for her little son and it was after the birth of this beloved child that she had been told that her husband had again been seen in the company with madame estray that seemed to add fuel to the fire already kindled she could not forgive that it was proof positive of his baseness to the young wife it was all a revelation a horrible one she had been so stunned by it that she accepted it as it stood and learning that the stories of his life before marriage were true had decided that the stories told of his life after marriage were also true she was young and youth is always hard to her no doubt remained of his infidelity she had come of a brave old stock who if they could not fight could at least endure in silence 
and knew well the necessity of keeping her name out of the public mouth she kept herself well in hand therefore and betrayed nothing of all she had been feeling she dismissed her friend with a gentle air dignified yet of sufficient haughtiness to let that astute and now decidedly repentant lady know that never again would she enter the doors of the court or any other of lady baltimore's houses yet she restrained herself all through so well that even until the very end came her own husband never knew how horribly she suffered through her disbelief in him he thought her heartless there was no scandal no public separation she said a word or two to him that told him what she had heard and when he tried to explain the truths of that last libel that had declared him unfaithful to her since her marriage she had silenced him with so cold so scornful so contemptuous a glance and word that chilled and angered in his turn he had left her twice afterward he had sought to explain matters but it was useless she would not listen the treacherous friend whom she never betrayed had done her work well lady baltimore though she never forgave her would not forgive her husband either she would make no formal attempt at a separation before the world she and he lived together seemingly on the best terms at all events on quite as good terms as most of their acquaintances yet all the world knew how it was with them so long as there are servants so long it will be impossible to effectively conceal our most sacred secrets her friends when the baltimores went to visit them made arrangements to suit them it was a pity everybody said that such complications should have arisen and one would not have expected it from isabel but then she seemed so cold that probably a climax like that did not affect her as much as it might another she was so entirely wrapped up in her boy some women were like that a child sufficed them as for lord baltimore cyril why judgment was divided here the women taking his part the men hers the latter finding an attraction hardly to be defined in her pure calm rather impenetrable face that had yet a smile so lovely that it could warm the seemingly cold face into a something that was more effective than mere beauty it was a wonderful smile and in spite of all her troubles was by no means rare lady baltimore they all acknowledged was a delightful guest and hostess as for lord baltimore he well he would know how to console himself society the crudest organization on earth laughed to itself about him he had known how to live before his marriage now that the marriage had proved a failure he would still know how to make life bearable in this they wronged him end of chapter six chapter seven of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by ruhi huck april's lady by margaret hungerford chapter seven il est n'employé les paroles quoi pour dégoûter les pensées voltaire even the most dyspeptic of the guests had acknowledged at breakfast some hours ago now that a lovelier day could hardly be imagined lady baltimore with a smile had agreed with him it was indeed impossible not to agree with him the sun was shining high in the heavens and a soft velvety air blew through the open windows right on to the table what shall we do to-day lady swansdon or one of the guests had asked addressing her question to lord baltimore who just then was helping his little son to porridge whatever she liked then nothing says she in that soft drawl of hers and that little familiar imploring glance of hers at her hostess who sat behind the urn and glanced back at her ever so kindly yes it was too warm to dream of exertion would lady swansdon like to remain at home then and dream away the afternoon in a hammock 
dreams were delightful but to dream alone oh no they would all or at least most of them stay with her it was lady baltimore who had said this after waiting in vain for her husband to speak to whom indeed lady swanston's questions had been rather pointedly addressed so at home they had all stayed no one being very keen about doing anything on a day so sultry yet now when luncheon is at an end and the day still heavy with heat the desire for action that lies in every breast takes fire they are all tired of doing nothing the tennis courts lie invitingly empty and rackets thrust themselves into notice at every turn as for the balls worn out from ennui they insert themselves under each arched instep threatening to bring the owners to the ground unless picked up and made use of who wants a beating demands mr brown at last unable to pretend lassitude any longer taking up a racket he brandishes it wildly presumably to attract attention this is necessary as a rule nobody pays any attention to dicky brown he is a nondescript sort of young man one of the negative order with no features to speak of and a capital opinion of himself income vague age unknown well that's one way of putting it says miss cavanagh with a little tilt of her pretty chin is it a riddle asks dysart if so i know it the answer is dicky brown oh i like that says mr brown unabashed see here i'll give you plus 15 and a bisque and start myself at minus 30 and beat you in a canter dear mr brown consider the day i believe there are such things as sunstrokes says lady swanston in her sweet treble there are but dicky's all right says lord maltimore drawing up a garden chair close to hers and seating himself upon it his head is safe the sun makes no impressions upon granite ah granite that applies to a heart not a head says lady swanston resting her blue eyes on baltimore's for just a swift second it is wonderful however what her eyes can do in a second baltimore laughs lightly returns her glance fourfold and draws his chair a quarter of an inch closer to her to move it more than that would have been an impossibility lady swanston makes a slight movement with a smile seraphic as an angel's she pulls her lace skirts a little to one side as if to prove to baltimore that he is encroached beyond his privileges upon her domain people should not crush people and why do you want to get so very close to me this question lies within the serene eyes she once more raises to his she is a lovely woman blonde serene dangerous in each glance she turns upon the man who happens at any moment to be next to her lies an entire chapter on the whole art of flirtation were she reduced to penury and the world a little more advanced in its fashionable ways she might readily make a small fortune in teaching young ladies how to marry well no man could resist her pupils once properly finished by her and turned out to prey upon the stronger sex the complete angler would be a title they might filch with perfect honour and call their own she is a tall beauty with soft limbs graceful as a panther or a cat her eyes are like the skies in summer time her lips sweet and full the silken hair that falls in soft massage on her grecian brow is light as corn in harvest and she has hands and feet that are absolutely faultless she has even more than all these a more convenient husband who is not only now but apparently always in a position of trust abroad very much abroad the fiji or the sandwich islands for choice one can't hear from those centers of worldly dissipation in a hurry and after all it doesn't very much matter where he is there had been a whisper or two in the county about her and lord baltimore every one knew the latter had been a little wild since his estrangement with his wife but nothing to signify very much nothing that one could lay one's finger on until lady swanston had come down last year to the court whether baltimore was in love with her was uncertain but all were agreed that she was in love with him 
not that she made an slander of any sort but one could see and still she was such a friend of lady baltimore's an old friend they had been girls together that was what was so wonderful and lady baltimore made very much of her and treated her with the kindliest observances and but one had often heard of the serpent that one nourished in one's bosom only that it might come to life and sting one the county grew wise over this complication and perhaps when mrs monkton had hinted to joyce of the odd people the baltimores asked to the court she had had lady swanston in her mind whose heart asked baltimore a propos of her last remark yours it is a leading remark and something in the way it is uttered strikes unpleasantly on the ears of dysart baltimore is bending over his lovely guest and looking at her with an admiration too open to be quite respectful but she betrays no resentment she smiles back at him indeed in that little slow seductive way of hers and makes him an answer in a tone too low for even those nearest to her to hear it is a sort of challenge a tacit acknowledgment that they too are alone even in the midst of all these tiresome people baltimore accepts it of late he has grown a little reckless the battling against circumstances has been too much for him he has gone under the persistent coldness of his wife her refusal to hear or believe in him has had its effect a man of a naturally warm and kindly disposition thrown thus back upon himself he has now given a loose rein to the carelessness that has been a part of his nature since his mother gave him to the world and allows himself to swim or to go down with the tide that carries his present life upon his bosom lady swanston is lovely and kind always with that sense of injury full upon him that half concealed but ever present desire for revenge upon the wife who has so coldly condemned and cast him aside he flings himself willingly into a flirtation ready made to his hand and as dangerous as it seems light his life he tells himself is hopelessly embittered the best things in it are denied him he gives therefore the more heed to the honeyed words of the pretty creature near him who in truth likes him too well for her own soul's good that detested husband of hers out there somewhere the only thought she ever gives him is when she remembers with horror how as a young girl she was sold to him for years she had believed herself heartless of all her numerous love affairs not one had really touched her until now and now he is the husband of her oldest friend of the one woman whom perhaps in all the world she really respects at times her heart smites her and a terrible longing to go away to die to make an end of it takes possession of her at other times she leans towards baltimore her lovely eyes alight her soft mouth smiling her whispered words her only half averted glances all tell their tale presently it is clear to every one that a very fully developed flirtation is well in hand lady baltimore coming across the grass with a basket in one hand and her little son held fondly by the other sees and grasps the situation baltimore leaning over lady swanston the latter lying back in her lounging chair in her usual indolent fashion swaying her feather fan from side to side and with white lids lying on the azure eyes seeing it all lady baltimore's mouth hardens and a contemptuous expression destroys the calm dignity of her face for the moment only another moment it is gone she has recovered herself the one sign of emotion she has betrayed is swallowed up by her stern determination to conceal all pain at all costs and if her fingers tighten somewhat convulsively on those of her boys why who can be the wiser of that no one can see it dysart however who is honestly fond of his cousin has mastered that first swift involuntary contraction of the calm brow and a sense of indignant anger against baltimore and his somewhat reckless companion fires his blood he springs quickly to his feet lady baltimore noting the action though not understanding the motive for it turns and smiles at him so controlled a smile that it quiets him at once i am going to the gardens to try and cajole mackintyre out of some roses says she in her sweet slow way stopping near the first group she reaches on the lawn 
the group that contains amongst others her husband and her friend she would not willingly have stayed where they were but she is too proud to pass them by without a word who will come with me oh no as several rise to join her laughing though rather faintly it is not compulsory even though i go alone i shall feel that i am equal to mcintyre lord baltimore had started as her first words fell upon his ears he had been so preoccupied that her light footfalls coming over the grass had not reached him and a voice when it fell upon the air gave him a shock he half rises from his seat shall i he is beginning and then stops short something in her face checking him you she conquers herself a second later all the scorn and contempt is crushed by sheer force of will out of look and tone and she goes on as clearly and as entirely without emotion as though she were a mere machine i think she has taught herself to be not you she says gaily waving him lightly from her you're too useful here as she says this she gives him the softest if fleetest smile it is a masterpiece you can amuse one here and there whilst i i i want a girl i think looking round bertie with a fond and almost passionate glance at her little son always likes one of his sweethearts and there are many to accompany him when he takes his walks abroad like father like son i dare say ha ha laughs a fatuous youth a mr courtney who lives about five miles from the court and has dropped in this afternoon very unfortunately it must be confessed to pay his respects to lady baltimore fools always hit on the truth why nobody knows except the heavens above us but so it is young courtney who has heard nothing of the unpleasant relations existing between his hostess and who would be quite incapable of understanding them if he had heard now springs a remark upon the assembled five or six people present that almost reduces them to powder dysart casts a murderous glance at him a clever old proverb says lady baltimore lightly she is apparently the one unconcerned person amongst them i always like those old sayings there is so much truth in them she has forced herself to say this but as the words pass her lips she blanches perceptibly as if unable to control herself she draws a little son towards her her arms tighten around him the boy responds gladly to the embrace and to those present who know nothing it seems the simplest thing in the world the mother the child naturally they would caress each other on each and every occasion the agony of the mother is unknown to them that fear that her boy her treasure may inherit something of his father and in his turn prove unfaithful to the heart that trusts him in this very little scene scarcely worth recording yet the anguish of a strong heart lies embodied in it if you are going to the gardens lady baltimore let me go with you says miss maliphant rising quickly and going toward her she is a big loud girl with money written all over her in capital letters but dicky brown watching her tells himself she has a good heart i should love to go there with you and bertie come then says lady baltimore graciously she makes a step forward little bertie as though he likes and believes in her thrusts his small fist into the hand of the birkingham heiress and thus united all three pass out of sight end of chapter 7「because i think him so when a corner near the rhododendrons has concealed them from view dysart rises from his seat and goes deliberately over to where lady swansdon is sitting she is an old friend of his and he has therefore no qualms about being a little brusque with her where occasion demands it have a game says he his suggestion is full of playfulness his tone however is stern 
dear felix why says she smiling up at him beautifully there is even a suspicion of amusement in her smile a change says he his words this time might mean something his tone anything she can read either as she pleases true says she laughing there is nothing like change you have wakened me to a delightful fact lord baltimore turning languidly to her companion who has been a little distrait since his wife and son passed by him what do you say to trying a change for just we two variety they say is charming shall we try if shade and coolness and comfort are to be found in that enchanting glade down there she points as she speaks to an opening in the wood where perpetual twilight seems to reign as seen from where they are now sitting if you will said baltimore still a little vaguely he gets up however and stretches his arms indolently above his head as one might who is flinging from him the remembrance of an unpleasant dream the sun here is intolerable says lady swanston rising too more than one can endure thanks dear felix for your suggestion i should never have thought of the glade if you hadn't asked me to play that impossible game she smiles a little maliciously at dysart and accompanied by lord baltimore moves away from the assembled groups upon the lawn to the dim recesses of the leafy glade sold says mr brown to dysart it is always impossible to dicky to hold his tongue but you needn't look so cut up about it it isn't good enough my dear fellow i know em both by heart baltimore is as much in love with her as he is with his irish tenants but his imagination is his strong point and it pleases him to think he has found at last for the twentieth time a solace for all his woes in the disinterested love of somebody it really never much matters who there is more in it than you think says dysart gloomily not a fraction airily and what of her lady swanston oh of her her heart has been in such constant use for years that by this time it must be in tatters give up thinking about that ah here is my beloved girl again he makes an elaborate gesture of delight as he sees joyce advancing in his direction dear joyce beaming on her who shall say there is nothing in animal magnetism here i have been just talking about you to dysart and telling him what a lost soul i feel when you are away and instantly as if in answer to my keen desire you appear before me why aren't you playing tennis demands miss kavanagh with a cruel disregard of this flowery speech because i was waiting for you well i'll beat you says she i always do not if you play on my side reproachfully what have you for a partner nonsense dicky you know i shouldn't dream of that twas ever thus quotes mr brown mournfully the sincerest worship gains only scorn and contumely but never mind the day will come to an end sighs miss kavanagh giving a finish to his sentence never meant that cheerfully is just what i think if we don't have a game now the shades of night will be on us before we can look round us will you play with me says dysart with pleasure keep your eye on his near court and when this game is at an end call it ours she sinks into a chair as she speaks and dysart who is in a silent mood flings himself on the grass at her feet and falls into a reverie to be conversational is unnecessary dicky brown is on the spot hotter and hotter grows the sun the evening comes on apace a few people from the neighbouring houses have dropped in mrs monkton amongst others with tommy in tow the latter who is supposed to entertain a strong affection for lady baltimore's little son no sooner however sees dicky brown than he gives himself up to his keeping what the attraction is that mr brown has for children has never yet been clearly defined it is the more difficult to arrive at a satisfactory conclusion about it in that no child was ever yet left in his sole care for ten minutes without coming to blows or tears or a determined attempt at murder or suicide his mother seeing tommy veering towards this uncertain friend 
turns a doubtful eye on mr brown better come with me tommy says she i am going to the gardens to find lady baltimore she will have bertie with her i'll stay with dicky says tommy flinging himself broadcast on mr brown's reluctant chest that gives forth a compulsory vow as he does so he'll tell me a story don't be unhappy mrs monkton says the latter when he has recovered a little from the shock tommy is a well-grown boy with a sufficient amount of adipose matter about him to make his descent felt i'll promise to be careful nothing french i assure you nothing that could shock the young mind or teach it how to shoot in the wrong direction my tales are always strictly moral well tommy be good says mrs monkton with a last imploring glance at her son who has already forgotten her existence being lost in a wild wrestling match with his new friend with deep forebodings his mother leaves him and goes upon her way passing joyce she says in a low whisper keep an eye on tommy both eyes if you like laughing but dicky in spite of his evil reputation seldom goes to extremes tommy does however says mrs monkton brightly well i'll look after him and so perhaps she might have done had not a light step sounding just behind her chair at this moment caused her to start to look round to forget all but what she now sees he is a very aristocratic looking man tall with large limbs and big indeed in every way his eyes are light his nose a handsome roman his forehead massive and if not grand in the distinctly intellectual way still a fine forehead and impressive his hands are of a goodly size but exquisitely proportioned and very white the skin almost delicate he is rather like his sister lady baltimore and yet so different from her in every way that the distinct resemblance that is surely there torments the observer why says joyce it is the most foolish exclamation and means nothing but she finds herself a little taken off her guard i didn't know you were here she has half risen neither did i how do you do dysart until half an hour ago won't you shake hands he holds out his own hand to her as he speaks there is a quizzical light in his eyes as he speaks nothing to offend but one can see that he finds amusement in the fact that the girl has been so Im much impressed by his unexpected appearance that she has even forgotten the small usual act of courtesy with which we greet our friends she had indeed been dead to everything but his coming you came falters she stammering a little as she notes her mistake by the midday train i gave myself just time to snatch a sandwich from purdon the butler say a word or two to my sister whom i found in the garden and then came on here to ask you to play this next game with me oh i'm so sorry but i have promised it to the words are out of her mouth before she has realized the fact that dysart is listening dysart who is lying at her feet watching every expression in her mobile face she colors hotly and looks down at him confused lovely i didn't mean that she says trying to smile indifferently only don't says dysart not loudly not curtly yet in so strange and decided a way that it renders her silent you mustn't mind me says he a second later in his usual calm tone i know you and beauclerk are wonderful players you can give me a game later on a capital arrangement says beauclerk comfortably sinking into a chair beside her with all the lazy manner of a man at peace with himself and his world especially as i shall have to go in presently to write some letters for the evening post he places his elbows on the arm of the chair brings the ends of his fingers together and beams admiringly at joyce over the tops of them how busy you always are says she slowly well you see this appointment or rather the promise of it keeps me going tremendous lot of interest to work up good deal of bother you know but then beggars a eh? can't be choosers can they and i should like to go to the east that is if he pauses beams again and looks boldly into miss cavanagh's eyes she blushes hotly and dropping her fan makes a little attempt to pick it up again mr beauclerk makes another little attempt and so manages that his hand meets hers there is a slight and almost benevolent pressure 
had they looked at dysart as they both resumed their places they could have seen that his face is white as death miss kavanagh too looks a little pale a little uncertain but as a whole nervously happy i have been down at that old place of mine goes on mr beauclerk terrible disrepair takes thousands to put in any sort of order and where's one to get them that's the one question that has no answer nowadays eh dysart there is an answer however says dysart curtly not looking at him ah well i suppose so but i haven't heard it yet oh yes i think you have says dysart quite politely but grimly nevertheless dear fellow how where unless one discovers a mine or an african diamond field or an heiress says dysart incidentally ah lucky dog that comes home to you says beauclerk giving him a playful pat on his shoulder and stooping from his chair to do it as dysart still sits upon the grass not to me no you will be modest well well but talking of that old place i assure you miss kavanagh it worries me it does indeed it sounds like one's duty to restore it and still there are better things than an even old place says dysart ah you haven't one you see says beauclerk with the utmost geniality if you had i really think if you had you would understand that it requires a sacrifice to give it up to moths and rust and ruin i said there were better things than old places says dysart doggedly never looking in his direction and if there are make a sacrifice poof lucky fellows like you gay soldier lads with hearts as light as sunbeams can easily preach but sacrifices are not so easily made there is that horrid word duty and a man must sometimes think joyce as though the last word had struck some answering chord that wounds her as it strikes looks suddenly at him what was it barbara had said he was a man who would always think is he thinking now even now at this moment is he weighing matters in his mind ha says beauclerk rising and pointing to the court nearest them that game is over come on miss kavanagh let us go and get our scalps i say dysart will you fight it out with us no thanks afraid gaily of you no smiling the smile is admirably done and would be taken as the genuine article anywhere of miss kavanagh then for a brief instant and evidently against his wish dysart's eyes meet those of joyce perhaps says he a poor compliment to me says beauclerk with his pleasant laugh that always rings so softly well never mind i forgive you get a good partner my dear fellow so she may pull you through you see i depend entirely upon mine with a glance at joyce full of expression there's miss maliphant now she'd make a good partner if you like i shouldn't says dysart immovably she plays a good game i can tell you so do you says dysart oh now dysart don't be sarcastic says beauclerk laughing i believe you are afraid of me not of miss kavanagh and that's why you won't play but if you were to put yourself in miss maliphant's hands i don't say but that you would have a chance of beating me i shall beat you by myself or not at all says dysart suddenly and for the first time looking fair at him a single you mean yes a single well shall we says beauclerk ha there is court courtenay come along miss kavanagh we must make up a set as best we may as dysart is too lazy to face us the next game is ours mr dysart remember says she glancing at dysart over her shoulder there's a touch of anxiety in her eyes i always remember says he with a rather ambiguous smile what is he remembering now joyce's mouth gave a grave curve as she follows beauclerk down the marble steps that lead to the tennis ground below the evening has grown very still the light wind that all day long has sung among the leaves has gone to sleep only the monotonous counting of the tennis players can be heard suddenly above these another sound arises it is not the voice of the charmer it is the voice of tommy in full cry and mad with the desire to gain the better of the argument now going on between him and mr brown mr brown is still however holding his own he generally does his voice grows eloquent all can hear i shall tell my story tommy in my own way or i shall not tell it at all the dignity that mr brown throws into its threat is hardly to be surprised end of chapter 8 
Chapter Nine of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ruhi Huck. April's Lady by Margaret W. Hungerford. Chapter Nine. Sweet food of sweetly uttered knowledge. Tisn't right, says Tommy. I think it is. If you kindly listen to it once again and give your entire attention to it, you will see how faulty is the ignorant conclusion to which you have come. I am not one bit ignorant, says Tommy indignantly. Nurse says I am the Dickens and all at my Bible, and that I know Genesis better than she does. And a very engaging book it is too, says Mr. Brown. But it isn't everything. What you want to study, my good boy, is natural history. You are very ignorant about that at all events. A cow couldn't do it, says Tommy. History says she can. Now listen again. It is a grand old poem, and I am grieved and distressed, Thomas, to find that you refuse to accept it as one of the gems of truth thrown up to us out of the dark ages. Are you ready? Diddle dee, diddle dee, dumpty, the cow ran up the plum tree, half a crown to fetch her. She didn't. Twas the cat, cries Tommy not in my story says mr brown mildly but firmly a cow couldn't go up a plum tree indignantly she could in my story persists mr brown with all the air of one who even to avoid unpleasantness would not consent to go against the dictates of his conscience she couldn't i tell you roars tommy now thoroughly incensed she couldn't climb her horns would stick in the branches she'd be too heavy i admit thomas says mr brown gravely that your argument sounds as though there were some sense in it but who am i that i should dare to disbelieve ancient history it is unsafe to throw down old landmarks to blow up the bulwarks of our noble constitution beware tommy never tread on the trail of truth it may turn and rend you her name isn't truth says tommy a cow's name is biddy and she never ran up a tree in her life she's young says mr brown she'll learn so are you you'll learn and remember this my boy always respect old legends a disregard for them will so unsettle you that finally you will find yourself at the foot of the gallows in all human probability i suppose sadly that you are even so far gone in scepticism as to doubt the glorious truth of the moon's being made of green cheese father says that's nonsense says tommy promptly and with an air of triumph and father always knows i blush for your father says mr brown with an increasing melancholy both he and you are apparently sunk in heathen darkness well well we will let the question of the moon go by though i suppose you know tommy that the real and original moon first rose in cheshire no i don't says tommy with a militant glare there was once a cheshire cat there never was a cheshire moon i suppose you will tell me next there never was a cheshire cheese says mr brown severely don't you see the connection but never mind talking of cats brings us back to our mutton and from thence to our cow i do hope tommy that for the future you will at all events try to believe in that faithful old animal who skipped so gaily up and down and hither and thither and in and out and all about that long-suffering old plum tree she never did it says tommy stamping with rage and now nearly in tears i've books i've books and tisn't in any of them it's in my book says mr brown who ought to be ashamed of himself i don't believe you ever read a book screams tommy furiously twas the cat the cat the cat no twas the horned cow says mr brown in a sepulchral tone whereat tommy goes from him there is a wild and desperate conflict tooth and nail tommy attacks the four fists and legs doing very gallant service there would indeed have been a serious case of assault and battery for the next court day had not providence sent mrs monkton on the scene oh tommy cries she aghast it is presumably tommy though as he has his head thrust between mr brown's legs and his feet in mid-air kicking with all their might there isn't much of him by which to prove identification and oh dicky says she again 
how could you torment him so when you know how easy it is to excite him see what a state he is in and what about me demands mr brown who is weak with laughter is no sympathy to be shown me see what a state i am in i am black and blue from head to heel i am at the point of death nonsense you are all right but look at him oh tommy what a terrible boy you are and you promised me if i brought you that you just look at his clothes look at mine says mr brown my best hat is done for and i am afraid to examine my trousers you might tell me if there is a big rent anywhere no eh well if you won't i must only risk it but i feel tattered and torn by the by tommy that's part of another old story i'll tell you about it some day come with me tommy says his mother with awful severity she holds out her hand to her son who is still glaring at dicky with an undying ferocity you are a naughty boy and i'm sure your father will be angry with you when he hears of this oh but he must not hear of it must he tommy says mr brown with decision appealing to his late antagonist as airily as airily as utterly without a rare pensee as though no unpleasant passages have occurred between them it's awfully good of you to desire our company mr monkton but really on the whole i think it is tommy i want says mrs monkton still with a meaning eye where tommy goes i go says mr brown firmly we are wedded to each other for the day nothing shall part us neither law nor order just now we are going down to the lake to feed the swans with the succulent bun will you come with us you are very uncertain dicky says mrs monkton regarding mr brown with a gravity that savours of disapproval how shall i be sure that if you take him to the lake you will not let him drown himself he is far more likely to drown me says mr brown come along tommy the biscuits are in the hall and the lake a quarter of a mile away the day waneth let us haste let us haste where has dicky gone asks joyce who has just returned victorious from her game to the lake with tommy i have been imploring him not to drown my son says mrs monkton with a rather rueful smile oh he won't do that dicky is erratic but pretty safe for all that and he is fond of tommy he teases him however beyond endurance that is because he does like him a strange conclusion to arrive at surely says dysart looking at her no if he didn't like him he wouldn't take the trouble says she nonchalantly she's evidently a little distrait she looks as though she wanted something you won your game says her sister smiling at her yes quite a glorious victory they had only two games out of six and you know miss connor plays very well where is mr beauclerk gone into the house to write some letters and telegrams norman do you mean asks lady baltimore coming up at this moment her basket full of flowers and minus the little son and the heiress he has just gone into the house to hear miss maliphant sing you know she sings remarkably well and that last song of milton wetting suits her so entirely norman is very fond of music have you had a game joyce yes and won it says joyce smiling back at her though her face has paled a little had she won it well i must take these into the house before they fade write and wants them for the dinner table says lady baltimore a little hurried note has crept into her voice she turns away a somewhat abruptly lord baltimore and lady swansdown have just appeared in view lady swansdown with a huge bunch of honeysuckle in her hand looking very picturesque baltimore seeing his wife move towards the house and lady swansdown displaying the spoils of her walk to dysart darts quickly after her let me carry that burden for you says he laying his hand upon the basket of flowers no oh no thank you says lady baltimore glancing up at him for just a moment with a little curious expression in her eyes i have carried it quite a long time i hardly feel it now no go back to the lawn to lady swansdown see she's quite alone at this moment you will be doing me a real service if you look after our guests as you will says baltimore coldly he turns back with a frown and rejoins those he had left joyce is talking to lady swansdown in her prettiest way she seems indeed exceptionally gay even for her who as a rule is the life of every party 
her spirits seemed to have risen to quite an abnormal height and her charming laugh soft as it is sweet rings gaily with the advent of baltimore however lady swanston's attention veers aside and joyce feeling dysart at her elbow turns to him we postponed one game i think says she well shall we play the next i am sorry says he deliberately but i think not his eyes are on the ground no says she colouring warmly there is open surprise in her glance that he should refuse to accept an advance from her seems truly beyond belief you must forgive me says he deliberately still he had sworn to himself that he would not play second fiddle on this occasion at all events and he holds himself to his word but i feel as if i could not play to-day i should disgrace you let me get you another partner captain grant is out there he thank you i shall be able to provide myself with a partner when i want one interrupts she haughtily turning abruptly away End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford. Chapter Ten. Nature has sometimes made a fool. The fiddles are squeaking. The cellos are groaning. The man with the cornet is making a most ungodly row. As yet, the band have the ballroom all to themselves and are certainly making the most of their time. Such unearthly noises rarely, if ever, have been heard in it before. Why they couldn't have tuned their instruments before coming is a question that fills the butler's mind with wrath. But perhaps the long journey down from Dublin would have untuned them all again and left the players of them disconsolate. The dismal sounds penetrate into the rooms right and left of the ballroom, but fail to kill the melancholy sweetness of the dripping fountains or the perfume of the hundred flowers that give their sleeping draughts to all those who chose to come and inhale them. Mild draughts that please the senses without stealing them. The sounds even penetrate to the library, where Joyce is standing before the low fire that even in this July evening burns upon the hearth, fastening her long gloves. She had got down before the others, and now, finding the room empty, half wishes herself back again upstairs. But she is so young so full of a fresh delight in all the gaiety around her that she had hurried over her dressing and with the first dismal sounds of the toning had turned her steps its way the library seems cold to her bare unfriendly had she expected to meet somebody there before her somebody who had promised to get a fresh tie in a hurry but who had possibly forgotten all about it in the joy of an after-dinner cigar? It seems a long time since that first day when she had been startled by his sudden reappearance at the court. A long, long time. Soon this last visit of hers to the court must come to an end. The Baltimores will be going abroad in a fortnight or so, and he with them. The summer is waning, dreary autumn coming, he will go, and... A sense of dissatisfaction sits heavily on her, toning down to rather a too cruel a degree the bright expectancy of her face. He had said he would come, and now... She drums in a heavy-hearted, listless fashion on the table with the tips of her pale gloves, and noticing, half-consciously in so doing, that they have not been sufficiently drawn up her arm, mechanically fits them closer to the taper fingers. Certainly he had said he would be here, early, you know, before the others can get down. A quick frown grows upon her forehead, and now that the fingers are quiet, the little foot begins to beat a tattoo upon the ground. 
leaning against the table in a graceful attitude with the lamplight streaming on her pretty white frock she gives a loose rein to her thoughts they are a little angry a little frightened perhaps during the past week had he not said many things that in the end proved void of meaning he had haunted her in a degree at certain hours certain times had loitered through gardens lingered in conservatories by her side whispered many things looked so very many more but there were other times other opportunities for philandering she does not give it this unpleasant name how has he spent them a vague thought of miss maliphant crosses her mind that he laughs at the plain good-natured heiress to her joyce had not prevented the fact that he is very attentive to her at times principally such times as when joyce may reasonably be supposed to be elsewhere human reason however often fails short of the mark and there have been unsuspected moments during the past week when miss kavanagh has by chance appeared upon the scene of mr beauclerk's amusements and has found that miss maliphant has had a good deal to do with them but then that poor poor girl you know here beauclerk's joyous laugh would ring forth for joyce's benefit such a good girl and so er don't you know he was certainly always a little vague he didn't explain himself miss kavanagh looking back on all he had ever said against the heiress is obliged to confess to herself that the great er had had to express everything contempt dislike kindly disdain he was always kindly he made quite a point of that truly thinks miss kavanagh to herself after this retrospective glance er is the greatest word in the english language and so it is it declares it conceals it conveys a laugh it suggests a frown it helps a sourful confession it adorns a lame one it is kindly as giving time it is cruel as being full of sarcasm it in fact what is it it cannot do joyce's feet have grown quite steady now she has placed her hands on the table behind her and thus compelled to lean a little forward stands studying the carpet without seeing it a sense of anger of shame against herself is troubling her if he should not be in earnest if he should not like her as she likes him she rouses herself suddenly as if stung by some thought like is the word it has gone no deeper yet it shall not he is handsome he has his charm but if she is not all the world to him why he shall not be all the world to her if it is money he craves for the restoration of that old home of his why money let it be but there shall not be the two things the desire of one for filthy lucre the desire of the other for love he shall decide she has grown very pale she has drawn herself up to her full height and her lips are pressed together and now a strange thought comes to her if if she loved him could she bear thus to analyze him to take him to pieces to dissect him as it were once again that feeling of fear oppresses her is she so cold so deliberate in herself that she suspects others of coldness after all if he does love her if he only hesitates because a step outside the door instinctively she glances at one of the long mirrors that line the walls from floor to ceiling involuntarily her hands rush to her head she gives a little touch to her gown and now is sitting in a lounging chair a little pale still perhaps but in all other respects the very picture of unconsciousness it is it must be it isn't however 
Mr. Brown, opening the door in his own delightful breezy fashion that generally plays old Harry with the hinges and blows the ornaments off the nearest tables, advances toward her with arms outspread and the liveliest admiration writ upon his features, which, to say the truth, are of goodly proportions. Oh, thou wonder of the world, cries he in accents ecstatic. He has been reading Cleopatra, the most charming of books, assiduously for the past few days, during which time he has made himself an emphatic nuisance to his friends. Perpetual quotations, however apt or salutary, proving as a rule a bore. That will do, Dicky. We all know about that, says Miss Kavanagh, who is a little unnerved, a little impatient, perhaps. Mr. Brown, however, is above being snubbed by anyone. He continues on his way rejoicing. Thou living flame, cries he, making what he fondly supposes to be a stage attitude. Thou thing of beauty, thou flesh pot of Egypt. He has at last surpassed himself. He stands silent, waiting for the plaudits of the crowd. The crowd, however, is unappreciative. Nonsense, says Miss Cavanaugh shortly. I wonder you aren't tired of making people tired. Your eternal quotations would destroy the patience of an anchorite. And as for that last sentence of yours, you know very well it isn't in Ryder Haggard's book. He'd have been ashamed of it. Would he? Bet you he wouldn't. And if it isn't in his book, all I can say is it ought to have been. Mere oversight leaving it out. He will be sorry if I drop him a line about it. Shouldn't wonder if it produced a new edition. But for my part, I believe it is in the book. Flesh pots, Egypt, you know. Hardly possible to separate them now from the public mind. Well, he could separate them anyway. There isn't a single word about them in the book from start to finish. No, do you say so? Here Mr. Brown grows lost in thought. Flesh pots, pots, hot pots, hot potting. Ha! He draws himself together with all the manner of one who has gone down deep into a thing and comes up from it full of knowledge. I've mixed those babies up, says he mildly, but still I can hardly believe that that last valuable addition to Mr. Haggard's work is all my own. Distinctly your own, with a suggestion of scorn completely thrown away upon the receiver of it. Do you say so? By Jove! And very neat, too. Didn't think I had it in me. After all, to write a book is an easy matter. Here am I, who never thought about it, was able to form an entire sentence full of the most exquisite wit and humor without so much as knowing I was doing it. Tell you what, Joyce, I'll send it to the author with a card and my compliments, you know. Horrid thing to be mean about anything, and if I can help him out with a 999th edition or so, I'll be doing him a good turn, eh? I suppose you think you are amusing, says Miss Cavanaugh, regarding him with a critical eye. My good child, I know that expression, says Mr. Brown amiably. I know it by heart. It means that you think I'm a fool. It's politer nowadays to look things than to say them. But wait a while and you'll see. Come, I bet you a shilling to a sovereign that he'll be delighted with my suggestion and put it into his next edition without delay. No charge given away. The lot for a penny three farthings. In fact, I make it a present to him. Noble, eh? Give it to him for nothing. About its price, says Miss Cavanaugh thoughtfully. Think you so? You are dull tonight, Jocelyn. Flashes of wit pass you by without warming you. Yet I tell you this idea that has flowed from my brain is a priceless one. Never mind the door. He's not coming yet. Attend to me. Who's not coming? demands she, 
the more angrily in that she was growing miserably aware of the brilliant color that is slowly but surely bedecking her cheeks. Never mind, it's a mere detail. Attend to me, and I entreat you, says Mr. Brown, who is now quite in his element, having made sure of the fact that she is expecting somebody. It doesn't matter in the least who, to Mr. Brown, expectation is the thing wherein to catch the embarrassment of Miss Cavanaugh, and forthwith he sets himself gaily to the teasing of her. Attend to what? says she with a little frown. If you had studied your Bible, Jocelyn, with that care that I should have expected from you, you would have remembered that forty-odd years the Israelites hankered after those very flesh-pots of Egypt, to which I have been alluding. Now I appeal to you, as a sensible girl, would anybody hanker after anything for forty years, very odd years as it happens, unless it was to their advantage to get it, unless indeed the object pursued was priceless. You ask too much of this sensible girl, says Miss Cavanaugh, with a carefully manufactured yawn. Really, dear Dicky, you must forgive me if I say I haven't gone into it as yet, and that I don't suppose I shall ever see the necessity for going into it. But, my good child, you must see that those respectable people, the Israelites, wouldn't have pursued a mere shadow for forty years. That's just what I don't see. There are such a number of fools everywhere, in every age, that one couldn't tell. This is evasion, says Mr. Brown sternly. To bring you face to face with facts must be my very unpleasant, if distinct, duty. Joyce, do you dare to doubt for one moment that I speak aught but the truth? Will you deny that Cleopatra, that old serpent of the... Ha, ha, ha! laughs Joyce ironically. I wish she could hear you. Your life wouldn't be worth a moment's purchase. Mere slip, serpent of old Nile. Doesn't matter in the least, says Mr. Brown airily, because she couldn't hear me as it happens. My dear girl, follow out the argument. Cleopatra, metaphorically speaking, was a flesh-pot, because the world hankered after her. And you're another. Really, Dicky, I must protest against you talking slang to me. Where does the slang come in? You're another flesh-pot. I meant to say, or convey, because we all hanker after you. Do you? with rising wrath. May I ask what hankering means? You had better not, says Mr. Brown mysteriously. It was one of the rites of ancient Kem. Now there is one thing, Dicky, says Miss Cavanaugh, her wrath boiling over. I won't be called names. I won't be called a fleshpot. You'll draw the line there, if you please. My dear girl, why not? Those delectable pots must have been bric-a-brac of the most recherche description. Of a most delectable shape, no doubt. Of a pattern, tint, formation, general get-up, not to be hoped for in these prosaic days. Nonsense! Indignantly. She is fairly roused now, and Mr. Brown, regarding her with a proud eye, tells himself he is about to have his reward at last. You know very well that the term flesh pots referred to what was in the pots, not to the pots themselves. That's all you know about. That's where your fatal ignorance comes in, my poor Joyce, says he with immense compassion. Search your Bible from cover to cover, and I defy you to find a single mention of the contents of those valuable bits of bric-a-brac, of flesh pots, Heavy emphasis on the pots. And ten fingers down at once, if you please, we read continually as being hankered after by the Israelites, who then, as now, were evidently avid collectors. You've been having champagne, Dicky, says Miss Cavanaugh, regarding him with a judicial eye. 
So have you, but I can't see what that excellent beverage has got to do with the ancient Jews. Keep to the point. Did you ever hear that they expressed a longing for the flesh of Egypt? No, so far so good. The pots themselves were the object of their admiration. During that remarkable run of theirs through the howling wilderness, they, one and all, to a man, betrayed the true aesthetic tendency. They raved incessantly for the girl, I beg pardon, the land they had left behind them, the land that contained those priceless jars. I wonder how you can be so silly, says Miss Cavanaugh disdainfully. Will he never go away if he stays and if the other comes? Silly? My good child, how silly! Why, everything goes to prove the probability of my statement. The taste for articles of vertu, for antiquities, for fossils of all descriptions that characterized them then, has lived to the present day. Then they worried after old China, and who shall deny that now they have an overwhelming affection for old Clo? Well, your folly doesn't concern me, says Miss Cavanaugh, gathering up her skirts with an evident intention of shaking off the dust of his presence from her feet and quitting him. I am sorry that you should consider it folly, says Mr. Brown sorrowfully. I should not have said so much about it, perhaps, but that I wanted to prove to you that in calling you a fleshpot, I only meant to— I won't be called that, interrupts Miss Cavanaugh angrily. It's horrid. It makes me feel quite fat. Now, once and for all, Dickie, I forbid it. I won't have it. I don't see how you are to get out of it, says Mr. Brown, shaking his head and hands in wild deprecation. Fleshpots were desirable articles. You're another. Ergo, you're a fleshpot. See the argument? No, I don't, indignantly. I see only you, and I wish I didn't. Very rude, very, says Mr. Brown regretfully. Yet I entreat thee not to leave me without one other word. Follow up the argument. Do. Give me an answer to it. Not one, walking to the door. That's because it is unanswerable says Mr. Brown complacently. You are beaten, you. There is a sound outside the door. Joyce, with her hand on the handle of it, steps back and looks round nervously at Dicky. A quick color has dyed her cheeks. Instinctively, she moves a little to one side and gives a rapid glance into a long mirror. I don't think really he could find a fault, says Mr. Brown mischievously. I should think there would be a good deal of hankering going on tonight. Miss Cavanaugh has only just barely time to wither him when Beauclerk comes hurriedly in. End of chapter 10「For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hannah Parrott. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter 11. Thinkest thou there are no serpents in the world but those who slide along the grassy sod and sting the luckless foot that presses them? There are who in the path of social life do bask their spotted skins in fortune's sun and sting the soul. "'Oh, there you are!' cries he jovially. "'Been looking for you everywhere. "'The music has begun, first dance just forming. "'Gay and lively quadrille, you know. "'Country ball wouldn't know itself without a beginning like that. "'Come, come on!' "'Nothing can exceed his bonhomie. "'He tucks a hand in the most delightfully genial, "'appropriative fashion under his arm.' and with a beaming nod to Mr. Brown, he never forgets to be civil to anybody, hurries Joyce out of the room, leaving the astute Dicky gazing after him with mingled feelings in his eye. "'Juice and all of a smart chap,' says Mr. Brown to himself slowly, "'but he'll fall through some day for all that, I shouldn't wonder.' 
Meantime, Mr. Beauclerk is still carrying on a charming restative. Such a bore, he is saying, with heartfelt disgust in his tone. It is really wonderful how he can always do it. There is never a moment when he flags. He is for ever up to time, as it were, and equal to the occasion. I'm afraid you've rather misunderstood me just now, when I said I'd been looking for you. But the fact is, Brown's such an ass. If he knew we had made an appointment to meet in the library, he'd have brayed the whole affair to any and every one. Was there an appointment? says Miss Kavanagh, who was feeling a little unsettled, a little angry with herself, perhaps. No, no, with a delightful acceptation of her rebuke. You're a right as ever. I was wrong. But then, you see, it gave me a sort of joy to believe that our light allusion to a possible happy half-hour before the turmoil of the dance began might mean something more, something... Ah, well, never mind. Men are vain creatures, and after all, it would have been a happy half-hour to me only. Would it? says she, with a curious glance at him. You know that, says he, with the full and earnest glance he can turn on at a second's notice without the slightest injury to heart or mind. I don't indeed. Oh, well, you haven't time to think about it, perhaps. I found you very fully occupied when, at last, I was able to get to the library. Brown, we all know, is a very, er, uh, lively companion, if rather wanting in the higher virtues. At last, say she, quoting his words. She turns suddenly and looks at him, a world of inquiry in her dark eyes. "'I hate pretense,' says she curtly, throwing up her young head with a haughty movement. "'You said you would be in the library at such an hour, and though I did not promise to meet you there, still, as I happened to be dressed earlier than I believed possible, I came down, and you, where were you?' There is a touch of imperiousness in that last question that augurs badly for a false wooer, but the imperiousness suits her with her pretty chin uptilted, and that little scornful curve upon her lips, and her lovely eyes ablaze, she looks indeed a thing of beauty. Beauclerk regards her with distinct approbation. After all, had she even half the money that the heiress possesses, what a wife she would make! And it isn't decided yet one way or the other, sometimes fate is kind. The day may come when this delectable creature may fall to his portion." "'I can see you are thinking hard things of me,' says he reproachfully. "'But you little know how I have been passing the time I had so been looking forward to. "'Time to be passed with you. "'The old Lady Blake, she would keep me maundering to her about that son of hers in the Mauritius. "'You know he and I were at St. Peter's Peg together. "'I couldn't get away. "'You blame me, but what was I to do? "'An old woman, unhappy?' "'Oh, no, you were right,' says Joyce quickly.' How good he is, after all, and how unjustly she had been thinking of him. So kind, so careful of the feelings of a tiresome old woman. How few men are like him. How few would so far sacrifice themselves. Ah, you see it like that, says Mr. Beauclerk, not triumphantly, but so modestly that the girl's heart goes out to him even more. How generous he is, not a word of rebuke to her for her vile suspicion of him. "'Why, you put me into good spirits again,' says he, laughing gaily. "'We must make haste, I fear, if we would save the first dance.' "'Oh, yes, come,' says Joyce, going quickly forward. "'Evidently he is going to ask her for the first dance. "'That shows that he prefers her to... "'I'm so glad you have been able to sympathise with me "'about my last disappointment,' says Beauclerk. "'If you hadn't, if you had had even one hard thought of me, "'I don't know how I should have been able to endure what still lies before me.' I am almost raging with anger, but when one's sister is in question. You mean, says Joyce a little faintly, Oh, you haven't heard, I am so annoyed myself about it, that I fancied everybody knew. You know I hoped that you would have been good enough to give me the first dance, but when Isabel asked me to dance with that dreadful daughter of Lady Dunscombe's, what could I do, now I ask you, appealing to her with hands and eyes, what could I do? Obey, of course, says she with an effort, but a successful one. You must hurry, too, if you want to secure Miss Dunscombe. Ah, what a misfortune it is to be the brother of one's hostess, says he, with a sort of comic despair. His eyes are centred on her face, reading her carefully, and with much secret satisfaction, rapid as that slight change upon her face had been, he had seen and noted it. "'It couldn't possibly be a misfortune to be Lady Baltimore's brother,' says she, smiling. "'On the contrary, you are to be congratulated.' "'Not just at this moment, surely.' 
at this or any other moment ah as they enter the ballroom the room is already fuller than i thought engaged mr blake to lord blake's eldest son no not for this yes with pleasure she makes a little charming inclination of her head to beauclerk and laying a hand on mr blake's arm moves away with him to where a set is already forming at the end of the room it is without enthusiasm she takes her place with dysart and one of the o'donovan girls as vis-a-vis -vis, and prepares to march retreat twist and turn with the best of them a dull old game she is irreverently terming the quadrilles that massing together of an elegant movement so dear to the bucolic mind that saving clause for the old maids and the wallflowers when a little change of position shows her the double quartet on the right-hand side of the magnificent ballroom she had been half through an unimportant remark to mr blake but she stops short now and forgets to finish it her colour comes and goes the sides are now prancing through their performance and she and her partner are standing still perhaps perhaps she was mistaken with all these swaying idiots on every side of her she might well have mixed up one man's partner with another and miss dunscombe she had caught a glimpse of her a while ago was surely in that set on the right-hand side she stoops forward regardless oblivious of her partner's surprised glance who had just been making a very witty remark and being a rather smart young man accustomed to be listened to is rather taken aback by her open indifference a little more forward she leans yes now the couple's part for one moment the coast lies clear she can see distinctly miss dunscombe is indeed dancing in that set but not as mr beauclerk's partner miss maliphant has secured that enviable role even as joyce gazes beauclerk turning his head meets her earnest regard he returns it with a beaming smile miss maliphant whose duty it is at this instant to advance and retire and receive without the support of a chaperone the attacks of the bold bad man opposite having moved out of beauclerk's sight the latter with an expressive glance directed at joyce lifts his shoulders forlornly and gives a serio-comic shrug of his shoulders all to show how bored a being he is at finding himself thus the partner of the ugly heiress it is all done in a second an inimitable bit of acting but unpleasant joyce draws herself up her eyes fall away from his unless the distance is too far the touch of disdain that lies in them should have disconcerted even mr beauclerk perhaps it has our turn says she giving her partner a sudden beautiful glance full of fire of life of something that he fails to understand but does not fail to consider charming she smiles she grows radiant she is a different being from a moment ago how could he blake have thought her stupid how she takes up every word and throws new meaning into it and what a laugh she has low sweet merry music to its core beauclerk in his turn finds a loophole through which to look at her and is conscious of a faint feeling of chagrin she oughtn't to have taken it like that to be a little pensive a little sad that would have shown a right spirit well the night is long he can play his game here and there there is plenty of time in which to regain lost ground with one to gain fresh ground with the other joyce will forgive him when she hears his version of it end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hannah Parrott April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 12 If thou canst see not, hast thou ears to hear, or is thy soul too as a leaf that dies? Well, after all, life has its compensations, says Mr. Beauclerk, sinking upon the satin lounge beside Miss Kavanagh, and giving way to a rapturous sigh. He is looking very big and very handsome. His close-cropped, eminently aristocratic head is thrown a little back, to give full play to the ecstatic smile he is directing at Joyce. She bears it wonderfully. She receives it indeed with all the amiable imbecility of a person who doesn't understand what on earth you are talking about. 
whether this reception of his little opening speech, so carefully prepared, puzzles or nettles Mr. Beauclerk, there is no way of learning. He makes no sign. I thought I should never be able to get a dance with you, you see, smiling. When one is the belle of the evening, one grows difficult. But you might have kept a fifth or sixth for a poor outsider like me. An old friend, too. Old friends don't count at a dance, I'm afraid, says she, with a smile as genial as his own. Though, for the matter of that, you could have had the first. No one, hard as it may be to make you believe it, had asked the bell of the evening for that. This is not quite true. Many had asked for it. Dysart, amongst others, but she had kept it open for the one who didn't want it. However, fibs of this sort one blinks at where pretty girls are the criminals. Her tone is delicately sarcastic. She would willingly suppress the sarcasm altogether as beneath her, but she is very angry, and when a woman is angry there is generally somebody to pay. "'Oh, that first, says he, with a gesture of impatience. "'I shan't forgive Isabel in a hurry about that. "'She ruined my evening up to this. "'However, throwing off, as it were, unpleasant memories by a shake of his head, "'don't let me spoil my one good time by dwelling upon a bad one. "'Here I am now, at all events. "'Here is comfort, here is peace.' The hour I have been longing for is mine at last. It might have been yours considerably earlier, says Miss Kavanagh, with very noteworthy deliberation, unmoved by his lover-like glances, which, after all, have more truth in them than most of his declarations. She sits playing with her fan, and with a face expressionless as any sphinx. Oh, my dear girl, says Mr. Beauclerk reproachfully, how can you say that? You know in one sister's house one must, eh? And she laid positive commands on me. To dance the first dance with Miss Maliphant? Now that's not like ye, says Mr. Beauclerk very gently. It's not just. When I found Miss Dunscombe engaged for that ridiculous quadrille, what could I do? You were engaged to Blake. I was looking aimlessly round me, cursing my luck in that I had not thrown up even my sister's wishes, and secured before it was too late the only girl in the room I cared to dance with when Isabel came again. Not dancing, says she, and there's Miss Maliphant over there, partnerless. He tells all this with as genuine an air as if it were not false from start to finish. "'You know, Isabel,' says he, laughing airily. "'She takes the oddest fancies at times. "'Miss Maliphant is her latest craze. "'Though what she can see in her. "'A nice girl. "'Thoroughly nice. "'Essentially real. "'A little too real, perhaps, "'with a laugh so irresistible "'that even Miss Kavanagh, against her will, "'is compelled to join in it. "'Honest all through, I admit. "'But as a waltzer?' Well, well, we shouldn't be too severe, but really, there you know, she leaves everything to be desired, and I've been victimised not once, but twice, three times. It is nothing remarkable, says Miss Kavanagh coldly. Many very charming girls do not dance well. It is a gift. A very precious one. When a charming girl can't waltz, she ought to learn how to sit down charmingly, and not oppress innocent people. As for Miss Maliphant, throwing out his large, handsome hands expressively, she certainly should not dance. Her complexion doesn't stand it. Did you notice her? No, icily. Ah, you wouldn't, you know. I could see how thoroughly well occupied you were. Not a thought for even an old friend. And besides, you're a girl in ten thousand. Nothing petty or small about you. Now another woman would not have failed to notice the fatal tendency towards rubicundity that marks Miss Maliphant's nose whenever— I do so dislike discussing people behind their backs, says Miss Kavanagh slowly. 
I always think it's so unfair. They can't defend themselves. It's like maligning the dead. Miss Maliphant isn't dead at all events. She is dreadfully alive, says Mr. Beauclerk, totally unabashed. He laughs gaily. To refuse to be lectured was a rule he had laid down for his own guidance early in life. Those people who will not see when they ought to be offended have generally the best of the game. "'Would you have her dead?' asked Joyce, with calm interrogation. "'I don't remember saying I would have her anyway,' says he, still evidently clinging to the frivolous mood. "'And at all events I wouldn't have her dancing. It disagrees with her nose. It makes her suggestive. It betrays one into the making of bad parodies. One I made tonight when looking at her. I couldn't resist it.' For once in her life, you see, she was irresistible. Hear it. Oh, my love's got a red, red nose. Ha ha, not half bad, eh? It kept repeating itself in my brain all the time I was looking at her. I thought you liked her, says Joyce, lifting her large dark eyes for the first time to his. Beautiful eyes, a little shocked now, a little cold, almost entreating. Surely, surely he will not destroy her ideal of him. You think I am censorious, says he readily, cruel almost, but to you, with delicate flattery, surely I may speak to you as I would speak to no other, may I not? He leans a little forward, and compelling the girl's reluctant gaze, goes on speaking. It chafes him that she should put him on his defence. But some one divine instinct within him warns him not to break with her entirely. Still, says he in a low tone, always with his eyes on hers, I see that you condemn me. Condemn you? No, why should I be your judge? You are, however, and my judge and jury too. I cannot bear to think that you should despise me, and all because of that wretched girl— I don't despise you, says the girl quickly. If you were really despicable, I should not like you as well as I do. I am only sorry that you should say little unkind things of a girl like Miss Maliphant, who, if not beautiful, is surely to be regarded in a very kindly light. Do you know, says Mr. Beauclerk gently, I think you are the one sweet character in the world. There is a great amount of belief in his tone. Perhaps half of it is honest. I never met anyone like you. Women, as a rule, are willing to tear each other to pieces. But you, you condone all faults. That is why I... A pause. He leans forward. His eyes are eloquent. His tongue alone refrains from finishing the declaration that he had begun. To the girl beside him, however, ignorant of subterfuge unknowing of the wiles that run in and out of society like a thread, his words sound sweet, the sweeter for the very hesitation that accompanies them. "'I am not so perfect as you think me,' says she, rather sadly, her voice a little faint. "'That is true,' says he quickly, as though compelled against his will to find fault with her. "'A while ago you were angry with me because I was driven to waste my time with people uncongenial to me.' That was unfair, if you like. He throws her own accusation back at her in the gentlest fashion. I dance with this, that, and the other person, it is true. But do you not know where my heart was all this time? He pauses for a moment, just long enough to make more real his question, but hardly long enough to let her reply to it. To bring matters to a climax would not suit him at all. "'Yes, you do know,' says he, seeing her about to speak. "'And yet you misjudge me. "'If, if I were to tell you that I would rather be with you "'than with any other woman in the world, "'you would believe me, wouldn't you?' "'He stoops over her, and taking her hand, "'presses it fondly, lingeringly. "'Answer me.' "'Yes,' says Joyce in a low tone. "'It has not occurred to her that his words are a question.' rather than an asseveration. That he loves her seems to her certain. A soft glow illumines her cheeks. Her eyes sink beneath his. The idea that she is happy, 
or at all events ought to be happy fills her with a curious wonderment do people always feel so strange so surprised so unsure when love comes to them yet you did doubt says beauclerk giving her hand a last pressure and now nestling back amongst his cushions with all the air of a man who has fought and conquered and has been given his reward well don't let us throw an unpleasant memory into this happy hour as i have said taking up her fan and idly if gracefully waving it to and fro after all the turmoil of the fight it is sweet to find oneself at last in the haven where one would be he is smiling at joyce the gayest the most candid smile in the world smiles become him he is looking really handsome and happy at finding himself thus alone with her sincerity declares itself in every line of his face perhaps he is as sincere as he has ever yet been in his life the one thing that he unquestionably does regard with interest beyond his own poor precious bones is the exquisite bit of nature's workmanship now sitting beside him at this present moment in spite of his flattering words his smiles and telling glances she is still a little cold a little uncertain a phase of manner that renders her indescribably charming to the one watching her beauclerk indeed is enjoying himself immensely to a man of his temperament to be able to play upon a nature as fine as honest as pure as joyce's is to know a keen delight that the girl is dissatisfied vaguely nervously dissatisfied he can read as easily as though the workings of her soul lay before him in broad type and to assuage those half-defined misgivings of hers is a task that suits him he attacks it con amore how silent you are says he very gently when he has let quite a long pause occur i am tired i think of me no of what then he has found that as a rule there is nothing a woman likes better than to be asked to define her own feelings joyce however disappoints him i don't know sitting up so late i suppose look here says he in a voice so full of earnest emotion that joyce involuntarily stares at him i know what is the matter with you you are fighting against your better nature you are trying to be ungenerous you are trying to believe what you know is not true tell me honestly mind are you not forcing yourself to regard me as a monster of insincerity you are wrong says she slowly i am forcing myself on the contrary to believe you a very giant of sincerity and you find that difficult yes an intense feeling of admiration for her sways beauclerk how new a thing to find a girl so beautiful with so much intelligence surely instinct is the great lever that moves humanity why has not this girl the thousands that render miss maliphant so very desirable what a petite on the part of mother nature alas it would be too much to expect from that niggardly dame beauty intelligence wealth all rolled into one personality impossible you are candid says he his tone sorrowful that is what one should always be says she in turn you are too stern a judge how shall i convince you exclaims he of what he leaves open if i were to swear do not say she quickly well i won't but joyce he pauses purposefully it is the first time he has ever called her by her christian name and a little soft colour springs into the girl's cheeks as she hears him you know says he you do know it is a question but again what what does she know he had accredited her with remarkable intelligence a moment ago but as a fact the girl's knowledge of life is but a poor thing in comparison with that of the man of the world she belies her intelligence on the spot yes i think i do says she shyly in fact she is longing to believe to be sure of this thing 
that to her is so plain that she is omitted to notice that he has never put it into words. "'You will trust in me?' says he. "'Yes, I trust you,' says she simply. A pretty gloved hand is lying on her lap. Raising it, he presses it passionately to his lips. Joyce, with a little nervous movement, withdraws it quickly. The colour dies from her lips. Even at this supreme moment does doubt hold her in thrall. Her face is marvellously bright and happy, however, as she rises precipitately to her feet, much to Beauclerk's relief. It has gone quite far enough, he tells himself. Five minutes more, and he would have found himself in a rather embarrassing position. Really, these pretty girls are very dangerous. Come, we must go back to the ballroom, says she gaily. We have been here an unconscionable time. I am afraid my partner for this dance has been looking for me, and will scarcely forgive my treating him so badly. If I had only told him I wouldn't dance with him, he might have got another partner and enjoyed himself. Better to have loved and lost, quotes Beauclerk in his airiest manner. It is so airy that it strikes Joyce unpleasantly. Surely after all, after, she pulls herself together angrily. Is she always to find fault with him? Must she have his whole nature altered to suit her taste? Ah, there is Dickie Brown, says she, glancing from where she is now standing at the door of the conservatory, to where Mr. Brown may be seen, leaning against a curtain, with his lips curved in a truly benevolent smile. End of chapter 12「Thirteen of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hannah Parrott. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter 13. Now the nights are all passed over, of our dreaming dreams that hover, in a mist of fair false things, nights afloat on wide wan wings. Why, so it is, our own Dicky, in the flesh and an admirable temper, apparently, says Mr. Beauclerk. Shall we come and interview him? They move forward and presently find themselves at Mr. Brown's elbow. He is, however, so far lost in his kindly ridicule of the poor, silly, revolving atoms before him, that it is not until Miss Kavanagh gives his arm a highly suggestive pinch that he learns that she is beside him. Whoa, says he, shouting out this unclassic, if highly expressive word, without the slightest regard for decency. What fingers you've got! I really think you might reserve that kind of thing for Mr. Dysart. He'd like it. This is a most infelicitous speech, and Miss Kavanagh might have resented it, but for the strange fact that Beauclerk, on hearing it, laughs heartily. Well, if he doesn't mind, it can't matter, but how silly Dicky can be. Mr. Beauclerk continues to laugh with much enjoyment. Try him, says he to Miss Kavanagh, with the liveliest encouragement in his tone. If it occurs to her that perhaps lovers, as a rule, do not advise their sweethearts to play fast and loose with other men, she refuses to give heed to the warning. He is not like other men. He is not basely jealous. He knows her. He trusts her. He had hinted to her, but just now, so very, very kindly, that she was suspicious, that she must try to conquer that fault, if it is hers. And it is. There can be no doubt of that. She had even distrusted him. "'Is that your advice?' asks Mr. Brown, regarding him with a rather piercing eye. "'Capital, under the circumstances. But rather, eh, has it ever occurred to you that Dysart is capable of a good deal of feeling?' "'So few things occur to me, I'm ashamed to say,' says Beauclerk genially. "'I take the present moment. It is all sufficing, so far as I'm concerned. "'Well, and so you tell me Dysart has feeling?' 
"'Yes, I shouldn't advise Miss Kavanagh to play pranks with him,' says Dicky, with a pretentiously rueful glance at the arm she has just pinched so very delicately. "'You're a poor soldier,' says she, with a little scornful uptilting of her chin. "'You wrong Mr. Dysart if you think he would feel so slight an injury. What, a mere touch from me?' "'Your touch is deadlier than you know, perhaps,' says Mr. Brown lightly. "'What a slander,' says Miss Kavanagh, who, in spite of herself, is growing a little conscious. "'Yes, isn't it?' says Beauclerk, to whom she has appealed. "'As for me,' he breaks off suddenly, and fastens his gaze severely on the other side of the room. "'By Jove, I had forgotten! There is my partner for this dance looking daggers at me. Dear Miss Kavanagh, you will excuse me, won't you? Shall I take you to your chaperone?' or will you let Brown have the remainder of this waltz? I'll look after Miss Kavanagh, if she will allow me, says Dicky rather dryly. Will you? with a quizzical glance at Joyce. She makes a little affirmative sign to him, returns Beauclerk's parting bow, and, still with a heart as light as a feather, stands by Mr. Brown's side, watching in silence the form of Beauclerk as it moves here and there amongst the crowd. What a handsome man he is! How distinguished! How tall! How big! Every other man looks dwarfed beside him! Presently he disappears into an anteroom, and she turns to find Mr. Brown, for a wonder, as silent as herself, and evidently lost in thought. "'What are you thinking of?' asks she. "'Of you!' "'Nonsense! What were you doing just then when I spoke to you?' "'I have told you!' "'No, you haven't. What were you doing?' "'Hankering,' says Mr. Brown heavily. "Dicky," says she indignantly. "'Well, what? Do you suppose a fellow gets rid of a disease of that sort all in a minute? "'It generally lasts a good month, I can tell you. "'But come, that beautiful star of yours, that shines in your heaven so bright, "'has given you into my charge.' "'What can I do for you?' "'Deliver me from the wrath of that man over there,' says Miss Kavanagh, indicating Mr. Blake, who, with a thunderous brow, is making his way towards her. "'The last was his. I forgot all about it. Take me away, Dicky. Somewhere, anywhere. I know he's got a horrid temper, and he is going to say uncivil things. Where?' here she meanly tries to get behind Mr. Brown. "'Shall we go?' "'Right through this door,' says Mr. Brown, who, as a rule, is equal to all emergencies. He pushes her gently towards the conservatory she has just quitted, that has steps leading from it to the illuminated gardens below, and just barely gets her safely ensconced behind a respectable barricade of greenery, before Mr. Blake arrives on the spot they have just vacated.' They have indeed the satisfaction of seeing him look vaguely round, murmur a gentle anathema or two, and then resign himself to the inevitable. "'He's gone,' says Miss Kavanagh, with a sigh of relief. "'To perdition,' says Mr. Brown, in an awesome tone. "'I really wish you wouldn't, Dicky," says Joyce. "'Why not? You seem to think men's hearts are made of adamant. A moment ago you sneered at mine.' And now, by Jove, here's Baltimore, and alone for a wonder. Well, his heart is adamant, says she softly. Or hers, which? Of course, manlike, you condemn our sex. That's why I'm glad I'm not a man. Why? Because if you were, you would condemn your present sex? Certainly not, because I wouldn't be of an unfair mean, ungenerous disposition for the world. Good old Joe, says Mr. Brown, giving her a tender pat upon the back. By this time Baltimore has reached them. Have you seen Lady Baltimore anywhere? asks he. Not quite lately, says Dicky. Last June I saw her, she was dancing with Farnham. Oh, after that she went to the library, says Joyce quickly. I fancy she may be there still, because she looked a little tired. Well, she had been dancing a good deal, says Dicky. Thanks, I dare say I'll find her. 
says Baltimore, with an air of indifference, hurrying on. "'I hope he will,' says Joyce, looking after him. "'I hope so, too, and in a favourable temper. "'You're a cynic, Dicky, under all that airy manner of yours,' says Miss Kavanagh severely. "'Come out to the gardens. The air may cool your brain, and reduce you to milder judgments. "'Of Lady Baltimore? Yes.' Truly, I do seem to be sitting in judgment on her and her family. Her family? What has Bertie done? Oh, there is more family than Bertie, says Mr. Brown. She has a brother, hasn't she? Meantime, Lord Baltimore, taking Joyce's hint, makes his way to the library, to find his wife there lying back in a huge armchair. She is looking a little pale, a little ennuyé. It is plain that she has sought this room, one too public to be in much request, with a view to getting away for a little while from the noise and heat of the ballroom. Not dancing, says her husband, standing well away from her. She had sprung into a sitting posture the moment she saw him, an action that has angered Baltimore. His tone is uncivil, his remark, it must be confessed, superfluous. Why does she persist in treating him as a stranger? Surely, on whatever bad terms they may be, she need not feel it necessary to make herself uncomfortable on his appearance. She has evidently been enjoying that stolen lounge, and now... The lamplight is streaming full upon her face. A faint colour has crept into it. The white velvet gown she is wearing is hardly whiter than her neck and arms, and her eyes are as bright as her diamonds, yet there is no feature in her face that could be called strictly handsome. This, Baltimore tells himself, staring at her as he is, in a sort of insolent defiance of the cold glance she has directed at him. No, there is no beauty about that face— distinctly bred, calm and pure, it might possibly be called charming by those who liked her, but nothing more. She is not half so handsome as, as any amount of other women he knows, and yet it increases his anger towards her tenfold, to know that in her secret soul she has the one face that to him is beautiful, and ever will be beautiful. You see, says she gently, and with an expressive gesture, I longed for a moment's pause, so I came here. Do they want me? She rises from her seat, looking very tall and graceful. If her face is not strictly lovely, there is, at all events, no lack of loveliness in her form. I can't answer for they, says Baltimore, but... He stops dead short here. If he had been going to say anything... The desire to carry out his intention dies upon the spot. No, I am not aware that they, or anybody, want you particularly at this moment. Pray sit down again. I have had quite a long rest already. You look tired, however. Are you? Not in the least. Give me this dance, then, says he, half-mockingly, yet with a terrible earnestness in his voice. Give it to you? Thank you, no! "'Fearful of contamination?' with a smiling sneer. "'Pray spare me your jibes,' says she very coldly, her face whitening. "'Pray spare me your presence, you should rather say. "'Let us have the truth at all hazards. "'A saint like you should be careful.' "'To this she makes him no answer. "'What?' cries he sardonically. "'And will you miss this splendid opportunity?' of giving a sop to your Siberius, of consolating your bugbear, your bête noir, your fear of gossip. I fear nothing, icily. You do, however, forgive the contradiction, with a sarcastic inclination of the head. But for this fear of yours, you would have cast me off long ago, and bade me go to the devil as soon as, nay, the sooner the better. And indeed, if it were not for the child... By the by, do you forget I have a hold on him, a stronger than yours? I forget nothing either, returned she as icily as before, but now a tremor, barely perceptible, 
but terrible in its intensity, shakes her voice. Ha! You need not tell me that. You are relentless as, well, fate comes in handy, with a reckless laugh. Let us be conventional by all means, and it is a good old simile, well worn. You decline my proposal then? It is a sensible one, and should suit you. Dance with me to-night, when all the county is present, and Mother Grundy goes to bed with a sore heart. Scandal lies slain. All will cry aloud, There they go, fast friends, in spite of all the lies we have heard about them. Is it possible you can deliberately forego so great a chance of puzzling our neighbours? I can. Why, where is your sense of humour? One trembles for it. To be able to deceive them all so deliriously, to send them home believing us on good terms, a veritable loving couple. He breaks into a curious laugh. This is too much, says she, her face now like death. You would insult me. Believe me, that not to spare myself all the gossip with which the whole world could hurt me, would I enjoy your arm around my waist. His short-lived, most unmirthful mirth has died from him. He has laid a hand upon the table near him to steady himself. You are candid on my soul, says he slowly. She moves quickly towards the door, her velvet skirt sweeping over his feet as she goes by, the perfume of the violets lying in her bosom reaches him. Hardly knowing his own meaning, he puts out his hand and catches her by her naked arm, just where the long glove ceases above the elbow. "'Isabel, give me this dance,' says he a little wildly. "'No!' She shakes herself free of him. A moment her eyes blaze into his— no, she says again, trembling from head to foot. Another moment and the door has closed behind her. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny McCann April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 14 The Old, Old Pain of Earth It is now close upon midnight, that midnight of the warmer months, when day sets its light finger on the fringes of it. There is a sighing through the woods, a murmur from the everlasting sea, and though Diana still rides high in heaven with her handmaiden Venus by her side, Yet in a little while her glory will be departed, and her one rival, the sun, will push her from her throne. The gleaming lamps among the trees are scarcely so bright as they were an hour ago. The faint sighing of the wind that heralds the morning is shaking them to and fro. A silly bird has waked, and is chirping in a foolish fashion among the rhododendrons, where, in a secluded path, Joyce and Dickie Brown are wandering somewhat aimlessly. Before them lies a turn in the path that leads presumably into the dark wood, darkest of all at this hour, and where presumably, too, no one has ventured, though one should never presume about hidden corners. "'I can't think what you see in him,' says Mr. Brown, after a big pause. "'I'd say nothing if his face wasn't so fat. But if I were you, that would condemn him in my eyes.' "'I can't see that his face is fatter than yours.' says Miss Kavanagh, with what she fondly believes perfect indifference. "'Neither is it,' says Mr. Brown meekly. "'But, my dear girl, there lies the gist of my argument. "'You have condemned me. "'All my devotion has been scouted by you. "'I don't pretend to be the wreck still that once by your cruelty you made me, but—' "'Oh, that will do,' says Joyce unfeelingly. "'As for Mr. Beauclerk, I don't know why you should imagine I see anything in him.' "'Well, I confess I can't quite understand it myself. "'He couldn't hold a candle to, er, uh, well, several other fellows I could name, "'myself not included, Miss Kavanagh, so that supercilious smile is thrown away. "'He may be good to look at. "'There is certainly plenty of him on which to feast the eye. "'But to fall in love with—' 
"'What do you mean, Dicky? What are you speaking about? Do you know? You, with a deadly desire to insult him, must be in love yourself, too, to maunder as you are doing.' "'I'm not,' says Mr. Brown. "'That's the queer part of it. I don't know what's the matter with me. Ever since you blighted me, I have lain fallow, as it were. I, dejectedly, haven't been in love for quite a long, long time now. I miss it. I can't explain it. I can't be well, can I? I, anxiously, I don't look well, do I? I never saw you looking better. With unkind force. Ah, sadly, that's because you don't give your attention to me. It's my opinion that I'm fading away to the land of the leal, like old what you may call him. If that's the way he did it, it must have taken him some time. In fact, he must be still at it, says Miss Cavanaugh heartlessly. By this time they had come to the end of the walk, and have turned the corner. Before them lies a small grass plot surrounded by evergreens, a cozy nook not to be suspected by anyone until quite close upon it. It bursts upon the casual pedestrian, indeed, as a charming surprise. There is something warm, friendly, confidential about it, something safe. Beyond lies the gloomy wood, embedded in night, but here the moonbeams play. Someone with a thoughtful care for loving souls has placed in this excellent spot for flirtation a comfortable garden seat, just barely large enough for two, sternly indicative of being far too small for the leanest three. Upon this delightful seat four eyes now concentrate themselves. As if by one consent, although unconsciously, Mr. Brown and his companion come to a dead stop. The unoffending seat holds them in thrall. Upon it, evidently on the best of terms with each other, are two people. One is Miss Maliphant, the other Mr. Beauclerk. They are whispering soft and low. Miss Maliphant is looking, perhaps a little confused, for her, and the cause of the small confusion is transparent. Beauclerk's hand is tightly closed over hers, and even as Dicky and Miss Cavanaugh gaze spellbound at them, he lifts the massive hand of the heiress and imprints a lingering kiss upon it. "'Come away,' says Dicky, touching Joyce's arm. "'Run for your life, but softly.' He and she have been standing in shadow, protected from the view of the other two by a crimson rhododendron. Joyce starts as he touches her, as one might who is roused from an ugly dream, and then follows him swiftly but lightly back to the path they had forsaken. She is trembling in a nervous fashion that angers herself cruelly, and something of her suppressed emotion becomes known to Mr. Brown. Perhaps, being a friend of hers, it angers him, too. "'What strange freaks moonbeams play,' says he, with a truly delightful air of saying nothing in particular. "'I could have sworn that just then I saw Beauclerk kissing Miss Maliphant's hand.' "'No answer. "'There is a little silence, fraught with what angry grief who can tell. "'Dicky, who is not all froth, and is capable of a liking here and there, "'is conscious of, and is sorry for, the nervous tremor that shakes the small hand he has drawn within his arm. But he is so far a philosopher that he tells himself it is but a little thing in her life. She can bear it. She will recover from it. And in time forget that she had been ever ill, says this good-natured skeptic to himself. Joyce, who has evidently been struggling with herself and has now conquered her first feeling, turns to him. "'You should not condemn the moonbeams unheard,' says she bravely, with the ghost of a little smile. "'The evidence of two impartial witnesses should count in their favor. "'But, my dear girl, consider,' says Mr. Brown mildly, "'if it had been anyone else's hand. "'I could then accuse the moonbeams of a secondary offense "'and say that their influence alone, which we all know has a maddening effect, "'had driven him to so bold a deed.' "'but not madness itself could inspire me with a longing to kiss her hand. "'She is a very good girl, and I like her,' says Joyce, with a suspicious vehemence. "'So do I, so much, indeed, that I should shrink from calling her a good girl. "'It is very damnatory, you know. "'You could hardly say anything more prejudicial. "'It at once precludes the idea of her having any such minor virtues as grace, beauty, 
wit, etc. Well, granted she is a good girl, that doesn't give her pretty hands, does it? As a rule, I think that all good girls have gigantic points. I don't think I would care to kiss Miss Maliphant's hands, even if she would let me. She is a very honest, kind-hearted girl, says Miss Cavanaugh, a little heavily. It suggests itself to Mr. Brown that she has not been listening to him. And a very rich one. I never think about that when I am with her. I couldn't. Beauclerk could, says Mr. Brown tersely. There is another rather long silence, and Dicky is beginning to think he has gone a trifle too far, and that Miss Cavanaugh will cut him to-morrow, when she speaks again. Her tone is composed, but icy enough to freeze him. "'It is a mistake,' says she, "'to discuss people towards whom one feels a natural antagonism. It leads one, perhaps, to say more than one actually means. One is apt to grow unjust.' I would never discuss Mr. Beauclerk if I were you. You don't like him. Well, says Mr. Brown thoughtfully, since you put it to me, I confess I think he is the most rubbishy person I ever met. After this sweeping opinion, conversation comes to a deadlock. It is not resumed. Reaching the stone steps leading to the conservatory, they ascend them in silence and reach that perfumed retreat to find Dysart on the threshold. Oh, there you are! cries he to Miss Cavanaugh. I thought you lost for good and all. His face has lighted up. Perhaps he feels a sense of relief at finding her with Dicky, who is warranted harmless. He looks almost handsome, better than handsome. The very soul of honesty shines in his kind eyes. Oh, it is hard to lose what nobody wants, says Joyce, in a would-be playful tone. But something in the drawn, pain lines about her mouth belies her mirth. Dysart, after a swift examination of her face, takes her hand and draws it within his arm. "'The last was our dance,' says he. "'Speak kindly of the dead,' says Mr. Brown, as he beats a hasty retreat. End of chapter 14 Recording by Jenny McCann Chapter Number Fifteen of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford. Chapter Fifteen. Hey ho, sing hey ho, unto the green holly. Most friendship is feigning, most loving is folly. Did you forget, asked Dysart, looking at her? Forget? That the last dance was mine. Oh, was it? I'm so sorry. You must forgive me, with a feverish attempt at gaiety. I will try to make amends. You shall have this one instead, no matter to whom it may belong. Come, it is only just begun, I think. Never mind, says Desart gently. We won't dance this, I think. It is cool and quiet here, and you are tired. Oh, so tired, returns she with a sudden little pathetic cry, so impulsive, so inexpressible, that it goes to his heart. Joyce, what is it? He says quickly. Here, come and sit down. No, I don't want an answer. It was an absurd question. You have overdone it a little. That is all. Yes, that is all. She sinks heavily into the seat he has pointed out to her and lets her head fall back against the cushions. However, when you've come to think of it, that means a great deal, says she, smiling languidly. There, don't talk, says he. What is the good of having a friend if you can't be silent with him when it so pleases you? That, laughing and arranging the cushions behind her head, is one for you and two for myself. I, too, pine for a moment when even... The meager yes and no will not be required of me. 
oh no shaking her head it is all for me and nothing for yourself she pauses and putting out her hand lays it on his sleeve i think felix says she softly you are the kindest man i ever met i told you you felt overdone says he laughing as if to hide the sudden emotion that is gleaming in his eyes he presses the hand resting on his arm very gently and then replaces it in her lap to take advantage of any little kindness she may show him now when it is plain that she is suffering from some mental excitement grief or anger or both would seem base to him she has evidently accepted his offer of silence and lying back in her soft couch stares with unseeing eyes at the bank of flowers before her behind her tall fragrant shrubs rear themselves and somewhere behind her too a tiny fountain is making musical tinklings the faint tender glow of a colored lamp gleams from the branches of a tropical tree close by and round it pale downy moths are flitting the sound of their wings as ever now and then they approach too near the tempting glow and beat them against the japanese shade mingling with the silvery fall of the scented water the atmosphere is warm drowsy a little melancholy it seems to seize upon the two sitting within its seductive influence and threatens to waft them from daydreams into dreams born of idle slumber the rustle of a coming skirt however a low voice a voice still lower whispering a reply recalls them both to the fact that rest complete and perfect is impossible under the circumstances a little opening among the tall evergreens upon their right shows them lord baltimore once more but this time not alone lady swansdown is with him she is looking rather lovelier than usual with that soft tinge of red upon her cheeks born of her last waltz and her lips parted in a happy smile the subdued lights of the many lamps falling on her satin gown rest there as if in love with its beauty it is an old shade made new a yellow that is almost white and has yet a tinge of green in it a curious shade difficult perhaps to wear with good effect but on lady swanston it seems to reign alone as queen of all the toilets in the room to-night she looks indeed like a perfect picture stepped down from its canvas a thing of beauty a very vision of delight she seems indeed to joyce watching her joyce who likes her that she has grown beyond herself or rather into her own real self to-night there is a touch of life of passionate joy of abandonment of hope that has yet a sting in it in all her air that though not understood of the girl is still apparent the radiant smile that illumines her beautiful face as she glances up at baltimore who is bending over her in more lover-like fashion than should be is still making all her face a lovely fire as she passes out of sight down the steps that lead to the lighted gardens the steps that joyce had but just now ascended the latter is still a little wrapped in wonder and admiration and some other thought that is akin to trouble when dysart breaks in upon her fancies i'm sorry about that says he bluntly indicating with a nod of his head the departing shadows of the two who have just passed out there are no fancies about dysart nothing vague yes it is a pity says joyce hurriedly more than that i think something ought to be done nervously yes flushing hotly i know i know what you mean she had meant nothing 
but it is so difficult to know what to do, and I am only a cousin. Oh, I wasn't thinking of you. I wasn't really, says she, a good deal shocked. As you say, why should you speak when... There is Beauclerc, says Dysart quickly, as if a little angry with somebody, but not certainly with her. How can he stand by and see it? Perhaps he doesn't see it, says she in a strange tone, her eyes on the marble flooring. It seems to herself that the words are forced from her, because, because he has... She brings her hands tightly together, so tightly that she reduces the feathers on the fan she is holding to their last cast. Because she is now disappointed in him, because he has proved himself, perhaps unstable, deceptive to the heart's core, is she to vilify him? A thousand times no. That would be, indeed, to be base herself. Perhaps not, says Dysart dryly. In his secret heart, this defense of his rival too detestable to him. Something in her whole manner when she came in from the garden had suggested to him the possibility that she had at last found him out. Dysart would have been puzzled to explain how Beauclerc was supposed to be found out, or for what but that he was liable to discovery at any moment on some count or counts unknown was one of his christian beliefs perhaps not says he and yet i cannot help thinking that a matter so open to all must be patent to him but anxiously is it so open i leave that to your own judgment a little warmly you with rather sharp question are a friend of isabel's yes yes quickly you know that but but sternly i like lady swansdown too says she with some determination i find it hard to believe that she can can be false to her friend supplements he have you yet to learn that friendship ends where love begins you think that she is in love with baltimore and he oh contemptuously who shall gauge the depth of his heart what can he mean he has risen and is now pacing angrily up and down the small space before her he used to be such a good fellow and now is he dead to all sense of honor of honesty he is a man says joyce coldly no i deny that not a true man surely is there a true man says she is there any truth any honesty to be found in the whole wide world she too has risen now and is standing with her large dark eyes fixed almost defiantly on his there is something so strange so wild so unlike her usual joyous happy self in this outburst in her whole attitude the dysart regards her with an astonishment that is largely tinctured with fear i don't know what is in your mind says he calmly something out of the common has occurred to disturb you so much i can guess but looking at her earnestly whatever may be i entreat you to beat it under conquer it do not let it conquer you there must be evil in the world but never lose sight of the good that must be there just as surely truth honor honesty are no fables they are to be found everywhere if not in this one then in that do not lose faith in them you think me evidently in a bad way, says she, smiling faintly. She has recovered herself in part, but though she tries to turn his earnest words into a jest, one can see that she is perilously near to tears. You mean that I am preaching to you, says he, smiling too? Well, so I am. 
what right has a girl like you to disbelieve in anything why laughing it can't be so very long ago since you believed in fairies in pixies and the fierce dragons of our childhood i don't know that i am not a believer in them still says she in the dragons at all events evil seems to rule the world tut says he i have preached in vain you would have me believe in good only says she you assure me very positively that all the best virtues are still riding to and fro redeeming the world with lances couched and hearts on fire but where to find them in you it is a very gentle smile she gives him as she says this yes so far at least as you are concerned says he stoutly i shall be true and honest to you so long as my breath lives in my body so much i can swear to well says she with a rather meagre attempt at light-heartedness you almost persuade me with that truculent manner of yours into believing in you at all events or is it a little sadly that the ways of others drive me to that belief well with a sigh never mind how it is you benefit by it anyway i don't want to force your confidence says dysart but you have been made unhappy by somebody have you not i have not been made happy says she her eyes on the ground i don't know why i tell you that you asked a hard question i know i should have been silent perhaps and yet at this moment the sound of approaching footsteps coming up the steps startles him joyce says he grant me one request one you rise to tragedy says she as if a little amused in spite of the depression under which she is so evidently laboring is it to be your last your dying prayer i hope not nevertheless i would have it granted you have only to speak says she with a slight gesture that is half mocking half kindly come with me after luncheon to-morrow up to st bridget's hill is that all and to throw such force into it yes yes i shall enjoy a long walk like that it is not because of the walk that i ask you to go there with me says dysart the innate honesty that distinguishes him compelling him to lay bare to her his secret meaning i have something to say to you you will listen why should i not returns she a little pale he might perhaps have said something further but that now the footsteps sound close at hand a glance towards the door that leads from the fragrant night into the still more perfumed air within reveals to them two figures mr beauclerk and miss maliphant come leisurely forward the blood receding to joyce's heart leaves her cold and singularly calm end of chapter fifteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter sixteen of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c april's lady by margaret wolf hungerford chapter sixteen out of the day and night a joy has taken flight life i know not what thou art you too cries miss maliphant pleasantly in her loud good-natured voice she addresses them as though it has been borne in upon her
by constant reminding that Joyce and Dysart are, for the best of all reasons, generally to be found together. There is something not only genial, but sympathetic in her tones, something that embarrasses Dysart and angers Joyce to the last degree. Well, I'm glad to have met you for one moment out of the early burly, goes on the massive heiress to Joyce, with the friendliest of smiles. I'm off at cockcrow, you know, and so mightn't have had the opportunity of saying good-bye to you, but for this fortunate meeting. Tomorrow, says Joyce, more with the matter of one who feels she must say something than from any desire to say it. Yes, and so early that I shall not have in my power to bid farewell to any one, unless, indeed, with a glance at Beauclerk meant, perhaps, to be coquettish, but so elephantine in its proportions as to be almost anything in the world but that some of my friends may wish to see the sun rise. We shall miss you, says Joyce gracefully, though with an effort. Just what I've been saying, breaks in Beauclerk at this juncture, who hitherto has been looking on with an altogether delightful smile upon his handsome face. We shall all miss Miss Maliphant. It is not often that one meets with an entirely genial companion. My sister is to be congratulated on securing such an acquisition, if only for a short time. Joyce, lifting her eyes, stares straight at him. For a short time? What does that mean? If Miss Maliphant is to be Lady Baltimore's sister-in-law, she will undoubtedly secure her for a lifetime. Oh, you are too good, said Miss Maliphant, giving him a playful flick with her fan. Well, what would you have me say? persists Beauclerk still lightly, with wonderful lightness. In fact, considering the weight of that playful tap upon his bent knuckles, that we shall not be sorry? Would you have me lie, then? Fee, fee, Miss Maliphant. The truth, the truth, and nothing but the truth. At all risks and hazards. Here he almost imperceptibly sends flying a shaft from his eyes at Joyce who receives it with a blank stare. We shall, I assure you, be desolated when you go, especially Isabel. This last pretty little speech strikes Dysart as being specially neat, this putting the onus of the regret on Isabel's shoulders. All through Beauclerk has been careful to express himself as one who is an appreciative friend of Miss Maliphant but nothing more. Yet so guarded are these expressions and the looks that accompany them that Miss Maliphant might be pardoned if she should read a warmer feeling in them. A sensation of disgust darkens his brow. I must say you are all very nice to me, says the heiress complacently. Poor soul, no doubt, she believes in every bit of it, and a large course of cow-towing from the world has taught her the value of her pile. However, with true Manchester grace, there is no need for howling over it. We'll all meet again, I dare say, some time or another. For one thing, Lady Baltimore has asked me to come here again after Christmas. February, I dare say. So glad, murmurs Joyce rather vaguely. So you see, says Miss Maliphant with ponderous gaiety, that we are all bound to put in a second good time together. You're coming, I know, Mr. Dysart, and Miss Kavanagh is always here, and Mr. Beauclerk. 
with a languishing glance at the charming person who returns it in the most open manner, has promised me that he will be here to meet me. Well, if I can, you know, says he, now beaming at her. How's that? says the heiress, turning promptly upon him. It is strange how undesirable the very rich heiress can be at times. Why, it's only just this instant that you told me nothing would keep you away from court next spring. What do you mean? She brings him to book in a most uncompromising fashion, a fashion that betrays unmistakably her plebeian origin. Dysart, listening, admires her for it. Her rough and ready honesty seems to him preferable to the best bred shuffling in the world. Did I say all that? says Beauclerk lightly, coloring a little. Nevertheless, as he marks the fine smile that is curling Joyce's lips, why then, gaily, if I said it, I mean it. If I hesitated about endorsing my intentions publicly, it is because one is never sure of happiness beforehand. Believe me, Miss Maliphant, with a little bow to her, but with a direct glance at Joyce, every desire I have is centered in the hope the next spring may see me here again. Well, I expect we have the same wish, says Miss Maliphant cheerfully who has not caught that swift glance at Joyce. I am sure I hope that nothing will interfere with my coming here in February. It is agreed, then, says Beauclerk, with a delightfully comprehensive smile that seems to take in every one, even the plants and the dripping fountain and the little marble god in the corner, who is evidently listening with all his might. We all meet here again early next year, if the fates be propitious. You, Dysart, you pledge yourself to join our circle, then. I pledge myself, says Dysart, fixing a cold gaze on him. It is so cold, so distinctively hostile, that Beauclerk grows uncomfortable beneath it. When uncomfortable, his natural bias leads him towards a display of bonhomie. Here we have before us a prospect to cheer the soul of any man, declares he, shifting his eyes from Dysart to Miss Maliphant. It cheers me certainly, responds the heavy maiden with alcrusty. I like to think we shall all meet again. Like the witches in Macbeth, says Joyce indifferently. But not so malignantly, I hope, says the heiress brilliantly, who, like most worthy people, can never see beyond her own nose. For my part, I like old friends much better than new. She looks round for the appreciation that should attend this sound remark, and is gratified to find Dysart is smiling at her. Perhaps the core of that smile might not have been altogether to her taste. Most cores are difficult of digestion. To her, to whom all things are new, where does the flavor of the old come in? Beauclerk is looking at Joyce. I hope the prospect cheers you too, says he a little sharply as if nettled by her determined silence and bent on making her declare herself. You, I trust, will be here next February. Sure to be, says she with an enigmatic smile. Not a jot or title of your enjoyments will be lost to you in the coming year. Both your friends, Miss Maliphant and I, will be here to welcome you when you return. Something in her manner, in the half-defiant light in her eyes, puzzles Beauclerk. What has happened to her since they were last together? Not more than an hour ago, she seemed, er, well, 
Inwardly, he smiles complacently. But now, could she? Is it possible? Was there a chance that... Miss Kavanagh, begins he, moving towards her. But she makes short work of his advance. I repent, says she, turning a lovely smiling face on Dysart. A while ago I said I was too tired to dance. I did myself injustice. That waltz. Listen to it. Lifting up an eager finger, would it not wake an anchorite from his aesthetic dreams? Come, there is time. She is sprung to her feet. Life is in every movement. She slips her arm into Dysart's. Not understanding, yet half understanding, moves with her, his heart on fire for her, his puzzlement rendering him miserable. Beauclerk, with that doubt of what she really knows full upon him, is wiser. Without hesitation he offers his arm to Miss Maliphant, and, so swift is his desire to quit the scene, he passes Dysart and Joyce, the latter having paused for a moment to recover her fan. You see, says Beauclerk, bending over the iris, when a turn in the conservatory has hidden him from the view of those behind, I told you. He says nothing more. It is the veriest whisper, spoken with an assumption of merriment, very well achieved. Yet, if she would have looked at him, she could have seen that his very lips are white. But as I have said, Miss Maliphant's mind has not been trained to the higher courses. Yes, one can see, laughs she happily, and it is charming, isn't it, to find two people thoroughly in love with each other now a days is to believe in that mad old world of romance of which we read. They're very nice, too, both of them. I do like Joyce. She's one in a thousand, and Mr. Dysart is just suited to her. They are both thorough. There's no nonsense about them. Now that you have pointed it out to me, I think I never saw two people so much in love with each other as they. Providentially, she is looking away from him to where a quadrille is forming in the ballroom, so that the deadly look of hatred that adorns his handsome face is unknown to her. Meantime, Joyce, with the convenient fan recovered, is looking with sad eyes at Dysart. Come, the music will soon cease, says she. Why do you speak to me like that? cries he vehemently. If you don't want to dance, why not say so to me? Why not trust me? Good heavens! If I were your bitterest enemy, you could not treat me more distantly, and yet I would die to make you happy. Don't, says she in a little choking sort of way, turning her face from him. She struggles with herself for a moment, and then, still with her face averted, says meekly, Thank you, then, if you don't mind, I should rather not dance any more tonight. Why didn't you say that at first, says he, with a last remnant of reproach? No. There shall be no more dancing to-night for either you or me. A word, Joyce, turning eagerly toward her. You won't forget your promise about that walk to-morrow? No, no, indeed. Thank you. They are sitting very close together, and almost insensibly his hand seeks and finds hers. It was lying idle on her lap and lifting it, he would have raised it to his lips, but with a sharp, violent action she wrests it from him, and, as a child might, hides it behind her. 
if you would have me believe in you no no not that says she a little incoherently her voice rendering her meaning with difficulty dysart astonish stands back from her waiting for something more but nothing comes except two large tears that steal heavily painfully down her cheeks she brushes them impatiently away forgive me she says somewhat brokenly to you who are so good to me i am unkind while to those who are unkind to me i she is trying to rally it was a mere whim believe me i have always hated demonstrations of any sort and why should you want to kiss my hand i shouldn't says he if his eyes have fallen from her eyes to her lips never mind says she i didn't understand perhaps but why can't you be content with things as they are are you content with them i think so i have been examining myself and honestly i think so says she a little feverishly well i am not returns he with decision you must give me credit for a great private store of amiability if you imagine that i am satisfied to take things as they now exist between you and me you have your faults you see as well as another says she with a frown you are persistent and the worst of it is that you are generally right she frowns again but even while frowning glances sideways from under her long lashes with an expression hardly uncivil that is the worst crime in the calendar be wrong sometimes and you love me it will gain you a world of friends if it could gain me your love in return i might risk it says he boldly but that is hopeless i'm afraid shaking his head i am too often in the wrong not to know that neither my many frailties nor my few virtues can ever purchase for me the only good thing on which my soul is set i have told you of one fault now hear another says she capriciously you are too earnest what turning upon him passionately as if a little ashamed of her treatment of him is the use of being earnest who cares who looks on who gives one moment to the guessing of the meaning that lies beneath to be in earnest in this life is merely to be mad pretend laugh jest do anything but be what you really are and you will probably get through the world in a manner if not satisfactory to yourself at all events to les autres you preach a crusade against yourself says he gently you preach against your own conscience you are the least deceptive person i know were you to follow in the track you lay out for others the cruelty of it would kill you to your own self be true and yes yes i know it all says she interrupting him with some irritation i wish you knew how how unpleasant you can be as i tell you you are always right that last dance it is true i didn't want to have anything to do with it but for all that i didn't wish to be told so i merely suggested it as a means of getting rid of miss maliphant says dysart who is feeling a little sore the disingenuousness of this remark is patent to her no mr beauclerk corrects she coldly 
forgive me, says Dysart quickly. I shouldn't have said that. Well, drawing a long breath, we have got rid of them, and may I give you a word of advice? It is disinterested because it is to my own disadvantage. Go to your room, to your bed. You are tired, exhausted. Why wait to be more so? Say you will do as I suggest. You want to get rid of me, says she with a little weary smile. That is unworthy of an answer, gravely. But if a yes to it will help you follow my advice, why, I will say, come, rising, let me take you to the hall. You shall have your way, says she, rising too and following him. A side door leading to the ante-room on their left, and thus skirting the ballroom without entering it, brings them to the foot of the central staircase. Good night, says Dysart in a low tone, retaining her hand for a moment. All round them is a crowd separated into twos and threes, so that it is impossible to say more than the mere commonplace. Good night, returns she in a soft tone. She has turned away from him, but something in the intense longing and melancholy of his eyes compels her to look back again. Oh, you have been kind. I am not ungrateful, says she with sharp contrition. Joyce, Joyce, let me be the grateful one, returns he. His voice is a mere whisper, but so fraught is it with passionate appeal that it rings in her brain for long hours afterward. Her eyes fall beneath his. She moves silently away. What can she say to him? It is with a sense of almost violent relief that she closes the door of her own room behind her and knows herself to be at last alone. End of chapter 16 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 17 of April's Lady by Margaret W. Hungerford this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ruhi Huck. April's Lady by Martha W. Hungerford. Chapter 17. And vain desires and hopes dismayed and fears that cast the earth in shade, my heart did fret night is waning dear paer father of day is making rabbit strides across the heavens creating havoc as he goes diana faints the stars grow pale flinging as they die a last soft glimmer across the sky now and again a first call from the birds startles the drowsy air the wood doves coo melancholy sweet the cheep cheep of the robin the hoarse cry of the sturdy crow a faint dawn breaks on yonder sedge and broadens in that bed of weeds a bright disk shows its radiant edge all things bespeak the coming morn yet still it lingers as lady swanston at baltimore descend the stone steps that lead to the gardens beneath only the swift rush of the tremulous breeze that stirs the branches betrays to them the fact that a new life is at hand you are cold says baltimore noticing the quick shiver that runs through her no not cold it was mere nervousness i shouldn't have thought you nervous or fanciful adds she you judged me rightly and yet coming all at once from the garish lights within into this cool darkness here makes one feel in spite of oneself in spite would you never willingly feel would you demands she very slowly not willingly i confess but i have been made to feel as you know and you would you have a woman confess says she half playfully that is taking an unfair advantage is it not see pointing to a seat what a charming resting place i will make one confession to you i am tired 
a meagre one beatrice he says suddenly tell me this are all women alike do none really feel is it all fancy the mere idle emotion of a moment the evanescent desire for sensation of one sort or another of anger love grief pain that stirs you now and then are none of these things lasting with you are they the mere strings on which you play from time to time because the hours lie heavy on your hands it seems to me it seems to me that you hardly know what you are saying says lady swanston quickly do you think then that women do not feel do not suffer as men never do what wild thoughts torment your brain that you should put forward so senseless a question one that has been answered satisfactorily thousands of years ago all the pain the suffering of earth lies on the woman's shoulders it has been so from the beginning it shall be so to the end on being thrust forth from their eden which suffered most do you suppose adam or eve it is an old story says he gloomily and why should you of all people back it up you who better leave me out of the question you i am outside your life baltimore says she laying her hand on the back of the seat beside her and sinking into it leave me there would you believe me of all things says he even my friends i thought i believed that you at least understood me too well says she in a low tone her hands have met each other and are now clasped together in her lap in a grip that is almost hurtful great heavens if he only knew could he then probe and wound and tempt if you do begins he then stops short and passing her paces to and fro before her in the dying light of the moon lady swanston leans back gazes at him with eyes too sad for tears yes wild with all regret oh if they too might but have met earlier if this man this man in all the world had been given to her as her allotment beatrice says he stopping short before her were you ever in love there is a dead silence lady swanston sinking still deeper into the arm of the chair looks up at him with strange curious eyes what does he mean to her to put such a question to her of all women is he deaf blind mad or only cruel a sort of recklessness seizes upon her well if he doesn't know he shall know though it be to the loss of her self-respect for ever never says she leaning a little forward until the moonbeams gleam upon her snowy neck and arms never never until the pause is premeditated it is eloquence itself the light of heaven playing on her beautiful face betrays the passion of it the rich pallor one hand resting on the back of the seat taps upon the iron work the other is now in baltimore's possession until now suggests he boldly he is leaning over her she shakes her head but in this negative there is only affirmation his hand tightens more closely upon her the long slender fingers yield to his pressure nay more return it they twine round his if i thought begins he in a low stammering tone he moves nearer to her nearer still does she move toward him there is a second's hesitation on his part and then his lips meet hers it is but a momentary touch a thing of an instant but it includes a whole world of meaning lady swanston has sprung to her feet and is looking at him with eyes that seem to burn through the mystic darkness she is trembling in every limb her nostrils are dilated her haughty mouth is quivering and there are there honest real tears in those mocking eyes baltimore too has risen his face is very white full of contrition that he regrets his action towards her is unmistakable but that there is a deeper contrition behind a sense of self-loathing not to be appeased betrays itself in the anguish of his eyes she had accused him of falsity most falsely up to this but now now his mind has wandered far away there is something so wild in his expression that lady swanston loses sight of herself in the contemplation of it what is it baltimore asks she in a low frightened tone it rouses him i have offended you beyond pardon begins he but more like one seeking for words to say than one afraid of using them i have angered you do not mistake me interrupts she quickly almost fiercely i am not angry i feel no anger nothing but that i am a traitor and what am i work out your own condemnation for yourself says she 
still with that feverish self-disdain upon her don't ask me to help you she was my friend whatever she is now she trusted me believed in me and after all and you turning passionately you are doubtly a traitor you are a husband in name doggedly he has quite recovered himself now whatever torture his secret soul may impress upon him in the future no one but he shall know it doesn't matter you belong to her and she to you that is what she doesn't think bitterly there is one more thing to be said baltimore says she after a slight pause this must never occur again i like you you know that i she breaks off abruptly and suddenly gives way to a sort of mirthless laughter it is a farce she says consider my feeling anything and so virtuous a thing too as remorse well as one lives one learns if i had seen the light for the first time in the middle of the dark ages i should probably have ended my days as the prioress of a convent as it is i shouldn't wonder if i went in for hospital nursing presently sure angrily it is useless lamenting let me face the truth i have acted abominably toward her so far and the worst of it is with a candour that seems to scorch her i know if the chance be given me i shall behave abominably toward her again i shall leave to-morrow the day after one must invent a decent excuse pray don't leave on lady baltimore's account says he slowly she would be the last to care about this i'm nothing to her is your wish father to that thought regarding him keenly no i assure you the failing i mention is plain to all the world i should have thought it is not plain to me still watching him then learn it says he if ever she loved me which i now disbelieve i would that i had let the doubt creep in earlier it was in a past that now is irretrievably dead i suppose i wearied her i confess with a meagre smile i once loved her with all my heart and soul and strength or else she is incapable of knowing an honest affection that is not true says lady swansdon some generous impulse forcing the words unbelievingly through her white lips she can love you must see that for yourself the child is proof of it some women are like that says he gloomily they can open wide their hearts to their children yet close it against the fathers of them isabel's whole life is given up to her child she regards it as hers entirely she allows me no share in him not eagerly that i grudge him one inch the affection she gives him he has a father worthless enough let his mother make it up to him yet he loves the father best says lady swansdon quickly i hope not with a suspicion of violence he does believe me one can see it that saintly mother of his has not half the attraction for him that you have why look you it is the way of the world why dispute it well well her triumphant voice deepening to a weary whisper when one thinks of it all she is not too happy she draws her hand in a little bewildered way across her white brow you don't understand her says baltimore frigidly she lives in a world of her own no one would dare penetrate it even i her husband as you call me in mockery am outside it i don't believe she ever cared for me if she had do you think she would have given a thought to that infamous story about madame stray yes you too heard it then who hasn't heard violet walden was not the one to spare you she pauses and looks at him with all her heart in her eyes there was no truth in that story asked she at last her words coming with a little rush none i swear it you believe me he has come nearer to her and taken her hand in the extremity of this desire to be believed in by somebody i believe you says she gently her voice is so low that he can catch the words only the grief and misery in them is unknown to him mercifully too the moon has gone behind a cloud a tender preparation for an abdication presently so that he cannot see the two heart-broken tears that steal slowly down her cheeks that is more than isabel does says he with a laugh that has something of despair in it you tell me then says lady swansdon that you never saw ma'am astray after your marriage never willingly oh willingly don't misjudge me hear the whole story then if you must cries he passionately though if you do you will be the first to hear it i am tired of being thought a liar go on says she in a low shocked tone her singular vehemence has compelled her to understand how severe have been his sufferings if ever she had doubted the truth of the old story that has wrecked the happiness of his married life she doubts no longer i tell you you will be the first to hear it says he advancing towards her 
sit down there pressing her into the garden seat i can see you're looking overdone even by this light well drawing a long breath and stepping back from her i never opened my lips upon this subject except once before and to isabel and she he pauses she would not listen she believed then all things base of me she has so believed ever since she must be a fool says lady swanston impetuously she could not she did however she coldly ever believed that i could lie to her his face had become ashen his eyes fixed upon the ground seemed to grow there with the intensity of his regard his breath seems to come with difficulty through his lips well says he at last with a long sigh it's all over the one merciful thing belonging to our life is that there must come sooner or later an end to everything the worst grief has its termination she has been unjust to me but you he lifts his haggard face you perhaps will grant me a kindlier hearing tell it all to me if it will make you happier says she very gently her heart is bleeding for him oh if she might only comfort him in some way if if that other fails him why should not she with the passion of love that lies in her bosom restore him to the warmth the sweetness of life that kiss half developed as it only was already begins to bear the fatal fruit unconsciously she permits herself a license in her thoughts of baltimore hitherto strenuously suppressed there is absolutely little to tell at that time we lived most entirely at our place in hampshire and as there were business matters connected with the outlying farms found there that had been grossly neglected during my grandfather's time i was compelled to run up to town almost daily as a rule i returned by the evening train in time for dinner but once or twice i was so far delayed that it was out of my power to do it i laugh at myself now he looks very far from laughter as he says it but i assure you the occasions on which i was compulsorily kept away from my home were he pauses oh well there is no use in being more tragic than one need be they were at least a trouble to me naturally says she coldly i loved her you see says baltimore in a strange jerky sort of way as if ashamed of that old sentiment she i quite understand i have heard all about it once or twice says lady swanston with a kind of slow haste if such a contradiction may be allowed that he has forgotten her is evident that she has forgotten nothing is more evident still well one day one of the many days during which i went up to town after a long afternoon with goodman and snail in the course of which they had told me they would probably require me to call at their office to meet one of the most influential tenants at nine the next morning i met on leaving their office marchman marchment of the tenth you know yes i know he and a couple of other fellows belonging to his regiment were going down to richmond to dine would i come it was dull in town toward the close of the season and i was glad of any invitation that promised a change of programme anything that would take me away from a dull evening at my club i made no inquiries i accepted the invitation got down in time for dinner and found ma'am the stray was one of the guests i he hesitates go on you are a woman of the world beatrice you will let me confess to you that there have been old passages between me and ma'am stray well i swear to you i had never so much as thought of her since my marriage nay since my engagement to isabel from that hour my life had been clear as a sheet of blank paper i had forgotten her i verily believe she had forgotten me too at that dinner i don't think she exchanged a dozen words with me on my soul pushing back his hair with a slow troubled gesture from his brow this is the truth and yet and yet interrupting her with now a touch of vehement excitement a garbled a most cursedly false account of that dinner was given her it came round to her ears she listened to it believed in it condemned without a hearing she who has sworn not only at the altar but to me alone that she loved me she wronged you terribly says lady swanston in a low tone thank you cried he a passion of gratitude in his tone to be believed in by some one so thoroughly as you believed in me is to know happiness indeed whatever happens i can count on you as my friend your friend always says she in a very low voice a voice somewhat broken come she says rising suddenly and walking toward the distant lights of the house he accompanies her silently very suddenly she turns to him and lays her hand upon his arm 
be my friend says she with a quick access of terrible emotion entreaty and despair mingle in her tone for ever returns he fervently tightening his grasp on her hand well sighing it hardly matters we shall not meet again for a long long time how is that isabel the last time she condescended to speak to me of her own accord with an unpleasant laugh told me that she had asked you to come here again next february and that you had accepted the invitation she indeed made quite a point of it ah that was a long time ago weeks do not make a long time some weeks hold more than years yes you are right she made quite a point about my coming well she's always very civil she has always perfect manners she is as you say very civil she is proud coldly you will come i think not by that time you will in all probability have made it up with her the very essence of improbability while i shall not have made it up with my husband one seems quite as possible as the other no no isabel is a good woman you would do well to go back to her swanston is as bad a man as i know and that with a mirthless laugh is saying a great deal i should gain nothing by a reconciliation with him for one thing an important matter i have a great deal more money than he has and for another there are no children her voice changes here an indescribable alteration not only hardens but desolates it i have been fortunate there she says if in nothing else in my unsatisfactory life there is no smallest bond between me and swanston if i could be seriously glad of anything it would be that of that i have nothing belonging to him his name oh as for that does it belong to him has he not forfeited a decent right to it a thousand times no there is nothing if there had been a child he would have made a persecution of it and i am so better off as it is and yet there are moments when i envy you that little child of yours however yet if swanston were to make an overture do not go on it is of all speculations the most useless do not pursue the subject of swanston i entreat you let with bitter meaning sleeping dogs lie baltimore laughs shortly that is severe says he it is how i feel towards him the light in which i regard him if turning a face to his that is hardly recognizable so pale it is with ill-suppressed loathing he were lying on his deathbed and sent for me it would give me pleasure to refuse to go to him she takes her hand from his arm and motions him to ascend the steps leading into the conservatory but you says he surprised let me remain here a little while i am tired my head aches i let me stay with you no smiling faintly what i want is to be alone to feel the silence go do not be uneasy about me believe me you will be kind if you do as i ask you it is a command says he slowly and slowly too he turns away from her seeing him so uncertain about leaving her she steps abruptly into a dark side path and finding a chair sinks into it the soft breaking of the dawn over the tree-tops far away seems to add another pang to the anguish that is consuming her she covers her face with her hands oh if it had all been different two lives sacrificed say three for surety isabel cannot care for him oh if it had been she she herself what is there she could not have forgiven him nay she must have forgiven him because life without him would have been insupportable if only she might have loved him honorably if only she might ever love him successfully dishonorably the thought seems to sting her involuntarily she throws up her head and courts the chill winds of dawn that sweep with a cool touch her burning forehead she had called her proud would she herself then be less proud that isabel dreads her half scorns her of late it is well known to her and yet it is with a very passion of pride who dare her to prove it she isabel had gone even so far as to ask her rival to visit her again in the early part of the coming year to meet her present friends so far that pride had carried her but pride was pride love if she herself loved baltimore would she even for pride's sake entreat the woman he singled out for his attentions to spend another long visit in her country house and if isabel does not honestly love him why then is he not lawful prey for one who can who does not love him one who loves him but he whom does he love torn by some last terrible thought she starts to her feet and as though in 
action has become impossible to her draws her white silken wrap around her and sweeps rapidly out of all view of the waning chinese lamps into the grey obscurity of the coming day that lies in the far gardens end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c april's lady by margaret wolf hungerford chapter eighteen song have thy day and take thy fill of light before the night be fallen across thy way sing while he may man hath no long delight what a delicious day says joyce stopping short on the hill to take a look round her it is the next day and indeed far into it luncheon is a thing of the past and both she and dysart know that it will take them all their time to reach st bridget's hill and be back again for afternoon tea they had started on their expedition in defiance of many bribes held out to them for one thing there was to be a reception at the court at five many of those who had danced through last night having been asked to come over late in the afternoon of to-day to talk over the dance itself and the little etceteras belonging to it the young members of the monkton family had been specially invited too a sort of make-up to bertie the little son of the house who had been somewhat aggrieved at being sent to bed without his share of the festivities on hand he had retired to his little cot indeed with his arms stuffed full of crackers but how could crackers and cakes and sweets console any one for the loss of being out at an ungodly hour and seeing a real live dance the one thing that finally helped him to endure his hard lot was a promise on his mother's part that tommy and mabel monkton should come down next day and revel with him among the glorious ruins of the supper table the little monktons had not come however when joyce left for her walk going out lady swansdown said to her meeting her in the hall fully equipped for her excursion but why my dear girl we expect those amusing burks in an hour or so and the delaneys and yes why go repeats beauclerk who has just come up his manner is friendly in the extreme yet a very careful observer might notice a strain about it a determination to be friendly that rather spoils the effect her manner toward him last night after his interview with miss maliphant in the garden and her growing coldness ever since has somewhat disconcerted him mentally could she have heard or seen or been told of anything there might of course have been a little contempts of some sort people as a rule are so beastly treacherous you will make us wretched if you desert us says he with impressement as he speaks he goes up to her and lets his eyes as well as his lips implore her miss maliphant had left by the early train so that he is quite unattached and able to employ his whole battery of fascinations on the subjugation of this refractory person i am sorry don't be more wretched than you can help says joyce with a smile wonderfully unconcerned after a dance i want to walk to clear my brain and mr dysart has been good enough to say he will accompany me is he accompanying you says beauclerk 
with an unpardonable supercilious glance around him as if in search of the absent dysart you mustn't think him a laggard at his post says miss kavanagh still smiling but now in a little provoking way that seems to just at his pretended suspicion of dysart's constancy and dissolve it into the thinnest of thin air he was here just now but i sent him to lose the dogs i like to have them with me and lady baltimore is pleased when they get a run isabel is always so sympathetic says he with a quite new and delightful rush of sympathy towards isabel i suppose glancing at joyce keenly you would not care for an additional escort the dogs and dysart will be sufficient mr dysart and the dogs will be says she ah here he comes as dysart appears at the open doorway a little pack of terriers at his heels what a time you've been cries she moving quickly to him i thought you would never come good-bye lady swanston good-bye glancing casually at beauclerk keep one teapot for us if you can she trips lightly up the avenue at dysart's side leaving beauclerk in a rather curious frame of mind yes she has heard something that is his first thought how to counteract the probable influence of that something is the second a little dwelling upon causes and effects shows him the way for an effect there is often an antidote delicious indeed says dysart in answer to her remark his answer is however a little distrait his determination of last night to bring her here and compel her to listen to the honest promptings of his heart is still strong within him they have now ascended the hill and standing on its summit can look down on the wild deep sea beneath them that lies to all possible seeming as calm and passive as their feet as might a thing inanimate yet within its depths what terrible what mournful tragedies lie and as if in contrast what ecstatic joys to one it speaks like death itself to another the bridegroom sea is toying with the shore his wedded bride and in the fullness of his marriage joy he decorates her tawny brow with shells retires apace to see how far she looks then proud runs up to kiss her shall we sit here says dysart indicating a soft mound of grass that overlooks the bay you must be tired after last night's dancing i am tired says she sinking upon the soft cushion that nature has provided with a little sigh of satisfaction perhaps i should not have asked have extracted a promise from you to come here says dysart with contrition in his tone i should have remembered you would be overdone and that a long walk like this would be the very thing to restore me to a proper state of health she interrupts him with the prettiest smile no don't pretend you are sorry you brought me here you know it is the sheerest hypocrisy on your part you are glad that you brought me here i hope and i deliberately am glad that you did do you mean that says dysart gravely he had not seated himself beside her and is now looking down her from a goodly height do you know why i brought you to bring me back again as fresh as a daisy suggests she with a laugh that is spoiled in its birth by a glance from him no i did not think of you at all i thought only of myself says dysart speaking a little quickly now call that selfish if you will and yet he stops short 
and comes closer to her. To think in that way was to think of you too. Joyce, there is at all events one thing you do know, that I love you. Miss Cavanaugh nods her head silently. There is one thing too that I know, says Dysart now with a little tremble in his voice, that you do not love me. She is silent. You are honest, says he, after a pause, still, looking at her, if there wasn't hope one would know. Though the present is empty for me, I cannot help dwelling on the thought that the future may contain something. The future is so untranslatable, says she, with a little evasion. Tell me this at least, says Dysart, very earnestly, bending over her with the air of one determined to sift his chances to the last grain. You like me? Oh, yes, better than Courtney, for example, with a fleeing smile that fails to disguise the real anxiety he is enduring. What an absurd question! Then Dicky Brown? Yes. But here she lifts her head and gazes at him in a startled way that speaks of quick suspicion. There is something of entreaty, too, in her dark eyes, a desire that he will go no further. But Dysart deliberately disregards it. Then Beauclerk, asks he in a clear, almost cruel tone. A horrible red rushes up to dye her pretty cheeks, in spite of all her efforts to subdue it. Great tears of shame and confusion suffuse her eyes. One little reproachful glance she casts at him. And then, of course, says she, almost vehemently, as if a little faintly, her eyes sinking to the ground. Dysart stands before her as if stricken in stone. Then the knowledge that he has hurt her pierces him with a terrible certainty, overcomes all other thoughts, and drives him to repentance. I shouldn't have asked you that, says he bluntly. No, no, says she, acquiescing quickly, and yet, raising an eager, loving face to his, I hardly know anything about, about myself. Sometimes I think, I like him. Sometimes, she stops abruptly and looks at him with a pained and frightened gaze. Do you despise me for betraying myself like this? No, I want to hear all about it. Ah, that is what I want to hear myself. But who is to tell me? Nature won't. Sometimes I hate him. Last night... Yes, I know. You hated him last night. I don't wish to know why. I am quite satisfied in that you did so. But shall I hate him tomorrow? Oh, yes, I think so. I hope so, cries she suddenly. I am tired of it all. He is not a real person, not one possible to class. He is false, naturally treacherous, and yet... She breaks off again very abruptly and turns to Dysart as if for help. Let us forgive him, says she, and then in a little frightened way, oh, I wish I could be sure I could forget him. Why can't you, says Dysart, in his downright way? It means only a strong effort after all. If you feel honestly, with an earnest glance at her, like that toward him, you must be mad to give him even a corner in your heart. That is it, says she. There the puzzle begins. I don't know if he ever has a corner in my heart. He attracts me, but attraction is not affection, and the heart holds only love and hatred. Indifference is nothing. You can get rid of him finally says Dysart boldly, by giving yourself to me. That will kill all. All he may be going to say is killed on his lips, 
at this moment by two little wild shrieks of joy that sound right behind his head. Both he and Joyce turn abruptly in its direction, he with a sense of angry astonishment, she with a fell knowledge of its meaning. It is, indeed, no surprise to her when Tommy and Mabel appear suddenly from behind the rock just close to them, that hides the path in part and precipitates themselves into her arms. "'We saw you! We saw you!' gasped Tommy, breathlessly from his run up the hill. "'We saw you far away down there on the road, and we told Bridgie, the maid, that we'd run up, and she said cut along. So here we are.' "'You are indeed,' says Dysart with feeling. "'We knew you'd be glad to see us.' goes on Tommy to Joyce, in the beautiful roar he has always adopted when excited. You haven't been home for years, and Bridgie says that because you are going to be married to— Get up, Tommy. You are too heavy, and besides, I want to kiss Mabel, says Tommy's aunt, with prodigious haste and a hot cheek. But Mommy says you're a silly Billy— says Mabel in her shrill treble, and that Mummy is a shocking rude person, says Mr. Dysart, hurrying to break into the dangerous confidence, no matter at what cost, even at the expense of the adored Mummy. His remark is taken very badly. She is not, says Tommy, glowering at him. Father says she's an angel. And he knows. I heard him say it. And angels are never rude. Twas after he made her cry about something, says Mabel, lifting her little flower-like face to Dysart's in a miniature imitation of her brother's indignation. She was boo-booing like anything. And then father got sorry. Oh, dreadful sorry. And he said she was an angel. And she said, Oh, Mabel, says Joyce, weakly, you know you oughtn't say such. Well, twas your fault. Twas all about you, says Tommy defiantly. Why don't you come home? Father says you ought to come. And Mommy says she doesn't know which of them it will be. And Father says it won't be any of them. And... What's it all about? Turning a frankly inquisitive little face up to hers. They won't tell us, and we want to know which of em it will be. Yes, and it gents, demands Mabel, who probably means giants and not cold meats. I don't know what she means, says Miss Cavanaugh coldly. I say you too says Mr. Dysart brilliantly. Wouldn't you like to run a race? Bridget must be tired of waiting for you down there at the end of the hill. And she isn't waiting. She's talking to Mickey Daly, says Tommy. Oh, I see. Well, look here. I bet you, Tommy, strong as you look, Mabel can outrun you down the hill. She, she cries Tommy indignantly. I could beat her in a minute. You can't, cries Mabel in turn. Nurse says I'm twice the child that you are. Your legs are as short as a pin, roars Tommy. You couldn't run. I can, I can, I can, says Mabel, on the verge of a violent flood of tears. Well, we'll see, says Mr. Dysart who now begins to think he has thrown himself away on a silly Husser regiment, when he ought to have taken rank as a distinguished diplomat. Come, I'll start you both down the hill, and whichever reaches Bridget first wins the day. Instantly both children spring to the front of the path. You're standing before me, Tommy. No, I'm not. You're cheating. You are. Cheat yourself, Mr. Dysart, ain't I all right? I think you should give her a start, 
She's the girl, you know, says Dysart. There now, go. That's very good. Five yards. Tommy is a small allowance for a little thing like Mabel. Steady now, you two. One. Good gracious, they're off, says he, turning to Miss Cavanaugh, with a sigh of relief mingled with amusement. They had no idea of waiting for more than one signal. I hope they will meet this Bridget and get back to their mother. They are not going to her just now. They are going on to the court to spend the afternoon with Bertie, says Joyce. Barbara told me so last night. Dear things, how sweet they looked. They are the prettiest children I know, says Dysart. A little absent, perhaps. He falls into silence for a moment or two, and then suddenly looks at her. He advances a step. End of chapter 18 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 19 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 18 A continual battle goes on in a child's mind between what it knows and what it comprehends. Well, says he, he advances even nearer, and dropping on a stone close to her, takes possession of one of her hands. As you can't make up your mind to him, and, as you say, you like me, say something more. More? Yes, a great deal more. Take the next move. Say boldly that you will marry me. Joyce grows a little pale. She has certainly been prepared for this speech had been preparing herself for it all the long weary wakeful night yet now that she hears it it seems as strange as terrible as though it had never suggested itself to her in its vaguest form why should i say that says she at last stammering a little and feeling somewhat disingenuous she had known Yet now she is trying to pretend that she did not know. Because I ask you. You see, I put the poorest reason at first. And because you say I am not hateful to you. And because. Well. Because when a man's last chance of happiness lies in the balance. He will throw his very soul into the weighing of it. And knowing this. You may have pity on me. As though pressed down by some unsupportable weight, the girl rises and makes a little curious gesture as if to free herself from it. Her face, still pale, betrays an inward struggle. After all, why cannot she give herself to him? Why can't she love him? He loves her. Love, as some poor fool says, begets love and he is honest yes honest a pang shoots through her breast that when all is told is the principal thing he is not uncertain untrustworthy double-faced as some men are again that cruel pain contracts her heart to be able to believe in a person to be able to trust implicitly in each lightest word, to read the real meaning in every sentence, to see the truth shining in the clear eyes. This is to know peace and happiness, and yet, you know all, says she, looking up at him, her eyes compressed, her brow frowning. I am uncertain of myself. Nothing seems sure to me, but if you wish it, wish it clasping her hands closer 
there is this to be said then i will promise to answer you this day twelve month twelve months says he with concertation his grasp on her hands loosens if the prospect frightens or displeases you there is nothing more to be said rejoins she coldly it is she who is calm and composed he is nervous and anxious but a whole year that is nothing says she releasing her hands with a little determined show of strength from his it is for you to decide i don't care perhaps she hardly grasps the cruelty that lies in this half impatient speech until she sees dysart's face flush painfully you need not have said that says he i know it i am nothing to you really he pauses and then says again in a low tone nothing oh you mustn't feel so much cries she as if tortured it is folly to feel at all in this world what's the good of it and to feel about me i am not worth it if you would only bear that in mind it might help you if i bore that in mind i should not want to make you my wife returns he steadily gravely think as you will yourself you do not shake my faith in you well with a deep breath i accept your terms for a year i shall feel myself bound to you though that is a farce for i shall always be bound to you soul and body while you shall hold yourself free and try to no no we must both be equal both free while i she stopped short coloring warmly and laughing what is it i am to try to do to love me replies he with infinite sadness in look and tone yes says joyce slowly and then again meditatively yes she lifts her eyes presently and regards him strangely and if all my trying should not succeed if i never learn to love you why then it is all over this hope of mine is at an end says he so calmly yet with such deep melancholy such sad foreboding that her heart is touched oh it is a hope of mine too says she quickly if it were not would i listen to you to-day but you must not be so downhearted let the worst come to the worst you will be as well off as you are at this instant he shakes his head does hope count for nothing then you would compel me to love you says she growing the more vexed as she grows the more sorry for him would you have me marry you even if i did not love you her soft eyes have filled with tears there is a suspicion of reproach in her voice no i suppose not he half turns away from her at this moment a sense of despair falls on him she will never care for him never never this proposed probation is but a mournful farce a sorry clinging to a hope that is built on sand when in the future she marries as so surely she will he will not be her husband why not give in at once why fight with the impossible why not break all links frail as they are sweet and let her go her way and he his while yet there is time to falter is to court destruction then all at once a passionate reaction sets in joyce looking at him sees the light of battle the warmth of love the unconquerable spring into his eyes no he will not cave in he will resist to the last 
dispute every inch of the ground and if finally only defeat is to crown his efforts still and why should defeat be his be it beauclerk or another whoever declares himself his rival shall find him a formidable enemy to overcome joyce says he quickly turning to her and grasping her hands give me my chance give me those twelve months give me your thoughts now and then while they last i brought you here to-day to say all this knowing we should be alone and without tommy says she with a little laugh oh well you must confess i got rid of him says he smiling too and glad in his heart to find her so cheerful i think if you look into it that my stragum the enticing him to the overcoming of his sister in that race was the work of a diplomatist of the first water i f quite felt that a war whoop behind him dissolves his self-gratulations into nothing here comes tommy the valiant triumphant puffed beyond all description with pride and want of breath i beat her i beat her shrieks he with the last note left in his tuneful pipe he staggers the last yard or two and falls into joyce's arms that are open wide to receive him who shall say he is not a happy interlude evidently joyce regards him as such i came back to tell you says tommy recovering himself a little i knew with the fearless confidence of childhood that you'd be longing to know if i beat her and i did she's down there how with bridgie pointing to the valley beneath and she's mad with me because i didn't let her win you ought to go back to her says dysart she'll be madder if you don't she won't she's picking daisies now but bridget will want you no shaking his lovely little head bridgie said ye may go sir and ye needn't be in a hurry back me and mickey dally have a lot to say about me mother's daughter it would be impossible to describe the accuracy with which tommy describes bridget's tone and manner oh i dare say says mr dysart me mother's daughter must be a truly enthralling person i think tommy ought to be educated for the stage says joyce in a little whisper he'll certainly make his mark wherever he goes says dysart laughing tommy after a careful examination of monkton jr's seraphic countenance don't you think you ought to take your sister on to the court so i will says tommy in a minute or two he has climbed into joyce's lap and is now sitting on her with his arms round her neck to make love to a young woman and to induce her to marry you with a barnacle of this sort hanging round her suggests difficulties mr dysart waits all things come to those who wait says a wily old proverb but dysart proves this proverb a swindle now tommy says he the two minutes are up i don't care says tommy i'm tired and bridgie says i needn't hurry the charms of mr mickey dally are no doubt great says dysart mildly yet i think bridget must by this time be aware that she wasn't sent out by your mother to tattle to him but to take you and your sister to play with bertie here tommy decisively get off your aunt's lap and run away but why demands tommy aggressively what harm am i doing you are tiring your aunt for one thing i am not she likes to have me here defiantly i ride a cock-horse every night when she's at home don't i joyce 
I wish you'd go away, wrathfully, because then Joyce would come home and play with us again. Tis you, glaring at him with deep-seated anger in his eyes, who are keeping her here. Oh, no, you are wrong there, says Dysart with a sad smile. I could not keep her anywhere. She would not stay with me. But really, Tommy, you know you ought to go to the court. Poor little Bertie is looking out for you eagerly. See, plunging his hand into his pocket, here is half a crown for you to spend on lollipops. I'll give it to you if you'll go back to Bridget. Tommy's eyes brighten but as quickly the charming blue in them darkens again. There is no tuck shop between this and the court. "'Tisn't any good,' says he mournfully. "'The shop's away down there,' pointing vaguely backward on the journey he has come. "'You look strong in wind and limb. There is no reason to believe that moral sun may not dawn on you,' says Mr. Dysart. And then think, Tommy, think what a joy you will be to old Molly Bryn. Molly gives me four bull's eyes for a penny, says Tommy reflectively. That's two to Mabel and two to me, because Mommy says baby mustn't have any for fear she'd choke. If there's four for a penny, how many is there for this? holding out the half-crown that lies upon his little brown, shapely palm. "'That's a sum,' says Mr. Dysart. "'Tommy, you're a cruel boy,' and having struggled with it for a moment, he says, "'One hundred and twenty. "'No,' says Tommy, in a voice faint with hopeful unbelief. "'Joyce, tisn't true, is it?' "'Quite true,' says Joyce. Just fancy, Tommy, one hundred and twenty bullseyes, all in one day. There is such a genuine support of his desire to get rid of Tommy in her tone that Dysart's heart rises within him. Tie it into my handkerchief, says Tommy, without another second's hesitation. Tie it tight, or it'll slip out and I'll lose it. Goodbye and thank you, Mr. Dysart, thrusting a hot little fist into his. I'll keep some of the hundred and twenty ones for you and Joyce. He rushes away down the hill, eager to tell his grand news to Mabel, and presently Joyce and Dysart are alone again. You see, you were not so clever a diplomatist as you thought yourself, says Joyce. Smiling faintly, Tommy came back. Tommy and I have one desire in common. We both want to be with you. Could you be bought off like Tommy? Says she, half playfully. Oh, no, half a crown would not be good enough. Would all the riches the world contains be good enough? Says he in a voice very low, but full of emotion. You know it would not. But you, Joyce, twelve months is a long time. You may see others, if not Beauclerk. Others and... Money would not tempt me, says the girl slowly. If money were your rival, you would indeed be safe. You ought to know that. Still, Joyce... He stopped suddenly. May I think of you as Joyce... I have called you so once or twice, but you may always call me so, says she gently, if indifferently. All my friends call me so, and you are my friend, surely. The very sweetness of her manner, cold as ice as it is, drives him to desperation. Not your friend, your lover, says he with sudden passion. Joyce, Think of all that I have said, all you have promised, a small matter to you perhaps, the whole world to me. 
You will wait for me for twelve months. You will try to love me. You... Yes, but there is something more to be said, cries the girl, springing to her feet as if in violent protest, and confronting him with a curious look, set, determined, a little frightened, perhaps. End of chapter 19 Recorded by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 20 of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford. Chapter 20. I thought love had been a joyous thing quoth my uncle toby he hath a heart as sound as a bell and his tongue is the clapper for what his heart thinks his tongue speaks more said dysart startled by her expression and puzzled as well yes hurriedly this the very nervousness that is consuming her throws fire into her eyes and speech during all these long twelve months I shall be free, quite free. You forgot to put that in. You must remember that. If, if I should, after all this thinking, decide on not having anything to do with you, you, vehemently, will have no right to reproach me. Remember, says she, going up to him and laying her hand upon his arm, while the blood receding from her face leaves her very white remember should such a thing occur and it is very likely slowly i warn you of that you are not to consider yourself wronged or aggrieved in any way why should you talk to me in this way begins he aggravated now at all events you must recollect feverishly that i have made you no promise not one i refuse even to look upon this matter as a serious thing i tell you honestly her dark eyes gleaming with nervous excitement i don't believe i ever shall so look at it after all pausing you will do well if you now put an end to this farce between us and tell me to take myself and my dull life out of yours forever I shall never tell you that, in a low tone. Well, well, impatiently, I have warned you. It will not be my fault if, oh, it is foolish of you, she blurts out suddenly. I have told you I don't understand myself, and still you waste yourself. You throw yourself away. In the end, you will be disappointed in me, if not in one way, then another. It hurts me to think of that. There is time still. Let us be friends. Friends. Her hands are tightly clasped. She looks at him with a world of entreaty in her beautiful eyes. Friends, Felix, breathes she softly. Let things rest as they are. I beseech you, says he, taking her hand and holding it in a tight grasp. The future. Who can ever say what that great void will bring us? I will trust to it. And if only loss and sorrow be my portion, still, as for friendship, Joyce, whatever happens, I shall be your friend and lover. Well, you quite know, says the girl, almost sullenly. Quite, and I accept the risk. Do not be angry with me, my beloved. He lifts the hand he holds and presses it to his lips, wondering always at the coldness of it. You are free, Joyce. You desire it so, and I desire it too. I would not hamper you in any way. I should not be able to endure it, if, afterward, I thought you were reproaching me, says she, with a little weary smile. Be happy about that, says he. I shall never reproach you. He is silent for a moment. Her last speech has filled him with thoughts 
that presently grow into extremely happy ones unless unless she liked him cared for him in some decided if vague manner would his future misery be of so much importance to her oh surely not a small flood of joy flows over him a radiant smile parts his lips the light of a coming triumph that shall gird and glorify his whole life illuminates his eyes she regarding him grows suddenly uneasy you you fully understand says she drawing back from him oh you have made me do that says he but his radiant smile still lingers then why mistrustfully do you look so happy she draws even further away from him it is plain she resents that happiness is there no reason says he have you not let me speak and having spoken do you not still let me linger near you it is more than i dared hope for therefore poor as is my chance i rejoice now do not forbid me i may have no reason to rejoice in the future let me then have my day it grows very late says miss kavanagh abruptly let us go home silently they turn and descend the hill halfway down he pauses and looks backward whatever comes of it says he i shall always love this spot though if the year's end leave me desolate i hope i shall never see it again it is unlikely to rejoice too soon says she in a low whisper oh don't say that word rejoice how it reminds me of you it ought to belong to you it does you should have been called rejoice instead of joyce they have cut off half of your name to see you is to feel new life within one's veins ah i said you didn't know me returns she sadly meantime the hours have flown evening is descending it is all very well for those who traveling up and down romantic hills can find engrossing matters for conversation in their idle imagings of love or their earnest belief therein but to the ordinary ones of the earth mundane comforts are still of some worth tea the all-powerful is now holding high reverie in the library at the court round the cosy tables growing genial beneath the steam of the many old queen anne pots the guests are sitting singly or in groups what delicious little cakes says lady swansdown taking up a smoking morsel of cooked butter and flour from the glowing tripod beside her you like them says lady baltimore in her slow earnest way so does joyce she thinks they are the nicest cakes in the world by the by where is joyce she went out for a walk at twenty minutes of two says beauclerk he has pulled out his watch and is steadily counting it it is now twenty minutes after five said lady swansdown maliciously who detests beauclerk and who has read his relations with joyce as clear as a book how she must have enjoyed herself yes but where said lady baltimore anxiously joyce has been left in her charge and apart from that she likes the girl well enough to be uneasy about her when occasion arises with whom would be a more appropriate question says dicky brown who as usual is just where he ought not to be oh i know where she is cries a little shrill voice from the background it comes from tommy and from that part of the room where tommy and mabel and little bertie are having a game behind the window curtains blocks dolls kitchens farmyards ninepins all have been given to them as a means of keeping them quiet one thing only has been forgotten the fact that the human voice divine is more attractive to them more replete with delightful mystery fuller of enthralling possibilities 
than all the toys that ever yet were made thomas are you fully alive to the responsibilities to which you pledge yourself demands mr brown severely what says tommy do you pledge yourself to declare where miss kavanagh is now is it joyce says tommy coming forward and standing undaunted in his knickerbockers and an immaculate collar that defies suspicion yes joyce says mr brown who never can hold his tongue well i know tommy pauses and an unearthly silence falls on the assembled company half the county is present and as tommy in the character of reconteur is widely known and deservedly dreaded expectation spreads itself among its audience lady baltimore moves uneasily and for once dicky brown feels as, as if he should like to sink in his boot she's up on the top of the hill with mr dysart says tommy and no more lady baltimore sighs with relief and mr brown feels now as if he should like to give tommy something how do you know says beauclerk as though he finds it impossible to repress the question because i saw her there says tommy when mabel and me was coming here i like mr dysart don't you addressing beauclerk specifically he is a very kind sort of man he gave me half a crown for what tommy asked baltimore idly to whom tommy is an unfailing joy to go away and leave him alone with joyce says tommy with awful distinctness tabot lady baltimore lets her spoon fall into her saucer making a little quick clatter everybody tries to think of something to say nobody succeeds mr brown who is evidently choking is mercifully delivered by beneficent nature from a sudden death he gives way to a loud and sonorous sneeze oh dicky how funny do you sneeze says lady swanston it is a safety valve everybody at once affects to agree with her and universal laughter makes the room ring tommy i think it is time for you and mabel to go home says lady baltimore i promised your mother to send you back early give her my love and tell her i am so sorry she couldn't come to me to-day but i suppose last night's fatigue was too much for her twasn't that said tommy twas because cook yes yes of course i know says lady baltimore hurriedly afraid of further revelations now say good-bye and bertie you can go as far as the first gate with them the children make their adieus tommy reserving dicky brown for the last fond embrace good-bye old man so long what's that says tommy appealing to beauclerk for information what's what said beauclerk who isn't in his usual amiable mood what's the meaning of that thing dicky said to me so long oh that's brown's charming way of saying good-bye oh says tommy thoughtfully he runs it through his busy brain and brings it out at the other end satisfactorily translated i know says he go long that's what he meant but i think indignantly he needn't be rude anyway the children have hardly gone when joyce and dysart enter the room i hope i'm not dreadfully late cried joyce carelessly taking off her cap and giving her head a little light shake as if to make her pretty soft hair fall into its usual charming order i have no idea what the time is broken your watch dysart said beauclerk in a rather nasty tone come and sit here dearest and have your tea says lady baltimore making room on the lounge beside her for joyce who has grown a little red it is so warm in here says she nervously that one remark of beauclerk's having somehow disconcerted her if if i might no no you mustn't go upstairs for a little while says lady baltimore with kindly decision 
but you may go into the conservatory if you like pointing to an open door off the library that leads into a bower of sweets it is cooler there far cooler said beauclerk who has followed joyce with a sort of determination in his genial air let me take you there miss cavanagh it is impossible to refuse joyce coldly almost disdainfully and with her head held higher than usual skirts the groups that line the walls on the western side of the room and disappears with him into the conservatory End of chapter 20 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 21 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford Chapter 21 Who dares to think one thing and another tell? My heart detests him as the gates of hell. A little foolish going for that walk, wasn't it? says he leading her to a low-cushioned chair over which a gay magnolia bends its white blossoms. His manner is innocence itself. Ignorance itself would perhaps better express it. He has decided on ignoring everything, though a shrewd guess that she saw something of his passages with Miss Maliphant last night has now become almost a certainty. I thought you seemed rather played out last night, fatigued, done to death. I assure you I noticed it. I could hardly, with deep and affectionate concern, fail to notice anything that affected you. You are very good, said Miss Kavanagh icily. Mr. Beauclerk lets a full minute go by, and then, what have I done to merit that tone from you? asked he not angrily, only sorrowfully. He has turned his handsome face full on hers, and is regarding her with proud, reproachful eyes. It is idle to deny, says he, with some emotion, half of which, to do him justice, is real, that you are changed to me. Something has happened to alter the feelings of, of, friendship." that I dared to hope you entertained for me. I have hoped still more, Joyce, but what has happened? demands he suddenly, with all the righteousness strength of one who, free from guilt, resents accusation of it. Have I accused you? says she coldly. Yes, a thousand times, yes. Do you think your voice alone can condemn? Your eyes are even crueler judges. Well, I am sorry, says she, faintly smiling. My eyes must be deceivers then. I bear you no malice. Believe me. So be it, says he, with an assumption of relief that is very well done. After all, I have worried myself, I dare say, very unnecessarily. Let us talk of something else. Miss Maliphant, for example with a glance at her and a pleasant smile. Nice girl, eh? I miss her. She went early this morning, did she? says Joyce, scarcely knowing what to say. Her lips feel a little dry, an agonized certainty that she is showing growing crimson beneath his steady gaze brings the tears to her eyes. Too early, I quite hope to be up to see her off, but sleep had made its own of me, and I failed to wake. Such a good, genuine girl. Universal favorite, don't you think? Very honest and very, breaking into an apparently irrepressible laugh. Ugly! Ah, well now. With smiling self-condemnation, that's really a little too bad, isn't it? A great deal too bad, says Joyce gravely. 
I shouldn't speak of her if I were you. But why, my dear girl, with arched brows and a little gesture of his handsome hands, I allow her everything but beauty, and surely it would be hypocrisy to mention that in the same breath with her. It isn't fair, it isn't sincere, says the girl almost passionately. Do you think I am ignorant of everything, that I did not see you with her last night, in the garden? Oh, with a touch of scorn that is yet full of pain, you should not, you should not indeed. In an instant he grows confused. Something in the lovely horror of her eyes undoes him, only for an instant. After that he turns the momentary confusion to good account. Ah, you did see her, then, poor girl, says he. Well, I am sorry about that for her sake. Why, for her sake, still regarding him with that charming disdain. For your own, perhaps, but why for hers? Beauclerk pauses, then, rising suddenly, stands before her. Grief and gentle indignation sit upon his massive brow. He looks the very incarnation of injured rectitude. Do you know, Joyce, you have always been ready to condemn, to misjudge me, says he in a low, hurt tone. I have often noticed it, yet have failed to understand why it is. I was right, you see, when I told myself last night and this morning that you were harboring unkindly thoughts towards me. You have not been open with me. You have been willfully secretive, and believe me, that is a mistake. Candor, complete and perfect, is the only great virtue that will steer one clear through all the shoals and rocks of life. Be honest, above board, and I can assure you, you will never regret it. You accuse me just now of insincerity. Have you been sincere? There was a dead pause. He allows it to last long enough to make it dramatic, and to convince himself he has impressed her, and then, with a very perceptible increase of dignified pain in his voice, he goes on. I feel I ought not to explain under the circumstances, but as it is to you, heavy emphasis on second affected silence, you have heard, perhaps, of Miss Maliphant's cousin in India. No, says Joyce, after racking her brain in vain for some memory of the cousin question. And, indeed, it would have been noting short of a miracle if she could have remembered anything about that apocryphal person. You will understand that I speak to you in the strictest confidence, says Beauclerk earnestly. I wouldn't for anything you could offer me, that is, that it should get back to the poor girl's ear, that I had been discussing her and the most sacred feelings of her heart. Well, there is a cousin, and she, you may have noticed that she and I were great friends. Yes, says Joyce, whose heart is beating now to suffocation. Oh, has she wronged him? Does she still wrong him? Is this vile, suspicious feeling within her to be encouraged? Is all this story of his, this simple explanation, false, false? I was, indeed, a sort of confidant of hers. Poor dear girl, it was a relief to her to talk to somebody. There were others, but none here who knew him. You knew him, then? His name is Maliphant, too? asked Joyce, ashamed of her cross-examination, yet driven to it by some power beyond her control. You mustn't ask me that, said Beauclerk, playfully. There are some things I must keep even from you. Though you see I go very far to satisfy your unjust suspicions of me, you can, however, guess a good deal. You saw her crying? She was not crying, says Joyce slowly, a little puzzled. 
Miss Maliphant had seemed at the moment in question well pleased. No, not when you saw her. Ah, that must have been later then, with a sigh. Now you see I am betraying more than I should. However, I can depend upon your silence. It will be a small secret between you and me. And Miss Maliphant, says Joyce coldly, as for me, what is the secret? You haven't understood, not really? Well, between you and me and the wall, with delightful gaiety, I think she gives a thought or two to that cousin. I fancy, whispering, she is even in, uh, you know. I don't, says Joyce slowly, who is now longing to believe in him, and yet is held steadily backward by some strong feeling. I believe she is in love with him, says Beauclerk, still in a mysterious whisper, but it is a sore subject, with an expressive frown, not best pleased when it is mentioned to her. Mauvais sujet, you understand, but girls are often foolish in that way. Better say nothing about it. I shall say nothing, of course, says Joyce. Why should I? It is nothing to me, though I am sorry for her. Yet, as she says this, a doubt arises in her mind as to whether she need be sorry. Is there a cousin in India? Could that big, jolly, lively girl who had come into the conservatory with Beauclerk last night with the light of triumph in her eyes, be the victim of an unhappy love affair? Should she write and ask her if there is a cousin in India? Oh, no, no, she could not do that. How horrible, how hateful, to distrust him like this. What a detestable mind must be hers. And besides, why dwell so much upon it? Why not accept him as a pleasing acquaintance, one with whom to pass a pleasant hour now and then? Why ever again regard him as a possible lover? A little shudder runs through her. At this moment it seems to her that she could never really have so regarded him, and yet only last night. And now, what is it? Does she still doubt? Will that strange, curious, tormenting feeling that once she felt for him return no more? Is it gone forever? Oh, that it might be so. End of chapter 21 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 22 of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford. Chapter 22 so over violent or over civil a man so various dull looking day says dicky brown looking up from his broiled kidney to glare indignantly through the window at the gray sky it can't be always may says beauclerk cheerfully whose point it is to take ever a lenient view of things even to heaven itself he is kind, and holds out a helping hand. I expect it is we ourselves who are dull, says Lady Baltimore, looking round the breakfast table, where now many vacant seats make the edges bare. Yesterday morning Miss Maliphant left. Today the Clontarfs and one or two strange men from the barracks in the next town. Desertion, indeed, seems to be the order of the day. We grow very small, says she. How I miss people when they go away. Do you mean that as a liberal bribe for the getting rid of the rest of us, 
says dicky who is now devoting himself to the hot scones if so let me tell you it isn't good enough i shall stay here until you choose to cross the channel i don't want to be missed that will be next week says lady baltimore i do beseech all here present not to forsake me until then i must deny your prayer said lady swansdon these tiresome lawyers of mine say they must see me on thursday at the latest i shall meet you in town at christmas however says lady baltimore making the remark a question i hardly think so i have promised the bearings to join them in italy about then well here then in february lady swansdon smiles at her hostess but makes no audible reply i suppose we ought to do something to-day says lady baltimore presently in a listless tone it is plain to everybody however that in reality she wants to do nothing suggest something dicky skittles says that youth without hesitation very promptly however no one takes any notice of him i was thinking that if we went to corner cross it would be a nice drive says lady baltimore still struggling with her duties as a hostess what do you say beatrice i pray you excuse me says lady swanston as i leave to-morrow i must give the afternoon to the answering of several letters and to other things besides corners cross said joyce idly i've so often heard of it yet oddly enough i have never seen it it is always the way isn't it whenever one lives very close to some celebrated spot celebrated or not it is at least lovely says lady baltimore you really ought to see it i'll drive you there this afternoon miss kavanagh says beauclerk in his friendly way that in public has never a tincture of tenderness about it we might start after luncheon it is only about ten miles off eh to baltimore ten briefly i am right then equally we might easily do it in little over an hour an hour and a half with best horse in the stables bad road says baltimore even so we shall get there and back in excellent time says beauclerk deaf to his brother-in-law's gruffness will you come miss kavanagh i should like it says joyce in a hesitating sort of way but then why not go dear says lady baltimore kindly the moreaus of craigston live not half a mile from it and they will give you tea if you feel tired norman is a very good whip and will be sure to have you back here in proper time dysart lifting his head looks full at joyce at that rate says she smiling at beauclerk it is settled then says beauclerk pleasantly thank you ever so much for helping me to get rid of my afternoon in so delightful a fashion it is going to rain it will be a wet evening says dysart abruptly oh my dear fellow you can hardly be called a weather prophet says beauclerk batteringly you ought to know that a settled gray sky like that seldom means rain no more is said about it then and no mention is made of it at luncheon at half-past two precisely however a dog-cart comes round to the hall door joyce running lightly downstairs habited for a drive meets dysart at the foot of the staircase do not go says he abruptly not go now with a glance at her costume i didn't believe you would go says he vehemently i didn't believe it possible or i should have spoken sooner nevertheless at this last moment i entreat you to give it up impossible she said curtly annoyed by his tone which is perhaps unconscientiously a little dictatorial 
Do you refuse me? It is not the question. I have said I would go. I see no reason for not going. I decline to make myself foolish in the eyes of everybody by drawing back at the last moment. You have forgotten everything, then. I don't know, coldly, that there is anything to remember. Oh, bitterly, not so far as I am concerned. I count for nothing. I allow that. But he, I fancy you had at least read him. I think perhaps there was nothing to read, says she, lowering her eyes. If you can think that, it is useless my saying anything further. He moves to one side as if to let her pass, but she hesitates. Perhaps she would have said something to soften her decision. But, a rare thing with him, he loses his temper. Seeing her standing there before him, so sweet, so lovely, so indifferent, as he tells himself, his despair overcomes him. I have a voice in this matter, says he, frowning heavily. I forbid you to go with that fellow. A sharp change crosses Miss Kavanaugh's face. All of the sudden softness dies out of it. She stoops leisurely and disengaging the end of the black lace round her throat from an envious banister that would have detained her without further glance or word for dysart she goes up the hall and through the open doorway beauclerk who has been waiting for her outside comes forward a little spring seats her in the cart beauclerk jumps in beside her another moment sees them out of sight the vagrant sun that all day long had been coming and going in fitful fashion has suddenly sunk behind the thunderous gray cloud that rising from the sea now spreads itself o'er hill and vale the light has died out of the sky dull muttering sounds come rumbling down from the distant mountains the vast expanse of barren log upon the left has become almost obscure here and there a glint of its watery wastes may be seen but indistinctly giving the eye a mournful impression of lands forlorn a strange hot quiet seems to have fallen upon the trembling earth we often see against some storm a silence in the heavens the rack stands still the bold wind speechless and the orb below is hushed as death just now that boding silence reigns a sense of fear falls on joyce she scarcely knows why as her companion with a quick lash of the whip urges the horse up the steep hill they are still several miles from their destination and though it is only four o'clock it is no longer day the heavens are black as ink the trees are shivering in expectant misery what is it says joyce and even as she asks the question it is answered the storm is upon them in all its fury all at once without an instant's warning a violent downpour of rain comes from the bursting clouds threatening to deluge them we are in for it says beauclerk in a sharp short tone so unlike his usual dulcet accents that even now in her sudden discomfort it startles her the rain is descending in torrents a wild wind has arisen the light has faded and now the day resembles nothing so much as the dull beginning of a winter's night have you any idea where we are asked Barclerk presently none you know i told you i had never been here before but you you must have some knowledge of it how should i these detestable irish isolations are as yet unknown paths to me but i thought you said you gave me the impression that you knew connor's cross i regret it if i did shortly 
the rain is running down his neck by this time leaving a cold drenched collar to add zest to his rising ill temper i had heard of connor's cross i never saw it i devoutly hope with a snarl i never shall i don't think you are likely to says joyce whose own temper is beginning to be ruffled well this is a cell says beauclerk he is buttoning up a heavy ulster round his handsome form he is very particular about the fastening of the last button that one that goes under the chin and having satisfactorily accomplished it and found by a carefully moving backward and forward of his head that it is comfortably adjusted it occurs to him to see if his companion is weatherproof got wraps enough asks he no by jove here put on this dragging a warm cloak of her own from under the seat and offering it to her with the air of one making a gift what is it coat cloak ulster one never knows what woman's clothes are meant for to cover them says joyce calmly well put it on by jove how it pours all right now having carelessly flung it round her without regard for where her arms ought to go through the sleeves think you can manage the rest by yourself so beastly difficult to do anything in a storm like this with this brute tugging at the reins and the rain running up one sleeve i can manage it very well myself thank you says joyce giving up the finding of the sleeves as a bad job after a futile effort to discover their whereabouts she buttons the cloak across her chest and sits beside him silent but shivering a little swift wandering thought of dysart makes her feel even colder if he had been there would she be thus roughly entreated nay rather would she not have been a mark for tenderest care a precious charge entrusted to his keeping a thing beloved and therefore to be cherished look there says she suddenly lifting her head and pointing a little to the right surely even through this denseness i see lights is it a village yes a village i should say grimly a hamlet rather would you ungraciously suggest our seeking shelter there i think it must be the village called falling says she too pleased at her discovery to care about his gruffness and if so the owner of the inn there was an old servant of my father's she often comes over to see barbara and the children and though i have never come here to see her i know she lives somewhere in this part of the world a good creature she is the kindest of women an inn says beauclerk deaf to the virtues of the old servant the innkeeper but altogether alive to the fact that she keeps an inn what a blessed oasis in our wilderness and it can't be more than half a mile away why recovering his usual delightful manner we shall find ourselves housed in no time i do hope my dear girl you are comfortable wrapped up to the chin eh quite right quite right after all the poor driver has the worst of it he must face the elements whatever happens now you with your dear little chin so cosily hidden from the wind and rain and with hardly a suspicion of the blast i am fighting making a charming picture really charming ah you girls you have the best of it beyond doubt and why not it is the law of nature weak women and strong men you know those exquisite lines can't that horse go faster says miss kavanagh breaking in on this little speech in a rather ruthless manner lapped in luxury as you evidently believe me i still assure you i should 
gladly exchange my present condition for a good wholesome kitchen fire always practical your charm one of them says mr beauclerk but he takes the hint nevertheless and presently they draw up before a small dingy place of shelter not a man is to be seen the village a collection of fifty houses when all is told is swept and garnished a few geese are strike are stalking up the street uttering creaking noises some ducks are swimming in a glad astonishment down the muddy streams running by the edges of the curbstones such a delicious wealth of filthy water has not been seen in falling for the past three dry months the deserted village with a vengeance says beauclerk he has risen in his seat and placed his whip in the stand with a view of descending and arousing the inhabitants of this sleepy hollow when a shock head is thrust out of the inn hotel rather as is painted on a huge sign over the door and being instantly withdrawn again with a muttered out ya is followed by a shriek for miss connolly miss connolly ma'am sure tis yourself that's wanted come down i tell ye there's gentry at the door and the rain pelting on em like the divil come down i'm telling ye or figs they'll go on to paddy sheenan's and then will ye be o murder where are ye at all at all tis ruin ye'll ne be entirely wid the staying of ye arrah hood ye wished ye old man the world says another voice and in a second a big buxom jolly hearty looking woman appears on the threshold peering a little suspiciously through the gathering gloom at the dog-cart outside first she catches sight of the crest and coronet and a gleam of pleased intelligence brightens her face then lifting her eyes she meets those of joyce and the sudden pleasure gives way to actual and honest joy it is miss connolly says joyce in a voice that is supposed to accompany a smile but has in reality something of tears in it miss connolly regardless of the pelting rain and her best cap takes a step forward End of chapter 22 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 23 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford Chapter 23 All is not gold that outward sheweth bright. I love everything that's old. Old friends, old times, old manners, old books, old wine. And it's you, Miss Joyce. Glory be! what a day to be out tis drenched ye are entirely oh come in my dear come in me darlin here mikey paddy jerry come here every mother's son o oh, ye and take mr beauclerk's horse from him oh by the laws but ye are soaked arr what misfortune drove ye out to-day of all days miss joyce was there never a man to tell ye that twould be pelting storm before nightfall there had been one how earnestly miss kavanagh now wishes she had listened to his warning it looked so fine two hours ago said she clambering down from the dog-cart with such misguided help from the ardent mrs connolly as almost lands her with the ducks in the muddy stream below ouch 
there's no more dependence to be placed upon the weather than there is upon a man however tis welcome you are any way your father's daughter is dear to me yes come this way up these stairs tis anne connolly is proud to be entertaining one your blood inside their door oh i'm so glad i found you says joyce turning when she has reached mrs connolly's bedroom to imprint upon that buxom widow's cheek a warm kiss it was a long way here long and so cold and wet and where were you goin at all if i may ask says mrs connolly taking off the girl's dripping outer garments to see connor's cross faith twas little ye had to do a musty old tomb like that with nothing but broken stones around it wouldn't the brand new graveyard below there do ye musha but tis quar the gintry is ouch my dear twas wet ye are there isn't a dry stitch on ye i don't think i'm wet once my coats are off says joyce and indeed when those invaluable wraps are removed it is proved beyond doubt even mrs connolly's doubt which is strong that her gown is quite dry you see it was such a sudden rain says joyce and fortunately we saw the lights in this village almost immediately after it began figs too sudden it to be pleasant says mrs connolly twas well the early darkness made us light up so quickly or ye might have missed us not knowing your road and how's all with ye my dear miss barbara and the master and the darlin children i've a branny cock and a hen that i'm thinkin of takin down to master tommy this two weeks but the old mare is mighty quare on her legs o late are ye all well quite well thank you mrs connolly wish ya god keep ye so and how are all of you when did you hear from america last month then divil a less and the greatest news of all a letter from johnny me eldest boy wid a five pound note in it and a picture of the girl he's gone to marry i declare to ye when that letter came i just fell into a chair and talked to laughin and cryin till that ouchel of a girl in the kitchen began to bait me on the back thinking i was bad in a fit to think my dear of little johnheen i used to nurse on me knee thinkin of takin a partner and a strappin fine girl too figs with cheeks like turnips but there now i'll show her to ye by and by she's a real beauty if them portraits be true but there's a lot o lies coming from o'er the water and what ye be takin now miss joyce dear with a return to her hospitable mood a drop o hot punch now whisky is the finest thing out for givin the good bye to the cold oh no thank you miss connolly hastily if i might have a cup of tea i a raw bad cess to that tay what's the good of it at all at all to a frozen stomach could poison i calls it well there and come along down with me now and give yourself to the entertainment of mr beauclerk whilst i wet the pot glory what a man he is the size o the house a fine man in earnest tell me now with a shrewd glance at joyce is there anything betwixt you and him nothing says joyce surprised even herself by the amount of vehement denial she throws into this word oh well there's others and mr dysart would be more to my fancy there's a nate man if ye like 
me be figs with a second half sly wholly kindly glance at the girl if twas he now i give ye a blessin with a heart and a half and indeed now miss joyce tis time ye were thinking o settlin well i'm not thinking of it this time says joyce laughing though a little catch in her throat warns her she is not far from tears perhaps mrs conley hears that little catch too for she instantly changes her tactics faith ain't tis right ye are my dear there's a deal o trouble in marriage and ain't tis young to entirely to undertake the likes of it says she veering round with a scandalous disregard for appearances my what hair ye have miss joyce tis improved it is even since last i saw ye i'm a great admirer of a good head o hair i wonder when the rain will be over asked joyce wistfully gazing through the small window at the threatening heavens if it's my opinion you're askin says mrs conley i'd say not till tomorrow mornin oh mrs conley turning a distressed face to that good creature well my dear what can i say but what i think flinging out her ample arms in self-justification would ye have me lie to ye why a sky like that always here a loud crash of thunder almost shakes the small inn to its foundations the heavens be good to us says mrs conley crossing herself devoutly did ye ever hear the like of that but it can't last it is impossible says joyce vehemently is there no covered car in the town couldn't a man be persuaded to drive me home if i promised him to if ye promised him a king's ransom ye couldn't get a covered car to-night said mrs conley there's only one in the place and that belongs to mike murphy and tis off now miles bin skibbereen attending the funeral o father john mcguire twon't be home till to-morrow anyway and fax i wouldn't wonder if it wasn't here then for every mother's son at that wake will be as drunk as fiddlers to-night father john ye you know me dear was greatly respected are you sure there isn't another car quite positive but why ye need be so uneasy miss joyce dear sure tis safe and ye're sure you're wid with me but what will they think at home and at the court says joyce faltering ah what can they think miss but that the rain was altogether too masterful for ye ye you know my dear we can't even the best of us control the elements this unconvertible fact miss conley gives forth with a truly noble air of resignation come down now and let me get ye that paltry cup of tea you're craving for she leads joyce downstairs and into a snug little parlour with a roaring fire that is not altogether unacceptable this dreary evening the smell of stale tobacco smoke that pervades it is a drawback but if you think of it we can't have everything in this world perhaps joyce has more than she wants it occurs to her as beauclerk turns round from the solitary window that she could well have dispensed with his society that lurking distrust of him she had known vaguely but kept under during all their acquaintance has taken a permanent place in her mind during her drive with him this afternoon oh here you are beastly smoky hole he says taking no notice of miss conley who is doing her best curtsy in the doorway i think it looks very comfortable says joyce with a gracious smile at her hostess and a certain sore feeling at her heart 
once again her thoughts fly to dysart would that have been his first remark when she appeared after so severe a wedding tis just what i've been saying to miss kavanagh sir says mrs connolly with unabated good humour the heavens above is always too much for us we can't turn off the weather up there as we can the cock in the kitchen sink still there's compensations always glory be and what will ye please have with your tea miss turning to joyce with great respect in look and tone in spite of all her familiarity with her upstairs she now with a looker-on proceeds to treat her young lady as though she were a stranger and of blood royal anything you have miss connolly says joyce only don't be long there is undoubted entreaty in the request mrs connolly glancing at her concludes it is not so much a desire for what will be brought as for the bringer that animates the speaker give me five minutes miss and i'll be back again says she pleasantly leaving the room she stands in the passage outside for a moment and solemnly moves her kindly head from side to side it takes her but a little time to make up her shrewd irish mind on several points while this worthy person is getting you your tea i think i'll take a look at the weather from outside says mr beauclerk turning to joyce it is evident he is eager to avoid a tete a tete but this does not occur to her yes do do says she nevertheless with such a liberal encouragement as puzzles him women are kittle cattle however he tells himself better not to question their motives too closely or you will find yourself in queer street he gets to the door with a cheerful assumption of going to study the heavens that conceals his desire for a cigar and a brandy and soda but on the threshold joyce speaks again is there no chance would it not be possible to get home says she in a tone that trembles with nervous longing i'm afraid not i'm just going to see it is impossible weather for you to be out in but you it is clearing a little isn't it with a despairing glance out of the window if you could manage to get back and tell them that she is made thoroughly ashamed of her selfishness a moment later but my dear girl consider why should i tempt a severe attack of inflammation of the lungs by driving ten or twelve miles through this unrelenting torrent we are very well out of it here this miss er connor conley seems a very respectable person and is known to you i shall tell her to make you as comfortable as her limited liabilities with quite a laugh at his own wit will allow pray tell her nothing do not give yourself so much trouble says joyce calmly she will do the best she can for me without in the intervention of any one as you will au revoir says he waving her a graceful farewell for the moment he is not entirely happy in his mind as he crosses the tiny hall and makes his way first to the bar and afterward to the open doorway like a cat he hates rain to drive back through this turmoil of wind and wet for twelve long miles to the court is more than his pleasure loving nature can bear to look upon yet to remain has its drawbacks too if miss maliphant for example were to hear of this escapade there might be trouble there he has not as yet finally made up his mind to give inclination the go by and surrender himself to sordid considerations but there can be no doubt that the sordid things of this life have with some natures a charm hardly to be rivalled successfully by mere beauty 
the heiress is attractive in one sense joyce equally so in another miss maliphant's charms are golden are not joyce's more golden still and yet to give up miss maliphant to break with her finally to throw away deliberately a good ten thousand pounds a year he lights his cigar with an untrembling hand and having found it satisfactory permits his mind to continue its investigations ten thousand pounds a year a great help to a man yet he is glad at this moment that he is free to accept or reject it nothing definite has been said to the heiress nothing definite to joyce either it strikes him at this moment as he stands in the dingy doorway of the inn and stares out at the descending rain that he has shown distinct cleverness in the way in which he has maneuvered these two girls without either of them feeling the least suspicion of the other last night joyce had been on the point of a discovery but he had smoothed away all that evidently he was born to be a successful diplomat and if that appointment he had been looking for ever comes his way he will be able to show the world a thing or two how charming that little girl in there can look and never more so than when she allows her temper to overcome her she had been angry just now yes but he can read between the lines angry naturally that he has not come to the point declared himself proposed as the saying is while puffing contemplatively at his cigar she must wait she must wait if the appointment comes off if sir alexander stands to him she has a very good chance but if that falls through why then and it won't do to encourage her too much by jove if miss maliphant were to hear of this evening's adventure she is headstrong solid enough to mark out a line for herself and fling him aside without waiting for judge or jury much it might cost her she would not hesitate to break all ties with him and any that existed were very slight he himself had kept them so perhaps after all he had better order the trap round leaving miss kavanagh here and and yet to go out in that rain to feel it beating against his face for two or three intolerable hours was anything even ten thousand pounds a year worth that he would be a drowned rat by the time he reached the court and after all couldn't it be arranged without all this bother he might easily explain it all away to miss maliphant even should some kind friend tell her of it that was his role he had quite a talent for explaining away but he must also make joe's thoroughly understand she was a sensible girl a word to her would be sufficient just a word to show that marriage at present was out of the question nothing unpleasant nothing finite but just some little thing to waken her to the true state of the case girls as a rule were sentimental and would expect much of an adventure such as this but joyce was proud he liked that in her there would be no trouble she would quite understand tea is coming up sir said a rough voice behind him the mistress told me to tell you so the red-headed abigail who tends on mrs conley beckons him with a grimy forefinger to the repast within he accepts the invitation End of chapter 23 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter number 24 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 24 It is the mind that maketh good or ill, that maketh wretch or happy, rich or poor. As he enters the inn parlor, he finds Joyce sitting by the fire, listening to Mrs. Connolly, who, armed with a large tray, is advancing up the room toward the table. Nobody but the mistress herself is allowed to wait upon the young lady. And I hope, Miss Joyce, twill be your liking, and sorry I am, sir, with a courteous recognition of Beauclerk's entrance. That tis only one poor fowl I can give ye, but them commercial travellers are the devil. They laugh nothing behind em if they could help it. Still, miss, with a loving smile at Joyce, I do think ye'll like the ham. Tis my own curin, and I bought ye just a taste o' this year's honey. Ye always a sweet tooth from the time ye were born. I hardly have, I could hardly have a sweet tooth before that, says Joyce, laughing. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Conley. It is a lovely tea, and it is very good of you to take all this trouble. Who'd be welcome to any trouble if twasn't yourself, miss? says Mrs. Conley, bowing and retreating toward the door. A movement on the part of Joyce checks her. The girl has made an impulsive step as if to follow her, and now, seeing Mrs. Conley stop short, holds out to her one hand. But Mrs. Conley, says she, trying to speak naturally and succeeding very well, so far as careless ears are in question, but the mistress marks with a false note. You will stay and pour out tea for us, you will? There is an extreme treaty in her tone, the stronger in that it has to be suppressed. Mrs. Conley, halting midway between the table and the door with the tray in her hands, hears it, and a sudden light comes, not only in her eyes but her mind. Why, if you wish it, miss, says she directly. She lays down the tray, standing it up against the wall, and coming back to the table, lifts the teapot and begins to fill the cups. "'You take sugar, sir?' asks she of Beauclerk, who is a little puzzled, but not altogether displeased at the turn affairs have taken. After all, as he has told himself a thousand times, Joyce is a clever girl. She is determined not to betray the anxiety for his society that beyond question she is feeling, and this prudence on her part will relieve him of many small embarrassments. Truly, she is a girl not to be found every day. He is accordingly most gracious to Mrs. Conley, praises her ham, extols her tea, says wonderful things about the chicken. When tea is at an end, he rises gracefully, and expresses his desire to smoke one more cigar and have a last look at the weather. "'You will be able to put us up?' says he. "'Oh, yes, sir, sure.' He smiles beautifully, and with a benevolent request to Joyce to take care of herself in his absence, leaves the room. "'He's a dale o' talk,' says Mrs. Conley, the moment his back is turned." She is now sure that Joyce has some private grudge against him, or at all events is not what she herself would call partial to him. Yes, says Joyce, he is very conversational. How it rains still. Yes, it does, says Mrs. Conley, comfortably. She is not at all put out by the girl's reserved manner having lived among the Ginthry for many years, and being well up to their queer ways. A thought, however, that had been formulating in her mind for a long time past, ever since, indeed, she found her young lady could not return home until morning, now compels her to give the conversation a fresh turn. 
I've got to apologize to ye, miss, but since ye must stay the night with me, I'm bound to tell ye I have no room for ye but a little one leadin' out to me own. Are you so very full then, Mrs. Conley? I'm glad to hear that for your sake. Full to the chin, my dear, them commercials always drop down upon one just when last wanted. Then I suppose I ought to be thankful that you can give me a room at all, says Joyce laughing. I'm afraid I shall be a great trouble to you. Ne'er a scrap in my life, my dear. Twist proud I am to be of any service to ye. And perhaps twill make ye easier in your mind to know as you're under my protection and that no gossip can come ne ye. The good woman means well, but she has flown rather above Joyce's head, or rather under her feet. I'm delighted to be with you, says Miss Kavanagh, with a pretty smile. But as for protection, well, the land leaguers round here are not so bad as the one should fear for one's life in a quiet village like this. There's worse than land leaguers, says Mrs. Connolly. There's them who talk. Talk of what? says Joyce, a little vaguely. Well now, my dear, sure you haven't lived so long without knowing there's cruel people in the world, said Mrs. Connolly, anxiously. And the fact you o goin out driving with Mr. Beauclerk and staying out the night with him might give rise to the talk I'm fightin again. Don't be angry with me now, Miss Joyce, and don't fret, but tis as well to prepare ye. Joyce's heart, as she listens, seems to die with her. A kind of sick feeling renders her speechless. She had never thought of that of the idea of impropriety being suggested as part of this most unlucky escapade. Mrs. Connolly, noting the girl's white face, feels as though she ought to have cut her tongue out, rather than have spoken, yet she had done all for the best. "'Miss Joyce, don't think about it,' says she hurriedly. "'I'm sorry I said a word, but—' "'And after all, I'm right, my dear.' "'Tis better for ye when evil tongues are waggin' "'to have a real friend like me to your back "'to say the needful word. "'Ye sleep with me tonight, "'and I'll take ye back to her ladyship in the morning, "'and never leave ye till I see ye in safe hands once more. "'If ye liked him,' pointing to the door "'through which Beauclerk had gone, "'I'd say nothing.' for then all would come right enough. But as it is, I'll take it on myself to be the nurse to ye now that I was when ye were a little creature creeping along the floor. Joyce smiles at her, but rather faintly. A sense of terror is oppressing her. Lady Baltimore, what will she think? And Freddy and Barbara, they will all be angry with her. Oh, more than angry, they will think she has done something that other girls would not have done. How is she to face them again? The entire party at the court seems to spread itself before her. Lady Swanston and Lord Baltimore, they will laugh about it, and the others will laugh and whisper, and Felix, Felix Dysart, what will he think? What is he thinking now? To follow out this thought is intolerable to her. She rises abruptly. What o'clock is it, Mrs. Conley? says she in a hard, strained voice. I am tired. I should like to go to bed now. Just eight, Miss Anne. If you're tired, there's nothing like the bed. You will like to say good night to Mr. Beauclerk? Oh, no, no, with frowning sharpness. Then recovering herself, I need not disturb him. You will tell him that I was chilled, tired. I'll tell him all that he ought to know, said Mrs. Conley. Come, Miss Joyce, everything is ready for ye, and a lie down and a good sleep will be making of ye before morning. Joyce, 
to her surprise, is led through a very well-appointed chamber, evidently unused, to a smaller but scarcely less carefully arranged apartment beyond. The first is so plainly a room not in daily use, that she turns involuntarily to her companion. "'Is this your room, Miss Connolly?' "'For the night, me dear,' says that excellent woman mysteriously. "'You have changed your room to suit me. "'You mean something,' says the girl, growing crimson, "'and feeling as if her heart was going to burst. "'What is it?' "'No, no, miss. "'No, indeed, confusedly. "'But, Miss Joyce, I'll say this, "'that tis eight year now since Mr. Monkton came here, "'and many's the good turn he's done me since he's been my lord's agent and that's nothing at all miss to the gratitude i bear toward your poor father the old head of the house and ye think when occasion comes i wouldn't stand up and do the best i could for one o year of blood figs I'll take care that it won't be in the power of any one to say a word again you. Against me? You're young, miss, but there's people old enough to have sense and charity as haven't it. I can see ye couldn't go home tonight through that rain, through I'm not saying a little spitfully, but that he might have managed it. Sill faith, twas bad travelin' for man or beast, with a view to softening down her real opinion of Beauclerk's behaviour. How can she condemn him safely? Is he not my lady's own brother? Is he not my lord the owner of the very ground on which the inn is built, of the farm a mile away, where her cows are chewing the cud by this time in peace and safety? "'You have changed your room to oblige me,' says Joyce, still with that strange, miserable look in her eyes. "'Don't think about that, Miss Joyce, now, and don't fret yourself about anything else, either. You're sure you can remember that I'm to your back always?' She bridles and draws up her ample figure to its fullest height. Looking at her, it might suggest itself to any reasonable being that even the forlornest damsel, with any such noble support, might well defy the world. But Joyce is not to be so easily consoled. What is support to her? Who can console a torn heart? The day has been too eventful. It has overcome her courage. Not only has she lost faith in her own power to face the angry authorities at home, she has lost faith, too, in one whom, against her judgment, she has given more of her thoughts than was wise. The fact that she had recovered from that folly does not render the memory of the recovery less painful. The awakening from a troubled dream is full of anguish. Rising from a sleepless bed, she goes down next morning to find Mrs. Connolly standing on the lowest step of the stairs, as if awaiting her, booted and spurred for the journey. I told him to order the trap early, my dear, for I knew ye'd be anxious, says the kind woman, squeezing her hand, and now, with an anxious glance at her, I hope ye ate your breakfast. I guess ye'd like it in your room, so I sent it up to ye. Well, come on, dear, Mr. Beauclerk is outside waitin'. I explained it all to him, said ye were tired, ye you know, and eager to get back, so all's ready and the horse impatient. In spite of the storm yesterday, that seemed to shake earth and heaven, to-day is beautiful. Soft glistening stains are rising from the early hill and bog and valley, as the hot sun's rays beat upon them. The world seems wrapped in one vast vaporous mist, most lovely to behold. All the woodland flowers are holding up their heads again, after their past smitting from the cruel rain. 
the trees are swaying to and fro in the fresh morning breeze thousands of glittering drops brightening the air as they swing themselves from side to side all things speak of a new birth a resurrection a joyful wakening from a terrifying past the grass looks greener for its bath all dust is laid quite low the very lichens on the walls as they drive past them look washed and glorified the sun is flooding the sky with gorgeous light there are sweet smells all round the birds in the woods on either side of the roadway are singing high chords in praise of this glorious day all nature seems joyous joyce alone is silent unappreciative unhappy the nearer she gets to the court the more perturbed she grows in mind how will they receive her there barbara had said that lady baltimore would not be likely to encourage an attachment between her and beauclerk and now though the attachment is impossible what will she think of this unfortunate adventure she is so depressed that speech seems impossible to her and all to mr beauclerk's sallies she scarcely returns an answer his sallies are many never has he appeared in grayer spirits the fact that the girl beside him is unmistakably low spirits has either escaped him or he has decided on taking no notice of it last night over that final cigar he had made up his mind that it would be wise to say to her some little thing that would unmistakably awaken her to the fact that there was nothing between him and her of any serious importance now having covered half the distance that lies between them and the court he feels will be a good time to say that little thing she is too distrait to please him she is evidently brooding over something if she thinks better crush all such hopes at once i wonder what they are thinking about us at home he says presently with quite a cheerful laugh suggestive of amusement no answer i dare say with a second edition of the laugh full now of wider amusement as though the comical fancy that has caught hold of him has grown to completion i shouldn't wonder indeed if they were thinking we had eloped this graceful speech he makes with the easiest air in the world they may be thinking you have eloped certainly says miss kavanagh calmly one's own people as a rule know one very thoroughly and are quite alive to one's little failings but that they should think it of me is quite out of the question well after all i dare say you are right i don't suppose it lies in the possibilities they could hardly think it of me either says beauclerk with a careless yawn so extraordinary careless indeed as to be worthy of note i'm too poor for amusement of that kind one couldn't be too poor for that kind of amusement surely romance and history have both taught us that it is only the impecunious who ever indulge in that folly i am not so learned as you are but well i'm an impecunious one in all conscience i couldn't carry it out i only wish tenderly i could with whom icily as she asks the question she turns deliberately and looks him steadily in the eyes something in her regard disconcerts him and compels him to think that the following up of the little thing is likely to prove difficult how can you ask me demands he with an assumption of reproachful fondness that is rather overdone i do nevertheless with you then if i must put it in words says he lowering his tone to the softest whisper it is an eminent lover-like whisper it is a distinctly careful one too it is quite impossible for mrs conley sitting behind to hear it however carefully she may be attending 
it is well you cannot put your fortune to the touch says joyce quietly if you could disappointment alone would await you you mean asks he somewhat sharply that were it possible for me to commit such a vulgarity as to run away with any one you certainly would not be that one you are the very last man on earth i should choose for so mistaken an adventure let me also add says she turning upon him with flashing eyes though still her voice is determinately low and calm that you forget yourself strangely when you talk in this fashion to me the scorn and indignation in her charming face is so apparent that it is now impossible to ignore it being thus compelled to acknowledge it he grows angry beauclerk angry is not nice to do myself justice i seldom do that says he with a rather nasty laugh to forget myself is not part of my calculations i can generally remember number one you will remember me too if you please so long as i am with you says joyce with a grave and very gentle dignity but with a certain determination that makes itself felt beauclerk conscious of being somewhat cowed is bully enough to make one more thrust after all dysart was right says he he prophesied there be rain he advised you not to undertake our ill-starred journey of yesterday there is distinct and very malicious meaning in the emphasis he throws into the last word i begin to think mr dysart is always right says joyce bravely though her heart has begun to beat furiously that terrible fear of what they will say to her when she gets back of their anger their courteous anger their condemnation has been suddenly presented to her again and her courage dies within her dysart what will he say it strikes even herself as strange that his view of her conduct is the one that most disturbs her only beginning to think of it why i always understood dysart was immaculate the couldn't err sort of person one reads of but never sees you have been slow surely to gauge his merits i confess i have been even slower i haven't gauged them yet but then dysart and i were never much in sympathy with each other no one can understand that says she one can naturally with the utmost self-compliance i confess indeed with a sudden slight burst of vindictiveness that i never liked dysart idiotic sort of fool in my estimation self-opinionated like all fools and deucedly impertinent in that silent way of his i believe with a contemptuous laugh he has given it as his opinion that there is very little to like in me either has he we were saying just now he is always right says miss kavanagh absently and in a tone so low that beauclerk may be excused for scarcely believing his ears eh says he but there is no answer and presently both fall into a silent mood joyce because conversation is terrible to her and he because anger is consuming him he had kept up a lively converse all through the earlier part of the drive ignoring the depression that only too plainly was crushing upon his companion with a view to putting an end to it sentimentally of any sort her discomfort her unhappiness was as nothing to him he thought only of himself few men under the circumstances would have so acted for most men in spite of all the maids who so generously abuse them are chivalrous and have kindly hearts and indeed it is only a melancholy specimen here and there who will fail to feel pity for a woman in distress 
Beauclerk is a melancholy specimen. End of chapter 24 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 25 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 25 Man, False Man, Smiling, Destructive Man Who breathes must suffer, and who thinks must mourn and he alone is blessed who ne'er was born oh my dear girl it is you at last cries lady baltimore running out into the hall as joyce enters it we have been so frightened such a storm and baltimore says that mare you had is very uncertain where did you get shelter the very warmth and kindliness of her welcome, the utter absence of disapproval in it of any sort, so unnerves Joyce that she can make no reply, can only cling to her kindly hostess, and hide her face on her shoulder. "'Is that you, Mrs. Connolly? says Lady Baltimore, smiling at mine hostess of the Baltimore Arms over the girl's shoulder." Yes, my lady, with a curtsy so low that one wonders how she ever comes up again. I made so bold, my lady, as to bring ye home Miss Joyce myself. I know Mr. Beauclerk to be a good support in himself, but I thought it would be a reasonable thing to give her the company of one of her own women folk besides. Quite right, quite said lady baltimore oh she has been so kind to me says joyce raising now a pale face to turn a glance of gratitude on mrs connolly why indeed my lady i wish i might have been able to do more for her and i'm sorry to say i'd to put her in a small most inconvenient room just inside all my own how was that asked lady baltimore kindly the inn so full then fegs twas that was the matter wid it said mrs connolly with a beaming smile crammed from cellar to garret ah the wet night i suppose just so my lady composedly and with another deep curtsy lady baltimore had given mrs connolly into the care of the housekeeper who is an old friend of hers leaves joyce upstairs you are not angry with me says joyce turning on the threshold of her room with you my dear child no indeed with norman very he should have turned back the moment he saw the first symptom of a storm a short wedding would have done neither of you any harm there was no warning the storm was on us almost immediately and we were then very close to falling then having placed you once safely in mrs connolly's care he should have returned himself at all hazards it rained very hard said joyce in a cold clear tone her eyes are on the ground she is compelling herself to be strictly just to beauclerk but the effort is too much for her she fails to do it naturally and so gives a false impression to her listener lady baltimore casts a quick glance at her rain what is rain says she there was storm too a violent storm you must have felt it here no storm should have prevented his return he should have thought only of you a little bitter smile curls the girl's lips it seems a farce to suggest that he should have thought of her he now with her eyes effectually opened a certain scorn of herself 
in that he should have been able so easily to close them, takes possession of her. Is his sister blind still to his defects, that she expects so much from him? Has she not read him rightly yet? Has she yet to learn that he will never consider any one where his own interests, comforts, position clash with theirs? You look distressed, tired. I believe you are fretting about this, says Lady Baltimore, with a kindly bantering laugh. Don't be a silly child. Nobody has said or thought anything that has not been kindly of you. Did you sleep last night? No, I can see you didn't. There, lie down and get a little rest before luncheon. I shall send you up a glass of champagne and a biscuit. Don't refuse it. She pulls down the blinds and goes softly out of the room to her boudoir, where she finds Beauclerc awaiting her. He is lounging comfortably on a satin fauteuil, looking the very beau ideal of pleasant, careless life. He makes his sister a present of a beaming smile as she enters. Ah, good morning, Isabel. I'm afraid we gave you rather a fright. But you see it couldn't be helped. What an evening and night it turned out. By Jove, I thought the waterworks above were turned on for good at last and forever. We felt like the babes in the woods, abandoned, lost. Poor dear Miss Kavanagh, I felt so sorry for her. You have seen her, I hope. His face has now taken the correct lines of decorous concern. She is not over-fatigued. She looks tired, depressed, said Lady Baltimore, regarding him seriously. I wish, Norman, you had come home last evening. What? And bring Miss Kavanagh through all that storm? No. You could have left her at falling. I wish you had come home. Why? With an amused laugh. Are you afraid I have compromised myself? I was not thinking of you. I am more afraid, with a touch of cold displeasure, of your having compromised Miss Kavanagh. There are such things as gossips in this curious world. You should have left Joyce in Miss Connolly's safekeeping and come straight back here to be laid up with rheumatism during the whole of the coming winter oh most unnatural sister what is it you would have desired of me you show her great attention all this summer says lady baltimore i hope i showed a proper attention to all your guests you were very specially attentive to her to Miss Kavanagh, do you mean, with a puzzled air? Ah, oh, well, yes, perhaps I did give more of my time to her and to Miss Maliphant than to the others. Ah, oh, Miss Maliphant, one can understand that, says his sister, with an intonation that is not entirely complimentary. Can one? Here is one who can't, at all events. I confess I tried very hard to bring myself to the point there, but I failed. Nature was too strong for me. Good girl, you know, but er awful. We were not discussing Miss Maliphant. We were talking of Joyce, icily. Ah, true, as if just awakening to a delightful fact. And a far more charming subject for discussion. It must be allowed. Well, and what of Joyce? You call her Joyce? Be human, Norman, says Lady Baltimore, with a sudden suspicion of fire in her tone. Forget to pose once in a way, and this time it is important. Let me hear the truth from you. She seems unhappy, uncertain, nervous. I like her. There is something real genuine about her i would gladly think that do you know she leans towards him i have sometimes thought you were in love with her have you do you know so have i with a frankness very admirable 
she is one of the most agreeable girls of my acquaintance there is something very special about her i'm not surprised that both you and i fell into a conclusion of that sort am i to understand by that just one thing i am too poor to marry with that knowledge in your mind you should not have acted towards her as you did yesterday it was a mistake believe me you should have come home alone or else brought her back as your promised wife ah what a delightful vista you open up before me but what an unkind one too says mr beauclerk with a little reproachful uplifting of his hands and brows have you no bowels of compassion you know how the charms of domestic life have always attracted me and to be able to enjoy them with such an admirable companion as miss kavanagh are you soulless utterly without mercy isabel that you open up to me a glorious vision such as that merely to taunt and disappoint me i am neither joyce or nor miss maliphant says lady baltimore with ill-suppressed contempt i wish you would try to remember that norman it would spare time and trouble you speak of joyce as if she were the woman you love and yet would you subject the woman you love to unkind comment if you cared you would not have treated her as ah if i did care for her interrupts he well don't you sternly she has risen and is looking down at him from the full height of her tall slender figure that now looks taller than usual oh immensely declares mr beauclerk airily my dear girl you can't have studied me not to know that as i have told you i think her charming quite out of the common quite that will do shortly you condemn me says he in an aggravated tone that has got something of amused surprise in it yet you know you of all others how poor a devil i am so poor that i do not even permit the idea of marriage in my head perhaps however you have permitted it to enter into hers says lady baltimore oh my dear isabel with a light laugh and a protesting glance do you think she would thank you for that suggestion you should think you should think said lady baltimore with some agitation she is a very young girl she has lived entirely in the country she knows nothing nothing throwing out her hand she is not awake to the inquiring lying falsity with a rush of bitter disgust that belongs to the bigger world beyond the terrible world outside her own quiet one here she is quiet here isn't she says beauclerk with admirable appreciation pity to take her out of it eh and yet so far as i can see that is the cruel task you would impose on me norman says his sister turning suddenly and for the first time directly towards him well my dear what throwing one leg negligently over the other it really comes to this doesn't it that you want me to marry a certain somebody and that i think i cannot afford to marry her then it lies in the proverbial nutshell the man who cannot afford to marry should not afford himself the pleasures of flirtations says lady baltimore with decision no is that your final opinion good heavens isabel what a brow what a terrible glance if smiling you favor baltimore with this style of thing whenever you disapprove of his smaller action i don't wonder he jibs so often at the matrimonial collar you advise me to think just now think yourself my good isabel now and then 
and probably you will find life easier. He is still smiling delightfully. He flings out this cruel jib, indeed, in the most careless manner possible. Ah, forget me, says she in a manner as careless as his own. If she has quivered beneath that thrust of his, at all events she has had strength enough to suppress all signs of it. Think not of her, I dare say, she will outlive it, but of yourself. What would you have me do then? demands he, rising here and confronting her. There is a good deal of venom in his handsome face, but Lady Baltimore braves it. I would have you act as an honorable man, says she in a clear, if icy tone. You go pretty far, Isabel, very far, even for a sister says he presently, his face now white with rage. A moment ago I gave you some sound advice. I give you more now. Attend to your own affairs, which by all account require looking after, and let mine alone. He is evidently furious. His sister makes a little gesture toward the door. Your taking it like this does not mend matters she says calmly. It only makes them, if possible, worse. Leave me. End of chapter 25 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 26 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford Chapter 26 Polonius What do you read, my lord? Hamlet Words, words, words she sighs heavily as the door closes on her brother. A sense of weakness, of powerlessness, oppresses her. She has fought so long, and for what? Is there nothing to be gained, no truth to be defended anywhere, no standard of right and wrong? Are all men, all base, selfish, cowardly, dishonorable? Her whole being seems aflame with the indignation that is consuming her when a knock sounds at the door. There is only one person in the house who knocks at a boudoir door. To everyone, servants, guests, child, it is a free hand. To her husband alone, it is a forbidden ground. Come in, says she in a cold, reluctant tone. I know I shall be terribly in your way, says Baltimore, entering, but I must beg you to give me five minutes. I heard Beauclerk has returned, and that you have seen him. What kept him? Now Lady Baltimore, who a moment ago had condemned her brother heartily to his face, feels, as her husband addresses her, a perverse desire to openly contradict all that her honest judgment had led her to say to Beauclerk, that sense of indignation that was burning so hotly in her breast as Baltimore knocked at her door still stirs within her, but now its fire is directed against the latest comer. Who is he that he should dare to question the honor of any man, and that there is annoyance and condemnation now in Baltimore's eyes is not to be denied. The weather, returned she shortly, by your tone I judge you deem that an adequate excuse for keeping Miss Kavanagh from her home for half a day and night. There was a terrible storm, says Lady Baltimore calmly, the worst we have had for months. If it had been ten times as bad as he should, in my opinion, have come home. The words seemed a mere repetition to Lady Baltimore. 
she had indeed used them to beauclerk herself or some such a few minutes ago yet she seemed to repudiate all sympathy with them now on such a night as that i hardly see why joyce was with an old friend mrs conley was once a servant of her father's and he should have left her with the old friend and come home again her own argument and again perversity drives her to take the opposite side the side against her conscience society must be in a very bad state if a man must perforce encounter thunder rain lightning in fact a chance of death from cold and exposure all because he dare not spend one night beneath the roof of a respectable woman like mrs conley with a girlfriend without bringing down on him the censures of his entire world you can it appears be a most eloquent advocate for the supposed follies of any one but your husband nevertheless i must persist in my opinion that it was to put it very charitably indeed inconsiderate of your brother to study his own comfort at the expense of his girlfriend i believe that is your way of putting it isn't it yes immovably she has so far given way to movement however that she has taken up a feather fan lying near and now so holds it between her and baltimore that he cannot distinctly see her face as for the world you speak of it will not judge him as leniently as you do it can talk no one bitterly is as good a witness of that as i am but seldom coldly without reason and no one is a better witness of that than you are that is what you would say isn't it put down that fan can't you with a touch of savage impatience are you ashamed to carry out your argument with me face to face ashamed lady baltimore has sprung suddenly to her feet and sent the fan with a little crash to the ground oh shame on you to mention such a word am i to be forever your one scapegoat now take another one i beseech you says baltimore with that old queer devilish mockery on his face that was never seen there until gossiping tongues divided him from his wife here is your brother actually thrown to you as it were surely he will be a proof that i am not the only vile one among all the herd if nothing else acknowledge him selfish a man who thought more of a dry coat than a young a very young girl's reputation is that nothing oh consider i beseech you his bantering manner in which there was so much misery that it should have reached her but does not grow stronger every instant even a big chill from the heavens above would not have killed him whereas we all know how a little breath from the world below can kill many a oh i you can talk 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 says she that late unusual burst of passion showing some hot embers still but can words alter facts she pauses a sudden chill seems to enwrap her as if horrified by her late descent into passion she gathers herself together and defies him once again with a cold look why say anything more about it she says we do not agree on this subject at least we should says he hotly i think your brother should not have left us in ignorance of miss kavanagh's safety for so many hours and you with a sneer who are such a marionette for propriety should certainly be prepared to acknowledge that he should not have so regulated his conduct as to make her a subject for unkind comment to the county badly looking at her deliberately as you think of me 
I should not have done it. No, says she in a cruel and unmistakable insulting monosyllable, and bearing no other word with it is more detestable to the hearer. No, he says loudly, sneer as you will, my conscience is a rest here, so I can defy your suspicions. Ah, there, says she, my dear creature, says he, we all know there is but one villain in the world, and you are the proud professor of him as a husband. Permit me to observe, however, that a man of your code of honor, and of mine for the matter of that, but I forget that honor, and I have no cousinship in your estimation, would have chosen to be wet to the skin rather than imperil the fair name of the girl he loved. Has he told you he loved her? Not in so many words. Then from what do you argue? My dear, I have told you that you are too much for me in an argument. I, a simple onlooker, have judged merely from an everyday observance of little unobtrusive facts. If your brother is not in love with Miss Kavanagh, I think he ought to be. I speak ignorantly. I allow I am not, like you, a deep student of human nature. If, too, he did not feel it his duty to bring her home last night, or else to leave her at falling and return here himself, I feel to sympathize with him. I should not have so failed her. Oh, but you, says his wife, with a little contemptuous smile, you who are such a paragon of virtue, it would not be expected of you that you should make such a mistake. She had sent forth her dart impulsively, sharply, out of the overflowing fullness of her angry heart, and when too late, when it has sped past recall, perhaps repents the speeding. Such repentances, when felt too late, bring vices in their train. The desire for good, when chilled, turn to evil. The mind, never idle, if departed from the best, leans inevitably towards the worst. Angry with herself, her very soul embittered within her. Lady Baltimore feels more and more a sense of passionate wrong against the man who had wooed and won her, and sown the seeds of gnawing distrust within her bosom. Baltimore's face has whitened, his brow contracts. What a devilish unforgiving thing is a good woman, says he with a reckless laugh. That's a compliment, my lady. Take it as you will. What are your sneers to outlast life itself? Is that old supposed sin of mine never to be condoned? Why, say it was a real thing, instead of being the myth it is. Even so, a woman all prayers, all holiness, such as you are, might manage to pardon it. Lady Baltimore, rising, walks deliberately toward the door, it is her usual method of putting an end to all discussions of this sort between them, of terminating any allusions to what she believes to be his unfaithful past, the past that has wrecked her life. As a rule, Baltimore makes no attempt to prolong the argument. He has always let her go, with a sneering word, perhaps, or a muttered exclamation, but to-day he follows her, and stepping between her and the door, bars her departure. By heavens, you shall hear me, says he, his face dark with anger. I will not submit any longer, in silence, to your insolent treatment of me. You condemn me, but I tell you, it is I who should condemn do you think I believe in your present attitude towards me? Pretend as you will, even to yourself, in your soul, it is impossible that you should give credence 
to that old story, false as it is old. No, you cling to it to mask the feet you have tired of me. Let me pass. Not until you have heard me. With a light but determined grasp of her arm, he presses her back into the chair she has just quitted. That story was a lie, I tell you. Before our marriage, I confess, there were things, not credible, to which I plead guilty, but— Oh, be silent, cries she, putting up her hand impulsively to check him. There is open disgust and horror on her pale, severe face. Before, before our marriage, persists he passionately. What, do you think there is no temptation, no sin, no falling away from the stern path of virtue in this life? Are you so mad or so ignorant as to believe that every man you meet could show a perfectly clean record of— I cannot, I will not listen, interposes she, springing to her feet, white and ignorant. There is nothing to hear. I am not going to pollute your ears, says he with a curl of his lip. Pray be reassured. What I only wish to say is that if you condemn me for a few past sins, you should condemn also half your acquaintances. That, however, you do not do. For me alone, for your husband, you reserve all your resentment. What are the others to me? What am I to you, for the matter of that? With a bitter laugh, if they are nothing, I am less than nothing. You deliberately flung me aside all because, why, look here, moving toward her in an uncontrollable agitation say i had sinned above the galleons say that lie was true say i had out hooded herod in evil courses still am i past the pale of forgiveness saint as you are have you no pity for me in all your histories of love and peace and perfection is there never a case of poor devil of a sinner like me being taken back into grace absolved pardoned to rave like this is useless there is no good to be got from it you know what i think what i believe you deceived wronged let me go cecil before before repeats he obstinately what that woman told you since, I swear to you, was a most damned lie. I refuse to go into it again. She is deadly pale now. Her bloodless lips almost refuse to let words go through them. You mean by that, that in spite of my oath, you still cling to your belief that I am lying to you? His face is livid. There is something almost dangerous about it. But Lady Baltimore has come of too old and good a race to be frightened into submission. Raising one small slender hand, she lays it upon his breast, and with a little haughty upturning of her shapely head, pushes him from her. I have told you I refuse to go into it, says she with superb self-control. How long do you intend to keep me here? When may I be allowed to leave the room? There is distinct defiance in the clear glance she casts at him. Baltimore draws a long breath and then bursts into a strange laugh. Why, when you will, says he, shrugging his shoulders. He makes a graceful motion of his hand toward the door. Shall I open it for you? But a word still let me say if you are not in too great a hurry. Christianity now, my fair saint, so far as ever I could hear or read, has been made up of mercy. Now you are merciless. Would you mind letting me know how you reconcile one? You perversely mistake me. I am no saint. I do not, coldly, 
profess to be one. I am no such earnest seeker after righteousness as you maliciously represent me. All I desire is honesty of purpose and decent sense of honor, honor that makes decency, that is all. For the rest, I am only a poor woman who loved once, and was, how many times deceived, that probably I shall never know. Her sad, sad eyes looking at him grow suddenly full of tears. Isabel, my meeting with that woman, that time, vehemently, in town was accidental. I, it was the merest chance. Don't, says she, raising her hand, with such a painful repression of her voice as to render it almost a whisper. I have told you it is useless. I have heard too much to believe anything now. I shall never, I think, very sadly, believe in anyone again. You have murdered faith in me. Tell this tale of yours to someone else, someone willing to believe. Two, with a terrible touch of scorn, Lady Swansdown, for example. Why do you bring her into the discussion? asks he, turning quickly to her. Has she heard anything? That scene in the garden that now seems to fill him with self-contempt. Was a bêtise it was, and what did it amount to? Nothing. Lady Swansdown, he is honestly convinced, cares as little for him as he for her, and at this moment it is borne in upon him that he would give the embraces of a thousand such as she for one kind glance from the woman before him. I merely mentioned her as a possible person who might listen to you, with a slight lifting of her shoulders, a mere idle suggestion. You will pardon me saying that this has been an idle discussion altogether. You begin by denouncing my brother to me, and now you have ended by denouncing your husband to me, an idle a beginning as an end, surely. Still, to go back to Beauclerc, I persist in saying he has behaved scandalously in this affair. He has imperiled the poor Charles' good name. You can imperil names, too, says she, turning almost fiercely on him. Lady Swansdown, I suppose, says he, with a bored uplifting of his brows. The old grievance is not sufficient, then. You must have a new one. I am afraid I must disappoint you. Lady Swansdown, I assure you, cares nothing at all for me, and I care just the same amount for her. Since when? Since the world began, if you want a long date. What a liar you are, Baltimore, says his wife, turning to him with a sudden breaking out of all the pent-up passion within her. Involuntarily her hands clench themselves. She is pale no longer. A swift, hot flush has dyed her cheeks. Like an outraged, insulted queen, she holds him a moment with her eyes, then sweeps out of the room. End of chapter 26 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 27 of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter 27 since thou art not as these are go thy ways thou hast no part in all my nights and days lie still sleep on be glad as such things be thou couldst not watch with me luncheon had gone off very pleasantly joyce persuaded 
by lady baltimore had gone down to it feeling a little shy and conscious of a growing headache but everybody had been charmed to her and baltimore in especial had been very careful in his manner of treating her saying little nice things to her and insisting on her sitting next to him a seat hitherto lady swansdon's own the latter had taken this so perfectly that one night being pardoned for thinking it had been arranged beforehand between her and her host at all events lady swansdon was very sympathetic and indeed everybody seemed bent on treating her as a heroine of the highest order joyce herself felt dull nevertheless words did not seem to come easily to her she was tired she thought and of course she was having spent a sleepless night one little manner gave her cause for thankfulness dysart was absent from luncheon he had gone on a long walking expedition lady baltimore said that would prevent his returning home until dinner hour until quite eight o'clock joyce told herself she was glad of this though why she did not tell herself at all events the news left her very silent but her silence was not noticed it could not be indeed so great and so animated was the flow of beauclerc's eloquence without addressing anybody in particular he seemed to address everybody he kept the whole table alive he treated yesterday's adventure as a tremendously amusing affair and invited everyone to look upon it as he did he insisted on describing Miss Kavanagh and himself in the same light as he described them earlier to his sister, as the modern babes in the wood, Mrs. Colney being the robin. He made several of the people who had dropped in to luncheon roar with laughter over his description of that excellent innkeeper. Her sayings, her appearance, her stern notions of morality that induced her to bring them home personally conducted the size of her waist and her heart and many other things he was extremely funny the fact that his sister smiled only when she felt she must to avoid comment and that his host refused to smile at all and that miss kavanagh was evidently on thorns all the time did not for an instant damp his overflowing spirits it is now seven o'clock miss kavanagh on her way upstairs to dress for dinner suddenly remembering that there is a book in the library left by her early in the afternoon on the central table turns aside to fetch it she forgets however what she has come for when having entered the room she sees dysart standing before the fire staring apparently at nothing to her chagrin she is conscious that the unmistakable start she has made on seeing him is known to him i didn't know you had returned says she awkwardly yet made a courageous effort to appear as natural as usual no i knew you had returned says he slowly it is very late to say good morning says she with a poor little attempt at a laugh but still advancing towards him and holding out her hand too late replied he ignoring the hand joyce as if struck by some cruel blow draws back a step or two you are not tired i hope asked dysart courteously oh no she feels stifled choked a desire to get to the door and escape lose sight of him forever is the one strong longing that possesses her but to move requires strength and she feels that her limbs are trembling beneath her it was a long drive however and the storm was severe i fear you must have suffered in some way i have not suffered says she in a dull emotionless way indeed she hardly knows what she says a repetition of his own words seems the easiest thing to bar so she adopts it no 
There is a considerable pause, then. No, it is true. It is I only who have suffered, says Dysart, with an uncontrollable abandonment to the misery that is destroying him. I alone. You mean something, says Joyce. It is by a terrible effort that she speaks. She feels thoroughly unnerved, unstrung, conscious that the nervous shaking of her hands will betray her. She clasps them behind her tightly. You mean something just now when you refuse to take my hand. But what? What? You said it was too late, replies he, and I agreed with you. That was not it, says she feverishly. There was more, much more. Tell me, passionately, what you meant. Why you would not touch me. Why am I to understand? That from henceforth you are free from the persecution of my love, says Dysart deliberately. I was mad ever to hope that you would care for me. Still, I did hope. That has been my undoing. But now, well, demands she faintly. Her whole being seems stunned. Something of all this she had anticipated. But the reality is far worse than any anticipation has been. She has seen him in her thoughts, angry, indignant, miserable, but that he should thus coldly set her aside, bid her an everlasting adieu, be able to make up his mind deliberately to forget her. This had never occurred to her as being even probable. Now you are to understand that the idiotic farce played between us two the day before yesterday is at an end. The curtain is down. It is over. It was a failure. Neither you, nor I, nor the public will ever hear of it again. Is this because I did not come home last evening in the rain and storm? Some small spark of courage has come back to her now. She lifts her head and looks at him. Oh, be honest with me here. In our last hour together, cries he vehemently, you have cheated me all through. Be true to yourself for once. Why pretend it is my fault that we part? Yesterday I implored you not to go for that drive with him, and yet you went. What was I, or my love for you, in comparison with a few hours' drive with that lying scoundrel? It was only the drive I thought of, says she piteously. I, there was nothing else, indeed, and you, if, raising her hand to her throat as if suffocating, if you had not spoken so roughly, so, pshaw, says Dysart, turning from her as if disgusted. To him, in his present furious mood, her grief, her fear, her shrinkings, are all so many movements in the game of coquette, at which she is a past mistress. Will you think me a fool to the end? says he. See here, turning his angry eyes to hers. I don't care what you say. I know you now too late indeed, but still I know you, to the very core of your heart, you are one mass of deceit. A little spasm crosses her face. She leans back heavily against the table behind her. Oh, no, no, she says in a voice so low as to be almost unheard. You will deny, of course, says he mercilessly. You will even have me believe that you regret the past, but you and such as you never regret. Man is your prey. So many scalps to your belt is all you think about. Why, with an accent of passion, what am I to you? Just the filling up of so many hours' amusement. No more. Do you think all my eloquence would have any chance against one of his cursed words? I may kneel at your feet from morning until night, and still I should to be you a thing of naught in comparison with him. 
she holds out her hands to him in a little dumb fashion her tongue seems frozen but he repulses this last attempt at reconciliation it is no good none i have no belief in you left so you can no longer cajole me i know that i am nothing to you nothing if drawing a deep breath through his closed teeth if a thousand years were to go by, I should still be nothing to you if he were near. I give it up. The battle was too strong for me. I am defeated, lost, ruined. You have so arranged it, says she in a low tone, singularly clear. The violence of his agitation has subdued hers and rendered her comparatively calm. You must permit me to contradict you. The arrangement is all your own. Was it so great a crime to stay last night at falling? There is no crime anywhere. That you should have made a decision between two men is not a crime. No, I acknowledge I made a decision, but... When did you make it? Last evening, and I thought you... Oh, no excuses, says he with a frown. Do you think I desire them? He hesitates for a minute or so, and now turns to her abruptly. Are you engaged to him finally? No. No, in accents suggested a surprise so intense as to almost enlarge into disbelief. You refused him then? No, says she again. Her heart seems to die within her. Oh, the sense of shame that overpowers her! A sudden wild terrible hatred of Beauclerk takes her into possession. Why, why had he not given her the choice of saying yes, instead of no, to that last searching question? You mean that he— He stops dead short as if not knowing how to proceed. Then suddenly his wrath breaks forth. And for that scoundrel, that fellow without a heart, you have sacrificed the best of you, your own heart. For him, whose word is as light as his oath, you have flung behind you a love that would have surrounded you to your dying day. Good heavens, what are women made of? But he sobers himself at once as if smitten by some sharp remembrance, and pale with shame and remorse, looks at her. Of course, says he, it is only one heart broken, as I am, who would have dared thus to address you, and it is plain to me now that there are reasons why he should not have spoken before this. For one thing, you were alone with him. For another, you are tired, exhausted. No doubt to-morrow he— How dare you, says she in a voice that startles him, a very low voice, but vibrating with outraged pride. How dare you thus insult me? You seem to think, to think that because, last night, he and I were kept from our home by the storm. She pauses, that old— first odd sensation of choking now again oppresses her. She lays her hand upon the back of a chair near her and presses heavily upon it. You think I have disgraced myself, says she, the words coming in a little gasp from her parched lips. That is why you speak of things being at an end between us. Oh, you wrong me there, says the young man, who has grown ghastly. Whatever I may have said, I— You mean it? says she. She draws herself up to the full height of her young, slender figure, and turning abruptly, moves toward the door. As she reaches it, she looks back at him. You are a coward, she says, in a low, distinct tone, alive with scorn. A coward! End of chapter 27 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.
Chapter Twenty Eight of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter Twenty Eight. I have seen the desire of mine eyes. THE BEGINNING OF LOVE, THE SEASON OF KISSES AND SIGHS, AND THE END THEREOF. Miss Kavanagh put in no appearance at dinner. A chill, whispered Lady Baltimore to everybody, in her kindly sympathetic way, caught during that miserable drive yesterday. She hoped it would be nothing, but thought it better to induce Joyce to remain quiet in her own room for the rest of the evening safe from draughts and dangers attendant on the barring of her neck and arms so told her small story beautifully but omitted to add that joyce had refused to come downstairs and that she had seemed so wretchedly low-spirited that at last her hostess had ceased to urge her she had however spent a good deal of time arguing with her on another subject the girl's fixed determination to go home, to go back to Barbara, next day. Lady Baltimore had striven very diligently to turn her from this purpose, but all to no avail. She had even gone so far as to point out to Joyce that the fact of her thus leaving the court before the expiration of her visit might suggest itself to some people in a very unpleasant light. They might say she has come to the end of her welcome there, being given her congee, in fact, on account of that luckless adventure with her hostess's brother. Joyce was deaf to all such open hints. She remained obstinately determined not to stay a moment longer there than could be helped. Was it because of Norman she was going? No, she shook her head with such a look of contemptuous indifference that Lady Baltimore found it impossible to doubt her, and felt her heart thereby lightened. Was it Felix? Miss Kavanagh had evidently resented that question at first, but finally had broken into a passionate fit of tears, and when Lady Baltimore placed her arms round her, had not repulsed her. But, dear Joyce, he himself is leaving to-morrow. Oh, let me go home. Do not ask me to stay. I am more unhappy than I can tell you, said the girl brokenly. You have had a quarrel with him. Joyce bowed her head in a little quick, impatient way. It is Felix, then, Joyce, not Norman. Let me say I am glad, for your sake, though it is a hard thing for a sister to say of her brother. But Norman is selfish. It is his worst fault, perhaps but a bad one. As for this little misunderstanding with Felix, it will not last. He loves you, dearest, most honestly. You will make up this tiny— Never, said Joyce, interrupting her and releasing herself from her embrace. Her young face looked hard and unforgiving, and Lady Baltimore, with a sigh, decided on saying— no more just then. So she went downstairs and told her little tale about Joyce's indisposition, and was believed by nobody. They all said they were sorry, as in duty bound. Perhaps they were, taking their own view of her absence. But dinner went off extremely well, nevertheless, and was considered quite a success. Dysart was present, and was apparently in very high spirits, so high, indeed, that at odd moments his hostess, knowing a good deal, stared at him. He, who was usually so silent a member, to-night outshone even the versatile Beauclerk, in the lightness and persistency of his conversation. This sudden burst of animation lasted him throughout the evening, carrying him triumphantly across the hour and a half of drawing-room small talk, 
and even lasting till the more careless hours in the smoking-room have come to an end, and one by one the men have yawned themselves off to bed. Then it died, so entirely, so forlornly as to prove it had been only a mere passing, and enforced exhilaration after all. They were all gone. There was no need now to keep up the miserable farce, to seek to prevent their coupling her name with his, and therefore discovering the secret of her sad seclusion. As Dysart found himself almost the last man in the room, he too rose, reluctantly, as though unwilling to give himself up to the solitary musings that he knew lay before him, the self-umbraidings, the vague remorse, the terrible dread lest he had been too severe, that he knows will be his all through the silent darkness. For what have slept and he to do with each other to-night? He bade his host good-night, and with a pretense of going upstairs, turned aside into the deserted library, and choosing a book, flung himself into a chair, determined, if possible, to read his brain into a state of coma. Twelve o'clock had struck, slowly, painfully, as if the old timekeeper is sleepy too, and is nodding over his work, and now one, as slowly, truly, but with the startling brevity that prevents one's dwelling on its drowsy note, Dysart, with a tired groan, flings down his book, and rising to his feet, stretches his arms above his head in an utter abandonment to sleepless fatigue that is even more mental than bodily. Once the subject of that book had been of an enthralling interest to him. Tonight it bores him. He has found himself unequal to the solving of the abstruse arguments it contains. One thought seems to have dulled all others. He is leaving tomorrow. He is leaving her tomorrow. Oh, surely it is more than the curt pronoun can contain. He is leaving, in a few short hours, his life, his hope, his one small chance of heaven upon earth. How much she had been to him! How strong his hoping, even against hope, had been! He never knew till now, when all is swept out of his path for ever. The increasing stillness of the house seems to weigh upon him, rendering even gloomier his melancholy thoughts. How intolerably quiet the night is! Not even a breath of wind is playing in the trees outside. On such a night as this ghosts might walk and demons work their will. There is something ghastly in this unnatural cessation of all sound, all movement. What a strange power, says Emerson, there is in silence, an old idea yet always new. Who is there who has not been affected by it? has not known that curious, senseless dread of spirits present from some unknown world that very young children often feel. Fear came upon me and trembling, which made all my bones to shake, says Job in one of his most dismal moments, and now to Dysart this strange, unaccountable chill feeling comes, insensibly born of the hour and the silence only, and with no smallest dread of things intangible. The small clock on the mantelpiece sends forth a tiny chime, so delicate that in broad daylight, with broader views in the listeners, it might have gone unheard. Now it strikes upon the motionless air as loudly as though it were the crack of doom. Poor little clock, struggling to be acknowledged for twelve long years of nights and days, now is your revenge the fruition of all your small, ambitious desires. Dysart starts violently at the sound of it. It is of importance, this little clock. It has wakened him to real life again. He has taken a step toward the door and the bed, the very idea of which to this has been treated 
by him with ignominy, when a sound in the hall outside stays him, an unmistakable step, but so light as to suggest the idea of burglars. Dysart's spirits rise, the melancholy of the moment since deserts him. He looks round for the poker, that national universal mode of defense when our castles are invaded by the masked men. He has not time, however, to reach it before the handle of the door is slowly turned, before the door is as slowly opened, and— What is this? For a second Dysart's heart seems to stop beating. He can only gaze spellbound at this figure, clad all in white, that walks deliberately into the room, and seemingly directly toward him. It is Joyce. Joyce! End of chapter 28 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 29 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 29 Sleep, and if life was bitter to thee, pardon. If sweet, give thanks, thou hast no more to live, and to give thanks is good, and to forgive. Is she dead or still living? Dysart, calm now, indeed, gazes at her with a heart contracted, Great heaven, how like death she looks, and yet he knows she is still in the flesh. How strangely her eyes gleam, a dull gleam and so passionless. Her brown hair, not altogether fallen down her back, but loosened from its hairpins, and hanging in a soft heavy knot behind her head, gives an additional pallor to her already too white face. The open eyes are looking straight before them, unseeing. Her step is slow, mechanical, unearthly. It is only indeed when she lays the candle she holds upon the edge of the table, the extreme edge, that he knows she is asleep, and walking in a dreamland that to waking mortals is inaccessible. Silently, and always with that methodical step, she moves towards the fireplace, and still a little further, until she stands on that eventful spot where he had given up all claim to her, and thrown her back upon herself. There is the very square on the carpet where she stood some hours ago. There she stands now. To her right is the chair on which she had leaned in great bitterness of spirit, trying to evoke help and strength from the dead oak. Now, in her dreams, as if remembering that past scene, she puts out her hands a little vaguely, a little blindly, and the chair, not being where in her vision she believes it to be, she gropes vaguely for it in a troubled fashion, the little trembling hands moving nervously from side to side. It is a very sad sight. The sadder for, the mournful change that crosses the face of the sleeping girl. The lips take a melancholy curve. The long lashes droop over the sightless eyes. A long, sad sigh escapes her. Dysart, his heart beating wildly, makes a movement toward her. Whether the sound of his impetuous footstep disturbs her dream, or whether the coming of her fingers in sudden contact with the edge of the table does it, who can tell? She starts and wakens. At first she stands as if not understanding, and then, with a terrified expression in her now sentient eyes, looks hurriedly around her. Her eyes meet Dysart's. Don't be frightened, begins he quickly. How did I come here? interrupts she, in a voice panic-stricken. I was upstairs. I remember nothing. It was only a moment since that I—was I asleep? 
she gives a hastily furtive glance at the pretty loose white garment that enfolds her i suppose so says dysart you must have had some disturbing dream and it drove you down here it is nothing many people walk in their sleep but i never oh what is it says she as if appealing to him to explain herself to herself was faintly flushing any one else here did any one see me no one they are all in bed all asleep and you doubtfully i couldn't sleep returns he slowly gazing fixedly at her i must go says she feverishly she moves rapidly toward the door her one thought seems to be to get back to her own room she looks ill unstrung frightened this new phase in her has alarmed her what if for the future she cannot even depend upon herself cannot know where her mind will carry her when deadly sleep has fallen upon her it is a hateful thought and to bring her here where he was what power has he over her oh the sense of relief in thinking that she will be at home to-morrow safe with barbara her hand is on the door she is going joyce says dysart suddenly sharply all his soul is in his voice so keenly it rings that involuntarily she turns to him great agony must make itself felt and to dysart seeing her on the point of leaving him for ever it seems as though his life is being torn from him in truth she is his life the entire happiness of it if she goes through that door unforgiving she will carry with her all that makes it bearable she is looking at him her eyes are brilliant with nervous excitement her face pale her very lips have lost their color yes says she interrogatively impatiently i am going away to-morrow i shall not yes yes i know i am going too i shall not see you again i hope not i think not she makes another step forward opening the door with a little light touch she places one hand before the candle and peers timidly into the dark hall outside don't let that be your last word to me says the young man passionately joyce hear me there must be some excuse for me excuse says she looking back at him over her shoulder her lovely face full of curious wonder yes yes i was mad i didn't mean a word i said i swear it i joyce forgive me the words though whispered burst from him with a despairing vehemence he would have caught her hand but that she lifts her eyes to his such eyes there is a little pause and then oh no never never says she her tone is very low and clear not angry not even hasty or reproachful only very sad and certain it kills all hope she goes quickly through the open doorway closing it behind her the faint ghostly sound of her footfalls can be heard as she crosses the hall after a moment even this light sound ceases she is indeed gone it is all over with a kind of desire to hide herself joyce has crept into her bed sore at heart angry miserable no hope that sleep will again visit her has led her to this step and indeed would sleep be desirable what a treacherous part it had played when last it fell on her how grieved he looked how white he was evidently most honestly sorry for all the unkind things he had said to her not that he had said many indeed only he had looked them and she she had been very hard oh too hard however there was an end to it to-morrow would place more miles between them in every way that would ever be recrossed he would not come here again until he had forgotten her 
married, probably. They would not meet. There should be have been comfort in that certainty. But, alas, when she sought for it, it eluded her. It was not there. In spite of the trick Somnus had just played her, she would now gladly have courted him again, if only to escape from ever-growing regret. But though she turns from side to side in a vain endeavor to secure him, that cruel god persistently denies her, and with mournful memories and tired eyes she lies, watching, waiting for the tender breaking of the dawn upon the purple hills. Slowly, slowly comes up the sun, coldly and with a tremendous lingering, the light shines on land and sea, then sounds the bursting chants of birds, the rush of streams, the gentle sighings of the winds through herb and foliage. Joyce, thankful for the blessed daylight, flings the clothes aside, and with languid step and eyes, sad always, but grown weary too, with sleeplessness and thoughts unkind, moves lightly to the window. Throwing wide the casement, she lets the cool morning air flow in. A new day has arisen. What will it bring her? What can it bring? Safe disappointment only and vain regret. Oh, why must she, of all people, be thus unblessed upon this blessed morn? Never has the sun seemed brighter, the whole earth a greater glow of glory. Welcome the Lord of light and lamp of day. Welcome fosterer of tender herbus green. Welcome quickener of florist flowers sheen. Welcome depainter of the bloomit means. Welcome the life of everything that spreads. Yet to Joyce welcome to the rising sun seems impossible. What is the good of day when hope is dead? In another hour or two she must rise, go downstairs, talk, laugh, and appear interested in all that is been said, and with a heart at variance with joy, a poor heart, heavy as lead. A kind of despairing rage against her crooked fortune moves her. Why has she been thus unlucky? Why at first should a foolish, vagrant feeling have led her to think so strongly of one unworthy and now hateful to her as to prejudice her in the mind of one really worthy. What madness possesses her? Surely she is the most unfortunate girl alive. A sense of injustice brings the tears into her eyes and blots out the slowly widening landscape from her view. How happy some or other some can be! Her thoughts run to Barbara and Monkton. They are happy in spite of many frowns from fortune. They are poor, as society counts poverty, but the want of money is not a cardinal evil. They love each other, and the children are things to be loved as well. Darling children, well grown and strong and healthy, though terrible little Turks at times. God bless them! Oh, that she could count herself as blessed as Barbara, whose greatest trouble is to deny herself this and that, to be able to pay for the other thing. No, to be poor is not to be unhappy. Our happiness in this world, says a writer, depends on the affections we are able to inspire. Truly she, Joyce, has not been successful in her quest. For if he had loved her, would he ever have doubted her? Perfect love, says the oldest, grandest testimony of all, casteth out fear. And he had feared, sitting here in the dawning daylight, the tears ran softly down her cheeks. It is a strange thing, but true, that never once during this whole night's dreary vigil do her thoughts once turn to Beauclerk. End of chapter 29 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 30 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford Chapter 30 Oh, there's stony a leaf in Athol Wood, And mony a bird in its breast, And mony a pain may the heart sustain, Er it sab itself to rest. Barbara meets her on the threshold and draws her with loving arms into the dining-room. I knew you would be here at this hour. Lady Baltimore wrote me word about it, and I have sent the chicks away to play in the garden, as I thought you would like to have a comfortable chat just at first. Lady Baltimore wrote? Yes, dear, just to say you were distressed about that unfortunate affair that drive, you know, and that you felt you wanted to come back to me. I was glad you wanted that, darling. You are not angry with me, Barbara? asked the girl, loosening her sister's arms the better to see her face. Angry? No, how could I be angry? said Mrs. Monkton, the more vehemently in that she knows she had been very angry just at first. It was the merest chance. It might have happened to anybody. One can't control storms. No, that's what Mrs. Connolly said. Only she called it the eliminance, says Joyce, with quite a little ghost of a smile. Well, now you are home again, and it is all behind you, and there is really nothing in it. And you must not think so much about it, says Barbara fondling her hand. Lady Baltimore says you are too unhappy about it. Did she say that? What else did she say? asked the girl, regarding her sister with searching eyes. What had Lady Baltimore told her? That impulsive admission to the latter last night had been troubling Joyce ever since, and now to have lay bare her heart again, to acknowledge her seeming fickleness to receive Barbara's congratulation on it, only to declare that this second lover has, too, been placed by fate outside her life, seems too bitter to her. Oh, no, she cannot tell Barbara. Why, nothing, says Mrs. Monkton, who is now busying herself removing the girl's hat and furs. What was there to tell, after all? She is plainly determined to treat the matter lightly. Oh, there is a good deal, says Joyce bitterly. Why don't you tell me, turning suddenly upon her sister, that you knew how it would be all along, that you distrusted that Mr. Beauclerk from the very first, and that Felix Dysart was always worth a thousand of him? There is something that is almost defiant in her manner. "'Because, for one thing, I very seldom call him Felix,' says Mrs. Monkton, with a smile, alluding to the last accusation, "'and because, too, I can't bear the I told you so persons. You mustn't class me with them, Joyce, whatever you do. I shan't be able to do much more, at all events,' says Joyce presently. "'That's one comfort.' not only for myself but for my family. I expect I have excelled myself this time. Well, with a dull little laugh, it will have to last so. Joyce, says her sister quickly, tell me one small thing. Mr. Beauclerk, he— Yes, stonily, as Barbara goes on a rock. You, you are not engaged to him— Joyce breaks into an angry laugh. That is what you all ask, says she. There is no variety, none. No, no, no. I am engaged to nobody. Nobody wants me, and I... I care for nobody, not I, for nobody cares for me. Mark the heavy emphasis on the four. I beg you, Barbara... She breaks entirely from her sister's hold and springs to her feet. 
"'You are tired,' says Mrs. Monkton, anxiously rising, too. "'Why don't you say what you really mean?' says Joyce, turning almost fiercely to her. "'Why pretend you think I am fatigued when you honestly think I am miserable? "'Because Mr. Beauclerk has not asked me to marry him. "'No, I don't care what you think. I am miserable. "'And though I were to tell you over and over again it was not because of him, "'you would not believe me, so I will say nothing. "'Here is Freddy,' says Mrs. Monkton nervously, who has just seen her husband's head pass the window. He enters the room almost as she speaks. Well, Joyce, back again, says he affectionately. He kisses the girl warmly. Horrid drive you must have had through that storm. You, too, blame the storm, then, and not me, says Joyce with a smile. Everybody doesn't take your view of it. It appears I should have returned. In all that rain and wind and— Pshaw! Never listen to extremists, says Mr. Monkton, sinking lazily into the chair. They will land you on all sorts of barren coasts if you give ear to them. For my part, I never could see why two people of opposite sexes, if overcome by nature's artillery, should not spend a night under a wayside inn without calling down upon them the social artillery of gossip. There is only one thing in the whole affair, says Mr. Monkton seriously, that has given me a moment's uneasiness. And that, says Joyce nervously, is how I can possibly be second to both of them. Dysart, I confess, has my sympathies, but if Beauclerk were to appear first upon the field and implore my assistance, I feel I should have a delicacy about refusing him. Freddy, says his wife reprovingly. Oh, as for that, says Joyce with a frown, I do think men are the most troublesome things on earth. She burst out presently. When one isn't loving them, one is hating them. How many of them at a time? asks her brother-in-law with deep interest. Not more than two, Joyce, please. I couldn't grasp any more. My intellect is of a very limited order. So is mine, I think, says Joyce with a little tired sigh. Monkton, although determined to treat the matter lightly, looks very sorry for her. Evidently she is out of joint with the whole world at present. How did Lady Baltimore take it? asks he, with all the careless air of one asking a question on some unimportant subject. She was angry with Mr. Beauclerk for not leaving me at the inn and coming home himself. Unsisterly woman! She was quite right after all, said Mrs. Monkton, who had defended Beauclerk herself, but cannot bear to hear another take his part. And Dysart? How did he take it? asked Monkton, smiling. I don't see how he should take it, anyway, says Joyce coldly. Not even with soda water? says, his, says her brother-in-law. Of course it would be too much to expect him to take it neat. You broke it gently to him, I hope. Ah, you don't understand, Mr. Dysart, says the girl, rising abruptly. I did not understand him until yesterday. So he is very obtruse? He is very insolent, says Miss Kavanagh, with a sudden touch of fire that makes her sister look at her with some uneasiness. I see, says Mr. Monkton slowly. He still, unfortunately, looks amused. One does not know anybody until he or she gives way to a towering passion. So he gave you a right good scolding for being caught in the rain with Beauclerk. A little unreasonable, surely, but lovers never yet were famous for their common sense. That little ingredient was forgotten in their composition. And so he gave you a lecture. Well, he was not likely to do it again says she slowly. No, then it is more than likely than I shall be the one to be scolded presently. 
he won't be able to content himself with silence. He will want to air his grievances, to revenge them on some one, and if you refuse to see him, I shall be that one. There is really only one shall small remark to be made about this whole matter, said Mr. Monkton, with a rueful smile, and it remains for me to make it. If you will encourage two suitors at the same time, my good child, the least you may expect is trouble. You are bound to look out for breakers ahead, but, and this is the remark, it is very hard lines for a fourth and most innocent person to have those suitors dropped straight on him without a second's notice. I am not a born warrior. The brunt of the battle is a sort of gaiety that I confess myself unsuited for. I haven't been educated up to it. I— There will be no battle, says Joyce, in a strange tone, because there will be no combatants. For a battle there must be something to fight for, and here there is nothing. You are all wrong, Freddy. You will find out that after a while. I have a headache, Barbara, I think— raising her lovely but pained eyes to her sister, I should like to go into the garden for a little bit. The air there is always so sweet. Go, darling, says Barbara, whose own eyes have filled with tears. Oh, Freddy, turning reproachfully to her husband as the door closes on Joyce, how could you so have taken her? You must have seen how unhappy she was— and all about that horrid Beauclerk. Monkton stares at her. So that is how you read it, says he at last. There is no difficulty about the reading. Could it be in larger print? Large enough, certainly, as to the unhappiness, but for Beauclerk, I should advise the printer to insert Dysart. Dysart? Felix? Unless, indeed, you could suggest a third. Nonsense, says Mrs. Monkton, contemptuously. She has never cared for poor Felix. How I wish she had. He is worth a thousand of the other, but the girls are so perverse. They are. That is just my point, says her husband. Joyce is so perverse that she won't allow herself to see that it is Dysart she preferred. However, there is one comfort. She is paying for her perversity. Freddy, says his wife after a long pause, do you really think that? What? The girls are perverse? No, no, that she likes Felix best. That is indeed my fixed belief. Oh, Freddy, cries his wife, throwing herself into his arms. How beautiful of you. I've always wanted to think that but never could until now, now that my clear judgment has been brought to bear upon it. Quite right, my dear, always regard your husband as sort of demigod, who, poof, says she, do you think I was born without a grain of sense? But really, Freddy, oh, if it might be, poor, poor darling, how sad she looked, if they have had a serious quarrel over the drive with that detestable Beauclerk, why, I— Here she burst into tears, and with her face buried on Monkton's waistcoat, makes little wild dabs at the air with a right hand that is only to be appeased by having Monkton's handkerchief thrust into it. "'What a baby you are,' says he, giving her a loving little shake." I declare, you were well named. The swift transitions from the tremendous Barbara to the inconsequent baby takes but an instant, and exactly expresses you. A moment ago you are bent on withering me. Now I am going to wither you. Oh, no, don't, says she, half laughing, half crying. And besides, it is you who are inconsequent. You never keep to one point for a second. Why should I, says he, when it is such a disagreeable one? There let us give up for the day. We can write 
to be continued after it, and begin a fresh chapter to-morrow. Meantime, Joyce making her way to the garden with the hope of finding there, at all events, silence, an opportunity for thought, seats herself upon a garden chair, and gives herself up a willing prey to melancholy. She has desired to struggle against this evil, but it has conquered her, and tears rising beneath her lids are falling on her cheeks, when two small creatures emerging from the summer house on her left catch sight of her. They had been preparing for a rush, a real redshank, painted and feathered, descent upon her, when something in her sorrowful attitude becomes known to them. Fun dies within their kind little hearts. Their joys has come home to them. That is a matter for joy. But their joys has come home unhappy. That is a matter for grief. Step by step, hand in hand, they approach her, and even at the very last, with their little breasts overflowing with the delight of getting her back, it is with a very gentle precipitation that they throw themselves upon her, and it never occurs to them either to trouble her for an explanation. No probing questions issue from their lips. She is sorry, that is all. It is enough for their sympathies. Too much. Joyce herself is hardly aware of the advent of the little comforters, until two small arms steal around her neck, and she finds Mabel's face pressed close against her own. "'Let me kiss her, too,' says Tommy, trying to brush his sister away, and resenting openly the fact of her having secured the first attempt at consolation. "'You mustn't tease her. She's sorry. She's very sorry about something,' says Mabel, turning up Joyce's face with her pink palm. "'Aren't you, Joyce? There's droppies in your eye.' "'A little darling,' says Joyce brokenly. "'Then I'll be sorry with you,' says the child, with all childhood's divine intuition, that to sorrow alone is to know a double sorrow. She hugs Joyce more closely with her tender arms, and Joyce, after a battle with her braver self, gives way and breaks into bitter tears. There now, you've made her cry right out. You're a naughty girl, says Tommy to his sister in a raging tone, meant to hide the fact that he too, himself, is on the point of given way. In fact, another moment sees him dissolved in tears. Never mind, Joycey, never mind, we love you, sobs he, getting up on the back of the seat behind her, and making a very excellent attempt at strangulation. Do you? There doesn't seem to be any one else then but you, says poor Joyce, dropping Mabel onto her lap and Tommy more to the front, and clasping them both to her with a little convulsive movement. Perhaps the good cry she has on top of those two loving little heads does her more good than anything else could possibly have done. End of chapter 30 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 31 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford Chapter 31 A bitter and perplexed, what shall I do? Is worse to man than worse necessity. Three months have come and gone, and winter is upon us. It is close on Christmas-tide indeed. All the trees lie bare and desolate. The leaves have fallen from them, and their sweet denizens, the birds, flown or dead. Evening has fallen. The children are in the nursery, having a last romp before bed hour. 
their usual happy hunting ground for that final fling is the drawing-room but finding the atmosphere there to-night distinctly cloudy they had beaten a simultaneous retreat to bridget and the battered old toys upstairs children like rats dislike discomfort mrs monkton sitting before the fire that keeps up a continuous sound as musical as the rippling of a small stream is leaning back in her chair her pretty forehead puckered into a thousand doubts joyce near her is as silent as she is while mr monkton after a vain pretence at being absorbed in the morning paper diligently digested at eleven this morning flings it impatiently on the floor what's the good of your looking like that barbara if you were compelled to accept this invitation from my mother i could see some reason for your dismal glances but when you know i am as far from wishing you to accept it as you are yourself why should ah but are you says his wife with a swift dissatisfied glance at him the dissatisfaction is a good deal directed towards herself if you could make her sure of that says joyce softly i have tried to explain it to her but i suppose i am unreasonable says barbara rising with a little laugh that it has a good deal of grief in it i suppose i ought to believe turning to her husband that you are dying for me to refuse this invitation from the people who have covered me with insult for eight years when i know well that you are dying for me to accept it oh if you know that says monkton rather feebly it must be confessed this fatally late desire on the part of his people to become acquainted with his wife and children has taken hold of him has lived with him through the day not for anything he personally could possibly gain by it but because of a deep desire he has that they his father and mother should see and know his wife and learn to admire her and love her of course i know it says barbara almost fiercely do you think i have lived with you all these years and cannot read your heart don't think i blame you freddy if the cases were reversed i should feel just like you i should go at any lengths to be at one with my own people i don't want to go to even the shortest length says mr monkton as if a little nettled he takes up the dull old local paper again and begins a third severe examination of it but mrs monkton feeling that she cannot survive another silence lays her hand upon it and captures it let us talk about it freddy says she it will only make you more unhappy oh no i think not it will do her good says joyce anxiously where is the letter i hardly saw it who is asked demands barbara feverishly nobody in particular except you my father has expressed a wish that we should occupy that house of his in harley street for the winter months and my mother puts in accidentally as it were that she would like to see the children but you are the one specifically alluded to they are too kind says barbara rather unkindly to herself i quite see it in your light it is an absolute impertinence says monkton with a suppressed sigh i allow all that in fact i am with you barbara although why keep me thinking about it put it out of your head it requires nothing more than a polite refusal i shall hate to make it polite says barbara and then recurring to her first and sure knowledge of his secret desires you want to go to them i shall never go without you returns he gravely ah that is almost a challenge says she flushing barbara perhaps he is right says joyce gently as she speaks she gets up from the fire and makes her way to the door and from that to her own room 
"'Will you go without me?' says Barbara, when she has gone, looking at her husband with large, earnest eyes. "'Never. You say you know me thoroughly, Barbara. Why then ask the question?' "'Well, you will never go then,' says she, "'for I—I I will never enter those people's doors.' "'I couldn't, Freddy. It would kill me. She has kept up her defiant attitude so successfully and for so long that Mr. Monkton is now electrified when she suddenly bursts into tears and throws herself into his arms. "'You think me a beast,' says she, clinging to him. "'You are tired. You are bothered. Give it up, darling,' says he, patting her on the back, the most approved modern plan of reducing people to a stale of common sense. "'But you do think it, don't you?' No, Barbara, there now, be a good, sensible girl, and try to realize that I don't want you to accept this invitation, and that I am going to write to my mother in the morning to say it is impossible for us to leave home just now, as, as a, oh, anything will do, as baby is not very well. That's the usual polite thing, eh? Oh, no, don't say that says Mrs. Monkton, in a little frightened tone. It's, it's unlikely. It might, I'm not a bit superstitious, Freddy, but it might affect Baby in some way, do him some harm. Very well, we'll tell another lie, says Mr. Monkton cheerfully. We'll say you've got the neuralgia badly, and that the doctor says it would be as much as your life is worth to cross the channel at this time of year. "'That will do very well,' says Mrs. Monkton readily. "'But I am not a bit superstitious,' says he solemnly. "'But it might affect you in some way, do you some harm, "'and if you are going to make a jest of it, Freddy, "'it is you who made the jest. "'Well, never mind, I accept the responsibility "'and will create even another turry-diddle. If I say we are disinclined to leave home just now, will that do? Yes, says she, after a second struggle with her better self, in which it comes off the loser. That's settled, then, said Mr. Monkton. Peace with honor is assured. Let us forget that unfortunate letter, and all the appurtenances thereof. Yes, do let us, Freddy, says she, as if with all her heart. But the morning convinces Monkton that the question of the letter still remains unsettled. Barbara, for one thing, has come down to breakfast gowned in her very best morning frock, one reserved for those rare occasions when people drop in overnight and sleep with them. She has, indeed, all the festive appearance of a person who expects to be called away at a second's notice in a very vertex of dissipation. Joyce, who is quite as impressed as Monkton with her appearance, gazes at her with a furtive amazement, and both she and Monkton wait in a sort of studied silence to know the meaning of it. They aren't given long to possess their souls in patience. Freddy, I don't think Mabel ought to have any more jam, says Mrs. Monkton presently, or Tommy either. She looks at the children as she speaks and sighs softly. It will cost a great deal, says she. The jam, says her husband, well, really, at the rate they are consuming it, I, oh, no, the railway, the boat, the fare, the whole journey, says she. The journey, says Joyce. Why, to England, to take them over there to see their grandmother, says Mrs. Monkton calmly. But Barbara... "'Well, dear, I thought—' "'Barbara, I really consider that question decided,' says her husband. "'Not severely, however. "'Is the dearest wish of his heart to be accomplished at last? "'I thought you had finally made up your mind to refuse my mother's invitation.' "'I shall not refuse it,' says she slowly. "'Whatever you may do, I—' "'You said you didn't want to go,' said his wife severely. "'But I have been thinking it over, and—' 
Her tone has changed, and a slight touch of pink has come into her pretty cheeks. After all, Freddy, why should I be the one to keep you from your people? You aren't keeping me. Don't go on that. Well, then, will you go by yourself and see them? Certainly not. Not even if I give you the children to take over? Not even then. You see, says she with a sort of sad triumph, I am keeping you from them. What I mean is that if you had never met me, you would now be friends with them. I'd a great deal rather be friends with you, says he, struggling wildly, but firmly with a mutton chop that has been done to death by a bad cook. I know that, in a low and troubled tone, but I know, too, that there is always unhappiness where one is on bad terms with one's mother and father. My dear girl, I can't say what bee you have got in your bonnet now, but I beg you to believe I am perfectly happy at this present moment, in spite of this confounded chop that has been done to a chip. God sends meat, the devil sends cooks. That's not a prayer, Tommy. You need not commit it to memory. But there's God and the devil in it, says Tommy skeptically. That always means prayers. Not this time, and you can't pray to both. Your mother has taught you that. You should teach her something in return. That's only fair, isn't it? She knows everything, says Tommy dejectedly. It is quite plain to his hearers that he regrets his mother's universal knowledge, that he would have dearly liked to give her a lesson or two. Not everything, says his father. For example, she cannot understand that I am the happiest man in the world. She imagines I should be better off if she was somebody else's wife and somebody else's mother. Whose mother? demands Tommy, his eyes growing round. Ah, that's just it. You must ask her. She is evidently some a rare pence. Freddy, says his wife in a low tone. Well, what am I to think? You see, to Tommy, who is now deeply interested, if she wasn't your mother, she'd be somebody else's. No, she wouldn't, breaks in Tommy indignantly. I wouldn't let her. I'd hold on to her. I, with his mouth full of strawberry jam, yet striving nobly to overcome his difficulties of expression, I'd beat her. You shouldn't usurp my privileges, says his father mildly. Barbara, says Joyce, at this moment, if you have decided on going to London, I think you have decided wisely, and it may not be such an expense after all. You and Freddy can manage the two eldest children very well on the journey, and I can look after Baby until you return, or else take Nurse and leave Baby entirely to me. Mrs. Monkton makes a quick movement. End of chapter 31 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 32 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica Rolly. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter 32. And I go to brave a world I hate, and woo it o'er and o'er, and tempt a wave and try a fate upon a stranger shore. I shall take the three children and you too, or I shall not go at all, says she, addressing her sister with an air of decision. If you have really made up your mind about it, says Mr. Monkton, I agree with you. The house in Harley Street is big enough for a regiment, and my mother says the servants will be in it on our arrival if we accept the invitation. Joyce will be a great comfort to us and a help on the journey over. The children are so fond of her. Joyce turns her face to her brother-in-law and smiles in a little pleased way. 
she has been so grave of late that they welcome a smile from her now at any time and even court it the pretty lips erstwhile so prone to laughter are now too serious by far when therefore monkton or his wife go out of their way to gain a pleased glance from her and succeed both feel as if they have achieved a victory why have they offered us a separate establishment was there no room for us in their own house asks mrs monkton presently i dare say they thought we should be happier so in a place of our own well i dare say we shall she pauses for a moment why are they in town now at this time of year why are they not in their country house ah oh, that is a last thorn in their flesh says monkton with a quick sigh they have had to let the old place to pay my brother's debts he is always a trouble to them this last letter points a greater trouble still and in their trouble they have turned to you to the little grandchildren says joy softly one can understand it oh yes oh you should have told me says barbara flushing as if with pain i am the hardest person alive i think you think it looking directly at her husband i think only one thing of you says mr monkton rising from the breakfast table with a slight laugh it is what i have always thought that you are the dearest and loveliest thing on earth the bantering air he throws into this speech does not entirely deprive it of the truthful tenderness that formed it there he says that ought to take off the gloom of the brow of any well-regulated woman coming as it does from an eight-year-old husband oh you must be older than that says she at which they all laugh together you're wise to go barbara says joyce now in a livelier way as if that last quick unexpected feeling of amusement has roused her to a sharper sense of life if once they see you no you mustn't put up your shoulder like that i tell you if once they looked at you they would feel the measure of their folly i shall end by fancying myself says mrs monkton impatiently and then you will all have fresh work cut out for you the bringing of me back to my proper senses well with a sigh as i have to see them i wish what that there could be a hearty believer in your and joyce's flattery or else that they your people are not so prejudiced against me it will be an ordeal when you are about it with them a few grains of common sense says her husband wrathfully just fancy the folly of an impertinence that condemned a fellow being on no evidence whatsoever neither eye nor ear were brought in as witnesses oh well says she considerably mollified by his defamation of his people i they say they are not so much to be blamed after all and with a little quick laugh at her sister as joyce says my beauties are still unknown to them they will be delighted when they see me they will indeed returns joyce stolidly and so you are really going to take me with you oh i'm glad i haven't spent any of my money this winter barbara i have some therefore i have always wanted to see london it will be a change for the children too says barbara with a troubled sigh i suppose to her husband they will think them very countrified who your mother what do you think of them oh that has got nothing to do with it everything rather you are analyzing them you are exalting an old woman who has been unkind to you at the expense of the children who love you ah oh, she analyzes them because she too loves them says joyce it is easy to pick fault in those who have a real hold upon our hearts for the rest it doesn't concern us how the world regards them it sounds as if it ought to read the other way round says monkton no no to love is to see faults not to be blind to them the old reading is wrong says joyce you are unfair freddy declares his wife with dignity i would not decry the children i am only a little nervous as to their reception when i know that your father and mother are prepared to receive them as my children i know they will get but little mercy at their hands that speech isn't like you says monkton but it is impossible to blame you for it they are the dearest children in the world says joyce don't think of them they must succeed let them alone to fight their own battles you may certainly depend upon tommy says his father for any emergency that calls for fists and heels where battle murder and sudden death are to be locked for tommy will be all there oh i do hope he will be good says his mother 
half amused but plainly half terrified as well two weeks later sees them settled in town in the harley street house that seems enormous and unfriendly to mrs monkton but delightful to joyce and the children who wander from room to room and under her guidance pretend to find bears and lions and boogies in every corner the meeting between barbara and lady monkton had not been satisfactory there had been very little said on either side but a chill that lay on the whole interview had never been thought for a moment barbara had been stiff and cold if entirely polite but not at all the barbara to whom her husband had been up to this accustomed he did not blame her for the change of front under the circumstances but he could hardly fail to regret it and it puzzled him a great deal to know how she did it he was dreadfully sorry about it secretly and would have given very much more than the whole thing was worth to let his father and mother see his wife as she really is the true barbara lady monkton had been stiff too unpardonably so as it was certainly her place to make amends to soften and smooth down the preliminary embarrassment but then she had never been framed for suavity of any sort and an old aunt of monkton's a sister of hers had been present during the interview and had helped considerably to keep up the frigidity of the atmosphere she was not a bad old woman at heart this aunt she had indeed from time to time given up all her own small patrimony to help her sister to get the eldest son out of his many disreputable difficulties she had done this partly for the sake of the good old family names on both sides and partly because the younger george monkton was very dear to her from his early boyhood the scapegrace of the family had been her admiration and still remained so in imagination for years she had not seen him and perhaps this that she considered a grievance was a kindness of vouchsafed to her by providence had she seen the pretty boy of twenty years ago as he now is she would not have recognized him the change from the merry blue-eyed daring lad of the past to the bloated blear-eyed reckless-looking man of to-day would have been a shock too cruel for her to bear but this she was not allowed to realize and so remained true to her belief in him as she remembered him in spite of her many good qualities she was nevertheless a dreadful woman the more dreadful to the ordinary visitor because of the false front she wore and the flashing purchased teeth that shone on her upper jaw she lived entirely with sir george and lady monkton having indeed given them every penny that would have enabled her to live elsewhere perhaps of all the many spites they owned their elder son the fact that his inquisities had inflicted upon them his maternal aunt for the rest of her natural days was the one that rankled keenest she disliked frederick not only intensely but with an openness that had its disadvantages not for any greater reason than that he had behaved himself so far in his journeys through life more credibly than his brother she had always made a point against him of his undutiful marriage and never failed to add fuel to the fire of his father's and mother's resentment about it whenever that fire seemed to burn low altogether she was by no means an amiable old lady and being very hideous into the bargain was not much run after by society generally she wasn't of the least consequence in any way being not only old but very poor yet people dreaded her and would slip away round doors and corners to avoid her tongue she succeeded in spite of all drawbacks in making herself felt and it was only one or two impervious beings such as dicky brown for example who knew the monktons well and was indeed distantly connected with them through his mother who could endure her manners with any attempt at equanimity end of chapter thirty two recording by monica raleigh Chapter thirty three of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica Rolly. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. 
Chapter Thirty Three. Strength wanting judgment and policy to rule, overturneth itself. It was quite impossible, of course, that a first visit to Lady Monkton should be a last from Barbara. Lady Monkton had called on her the very day after her arrival in town, but Barbara had been out then. On the occasion of the latter's return visit, the old woman had explained that going out was a trial to her, and Barbara, in spite of her unconquerable dislike to her, had felt it to be her duty to go and see her now and then. The children, too, had been a great resource. Sir George, especially, had taken to Tommy, who was quite unabashed by the grandeur of the stately, if faded old rooms in the Belgravian mansion, but was full of curiosity and spent his visits to his grandfather, cross-examining him about diverse matters, questionable and otherwise, that tickled the old man and kept him laughing. It had struck Barbara that Sir George had left off laughing for some time. He looked haggard, uneasy, miserable, expectant. She liked him better than she liked Lady Monkton, and, though reserved with bows, relaxed more to him than to her mother-in-law. For one thing, Sir George had been unmistakably appreciative of her beauty and her soft voice and pretty manners. He liked them all. Lady Monkton had probably noticed them quite as keenly, but they had not pleased her. They were indeed an offence. They had placed her in the wrong. As for old Miss Lestrange, the aunt she regarded a young wife from the first, was a dislike she took no pains to conceal. This afternoon, one of many that Barbara has given up to duty, finds her as usual in Lady Monkton's drawing-room listening to her mother-in-law's comments on this and that, and trying to keep up her temper, for Frederick's sake, when the old lady finds fault with her management of the children. The latter, that is Tommy and Mabel, have been sent to the pantomime by Sir George, and Barbara with her husband have dropped in towards the close of the day to see Lady Monkton with a view to recovering the children there and taking them home with them, Sir George having expressed a wish to see the little ones after the play, and hear Tommy's criticisms on it, which he promised himself would be lively. He had already a great belief in the powers of Tommy's descriptions. In the meantime, the children have not returned, and conversation, it must be confessed, languishes. Miss Lestrange, who is present in a cap of enormous dimensions, and a temper calculated to make life hideous to her neighbours, scarcely helps to render more bearable the dullness of everything. Sir George in a corner is buttonholing Frederick and saddening him with last accounts of the scapegrace. Barbara has come to her final pretty speech, silence seems imminent, when suddenly Lady Monkton flings into a bombshell that explodes and carries away with it all fear of commonplace dullness at all events. You have a sister, I believe, says she to Barbara in a tone she fondly, but erroneously, imagines gracious. Yes, says Barbara softly but curtly, the fact that Joyce's existence has never hitherto been alluded to by Lady Monkton renders her manner even colder than usual, which is saying everything. She lives with you? Yes, says Barbara again. Lady Monkton, as if a little put out by the determinate taciturnity of her manner, moves forward on her seat and pulls the lace lappets of her dove grey cap more over the front impatiently. Long, soft lappets they are, falling from a gem of a little cap made of priceless lace and with a beautiful old face beneath to frame. A face like an old miniature and as stern as most of them, but charming for all that, and perfect in every line. Makes herself useful, no doubt, growls Miss Lestrange from the opposite lounge, her evil old countenance glowing with a desire to offend. That's why one harbours one's poor relations, to get something out of them. This is a double-barrel explosion. One barrel for the detested wife of the good Frederick, one for the sister she has befriended to that sister's cost. True, says Lady Monkton, with an uncivil little upward glance at Barbara. For once, because it suits her, she has accepted her sister's argument and determined to take no heed 
of her scarcely veiled insult. She helps you, no doubt, is useful with the children, I hope. Moneyless girls should remember that they are born into the world to work, not to idle. I am afraid she is not as much help to me as you evidently think necessary, says Barbara, smiling but not pleasantly. She is very seldom at home, in the summer at all events. It is abominable to her to think that these hateful old people should regard Joyce, her pretty Joyce, as a mere servant, a sisterly maid of all work. And if not with you, where then? asked Lady Monkton indifferently, and as if more with a desire to keep up the dying conversation that from any acute thirst of knowledge. She stays a good deal with Lady Baltimore, says Barbara, feeling weary and rather disgusted. Ah, indeed, sort of companion. A governess, I suppose. A long pause. Mrs. Monkton's dark eyes grow dangerously bright, and a quick colour springs into her cheeks. No, begins she in a low but dignified tone, and then suppresses herself. She can't. She mustn't quarrel with Freddy's people. My sister is neither companion nor governess to Lady Baltimore, says she icily. She is only her friend. Friend, repeats the old lady, as if not quite understanding. A great friend, repeats Barbara calmly. Lady Monkton's astonishment is even more insulting than her first question. But Barbara has made up her mind to bear all things. They are friends and friends, puts in Miss Lestrange with her most offensive air. A very embarrassing silence falls on this. Barbara would say nothing more, an inborn sense of dignity forbidding her. But this does not prevent a very natural desire on her part to look at her husband, not so much to claim his support as to know if he has heard. One glance assures her that he has. A pause in the conversation with his father has enabled him to hear everything. Barbara has just time to know that his brow is black and his lips ominously compressed before she sees him advance toward his mother. You seem to be very singularly ignorant of my wife's status in society. His beginning is a rather terrible tone when Barbara, with a little graceful gesture, checks him. She puts out her hand and smiles up at him, a wonderful smile under the circumstances. Ah, that is just it, she says sweetly, but with determination. She is ignorant where we are concerned, Joyce and I, if she had only spared time to ask a little question or two. But as it is, the whole speech is purposely vague, but full of contemptuous rebuke, delicately veiled. It is nothing, I assure you, Freddy. Your mother is not to be blamed. She has not understood, that is all. I fail even now to understand, says the old lady with a somewhat tremulous attempt at self-assertion. So do I, says the antique upon the lounge near her, bristling with a wrath so warm that it has unsettled the noble structure on her head and placed it in quite an artful situation right over her left ear. I see nothing to create wrath in the mind of any one, in the idea of a young, uh, she comes to a dead pause. She had plainly been going to say young person, but Frederick's glare had been too much for her. It has frightened her into good behavior, and she changes the obnoxious word into one more complaisant. A young what? demands he imperiously, freezing his aunt with a stony stare. Young girl, returns she, turning down a little, but still betraying malevolence of a very advanced order in her voice and expression. I see nothing derogatory in the idea of a young girl devoid of fortune taking a... Again, she would have said something insulting. The word situation is on her lips, but the venom in her is suppressed a second time by her nephew. Go on, says he sternly. Taking a um, position in a nice family, says she, almost spitting out the words like a bad old cat. She has a position in a very nice family, says Monkton readily, in mine. As companion, friend, playfellow, in fact, anything you like of the light order of servitude. We all serve, my dear aunt, though that idea doesn't seem to have come home to you. We must all be in bondage to each other in this world. The only real freedom is to be gained in the world to come. You have never thought of that. Well, think of it now. To be kind, to be sympathetic, 
to be even commonly civil to people is to fulfill the law's demands you go too far she's old freddy barbara has scarcely time to whisper when the door is thrown open and dicky brown followed by felix dysart enters the room it is a relief to everybody lady monkton rises to receive them with a smile miss lestrange looks into the teapot plainly she can still see some tea leaves there rising she inclines the little silver kettle over them and creates a second deluge she has again made tea may she be forgiven going to give us some tea miss lestrange says dicky bearing down upon her with a beaming face she has given him some before this one can always depend upon you for good cup ah thanks dysart i can recommend this have a cup do no thank you says dysart who has secured a seat next to barbara and is regarding her anxiously while replying to her questions of surprise at seeing him in town at this time of year she is surprised too and a little shocked to see him look so ill dicky is still holding a brilliant conversation with miss lestrange who to him is a joy for ever didn't expect to see me here again so soon eh says he with a cheerful smile there you are wrong returns that spinster in the hoarse croak that distinguishes her the fact that you were here yesterday and couldn't reasonable be supposed to come again for a week made it at once a certainty that you would turn up immediately the unexpected is what always happens where you are concerned one of many my charms says mr brown gaily hiding his untasted cup by a skilful movement behind the sugar bowl verity you know is ever charming i'm a various person therefore i'm charming are you says miss lestrange grimly can you look at me and doubt it demands mr brown deep reproach in his eyes i can returns miss lestrange presenting an uncompromising front i can also suggest to you that those lumps of sugar are meant to put in the cups with the tea not to be consumed wholesale sugar plain is ruinous to the stomach and disastrous to the teeth true true says mr brown absently and both mine are so pretty Miss Lestrange rises to her feet and confronts him with a stony glare. Both what? demands she. Eh, uh, why, both of them, persists Mr. Brown. I think, Richard, that the sooner you return to your hotel, or whatever low hount you have chosen as your present abode, the better it will be for all present. Why so? demands Mr. Brown indignantly. What have I done now? You know very well, sir, says Miss Lestrange. Your language is disgraceful. You take an opportunity of turning an innocent remark of mine, a kindly warning, into a ribald. Good heavens, says he, uplifting brows and hands. I never yet knew it was ribaldry to talk about one's teeth. You were not talking about your teeth, says Miss Lestrange sternly. You said distinctly both of them. Just so, says Dicky. I've only got to. Is that the truth, Richard, with increasing majesty? honest in june says mr brown unabashed and they are out of sight all you can see have been purchased and i shew your dear miss lestrange with anxious earnestness paid for one guinea the entire set a single tooth two and six who'd be without them well i'm sorry to hear it says miss lestrange reseating herself and regarding him still with manifest distrust to lose one's teeth so early in life speaks badly for one's moral conduct anyhow i shan't allow you to destroy your guinea worth i shall remove temptation from your path lifting the sugar bowl she removes it to her right side thus laying bare the fact that mr brown's cup of tea is still full to the brim it is the last stroke drink your tea says she to the stricken dicky in a tone that admits of no delay he drinks it meantime Barbara has been very kind to Felix Dysart, answering his roundabout questions that always have joys as their central meaning. One leading remark of his is to the effect that he is covered with astonishment to find her and Monckton in London. Is he surprised? Well, no doubt, yes. Joyce is in town, too, but she has not come out with her today. Have they been to the theatre? Very often, Joyce especially is quite devoted to it. Do they go much to the picture galleries? Well, to one or two. There is so much to be done, and the children are rather exigent and demand all the afternoon. 
but she had heard joyce say that she was going to-morrow to doré's gallery she thought tommy ought to be shown something more improving than clowns and wild animals and toy shops mr dysart at this point said he thought miss kavanagh was more reflective than one taking a careless view of her might believe barbara laughed do you take the reflective view says she do you recommend me to take the careless one demands he now looking fully at her there's a good deal of meaning in his question, but Barbara declines to recognize it. She feels she has gone far enough in that little betrayal about Doré's gallery. She refuses to take another step. She is already, indeed, a little frightened by what she has done. If Joyce should hear of it, oh! And yet, how could she refrain from giving that small push to so deserving a cause? no no i recommend nothing says she still laughing where are you staying with my cousins the seaton dysarts they had to come up to town about a tooth or a headache or neuralgia or something we shall never quite know what as it has disappeared whatever it is give me london smoke as a perfect cure for most elements it is astonishing what remarkable recoveries it can boost vera and her husband are like a couple of children even the pantomime isn't too much for them that reminds me the children ought to be here by this time says mrs monkton drawing out her watch they went to the afternoon performance i really think anxiously they are very late she has hardly spoken when a sound of little running feet up the stairs outside sets her maternal fears at rest nearer and nearer the sound they stop there is a distant scuffle the door is thrown violently open and tommy and mabel literally fall into the room end of chapter thirty three recording by monica rolly chapter thirty four of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica Rolly. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter 34. Then seemed to me this world far less in size. Likewise it seemed to me less wicked far. Like points in heaven, I saw the stars arise and longed for wings that I might catch a star. Least said, soonest mended. Tommy is on his feet again in no time, and has picked up Mabel before you could say Jack Robinson, and once again, nothing daunted by their ignominious entry, they rush up the room and precipitate themselves upon their mother. This pious act being performed, Thomas sees fit to show some small attention to the other people present. Thomas, says Mr. Brown, when he has shaken hands with him, if you wait much longer without declaring yourself, you will infallibly burst, and that is always a rude thing to do in friend's drawing-room. Speak, Thomas, or die. You are evidently full of information. Well, I won't tell you, says Tommy, naturally indignant at this address. He throws a resentful look at him over his shoulder while making his way to his grandfather. There is a queer sort of sympathy, understanding what you will, between the child and the stern old man. Come here, says Sir George, drawing Tommy to him. Well, and did you enjoy yourselves? Was it all your fancy painted it? Sir George has sunk into a chair with all the heaviness of an old man, and the boy has crept between his knees and is looking up at him with his beautiful little face all aglow. Oh, twas lovely, says he, twas splendid. There was light all over the house. Twas like night, only twas night, and that was grand. And there were heaps of people. A whole town was there. And there were, Grandpa, why did they have lamps there when it was daytime? Because they have no windows in a theatre, says Sir George, patting the little hot, fat hand that is lying on his arm with a strange sensation of pleasure in the touch of it no windows with big eyes opened wide not one then why have we windows asks tommy with an involuntary glance around him why are there windows anywhere it's ever so much nicer without them 
Why can't we have lambs always, like the theatre people? Why, indeed, says Mr. Brown sympathetically. Sir George, I hope you will take your grandson's advice to heart and block up all these absurd windows and let a proper ray of light descend upon us from the honest burner. Who cares for strikes? Not I. Well, Tommy, we'll think about it, says Sir George. And now go on. You saw Bluebeard, says Tommy, almost roaring in the excitement of his delight. A big Bluebeard. And he was just like the pictures of him at home, with his toes curled up and the red towel around his head, and the blue nightgown, and a smitter in his hand. A scimitar, Tommy? suggests his mother gently. Eh? says Tommy. Well, it's all the same, says he after a pause, replete with deep research, and with a truly noble impartiality. It is indeed, says Mr. Brown, open encouragement in his eyes. And so you saw Mr. Bluebeard, and did he see you? Oh, he saw me! cries Mabel in a little whimpering tone. He looked straight into the little house where we were, and I saw his eye, his horrid eye, shaking her small head vigorously. And it ran right into mine, and he began to walk up to me, and I... She stops, her pretty red lips quivering, her blue eyes full of tears. Oh, Mabel was so frightened, says Tommy the bald. She stuck her nose into Nurse's fur cape and roared. I didn't, says Mabel promptly. You did, says Tommy indignant at being contradicted. And she said it would never be worth a farthing ever after and... Well, anyway, you know, Mabel, you didn't like the heads. Oh, no, I didn't. I hated them. They were all hanging to one side. And there was nasty blood and they looked as if they were going to waggle, concludes Mabel with a terrified sob, burying her own head in her mother's lap. Oh. She is too young, says Barbara, nervously clasping her little woman close to her in a quiet, undemonstrative way, but so as to make the child herself feel the protection of her arms. Too young for so dismayal a sight, says Dysart, stooping over and patting Mabel's sunny curls with a kindly touch. He is very fond of children, as are all men, good and bad. I should not have let her go says Mrs. Monkton with self-reproach. Such exhibitions are painful for young minds, however harmless. When she is older, begins Dysart, still caressing the little head. Yes, yes, she is too young, far too young, says Mrs. Monkton, giving the child a second imperceptible hug. One is never too young to learn the miseries of the world, says Miss Lestrange in her most terrible tone. Why should a child be pampered and petted? and shielded from all thoughts of harm and wrong, as though they never existed? It is false treatment. It is a willful deceiving of the growing mind. One day they must wake to all the horrors of the world. They should therefore be prepared for it, steadily, sternly, unyieldingly. What a grand, what a strong nature, says Mr. Brown, uplifting his hands in admiration. You would then advocate the cause of the pantomime? says he, knowing well that the very name of theatre stinks in the nostrils of Miss Estrange. Far be it from me, says she, with a violent shake of her head. May all such disreputable performances come to a bad end, and a speedy one is my devout prayer. But, with a vicious glance at Barbara, I would condemn the parents who would bring their children up in a dark ignorance of the woes and vices of the world in which they must pass their lives. I think, as Mabel has been permitted to look at the pernicious exhibition of this afternoon, she should also be encouraged to look with calmness upon it, if only to teach her what to expect from life. Good heavens, says Mr. Brown in a voice of horror, is that what she has to expect? Rows of decapitated heads, have you had private information, Miss Lestrange? Is the rehearsal of the French Revolution to be performed in London? Do you really believe the poor child is doomed to behold you ahead, carried past the windows on a pike? What's the meaning in the artless prattle of our Thomas just now when he condemned windows as a social nuisance, or... I suppose you think you are amusing, interrupts the spinster malignantly, it is plain that she objects to the idea of her head being on a pike. At all events, 
If you must jest on serious subjects, I desire you, Richard, to leave me out of your silly maunderings. Your will is my law, says Dicky, rising. I leave you. He makes a tragic retreat, and finding an empty chair near Monkton, takes possession of it. I must protest against your opinion, says Dysart, addressing Miss Lestrange with a smile. Children should be regarded as something better than mere lumps of clay to be experimentalized upon. Oh, yes, says Barbara, regarding the spinster gently, but with ill-concealed aversion. You cannot expect any one to agree with you there. I, for one, could not. I don't know that I ever asked you to, says Miss Lestrange, with such open impertinence that Barbara flushes up to the roots of her hair. Silence falls on the room, except for a light conversation being carried on between Dicky and Monkton, both of whom have heard nothing. Lady Monkton looks uncomfortable. Sir George hastens to the rescue. Surely you haven't told us everything, Tommy, says he, giving his grandson a pull toward him. Besides, Mr. Bluebeard, what else was there? Lots of things, says Tommy vaguely, coming back from an eager attention to Miss Lestrange's evil suggestion to a fresh remembrance of his past delights. There was a band, and it shouted. Nurse said it took the roof off her head, but I looked, and her bonnet didn't stir. And there was the harlequin. He was beautiful. He shined like anything. He was all over scales like a trout. A queer fish, says his grandfather. He jumped about and beat things with a little stick he had. And he danced, and there was a window, and he sprang right through it. And he came up again, and wasn't a bit hurt. Not a bit. Oh, it was lovely, Grandpapa, and so was his concubine. His what? says Sir George. His concubine, his sweetheart. That was her name, says Tommy confidently. There's a ghastly silence. Lady Monkton's pale old cheeks colour faintly. Miss Lestrange glares. As for Barbara, she feels the world has at last come to an end. They will be angry with the boy. Her mission to London will have failed. That vague hope of reconciliation through the children that she had yet scarcely allowed to herself. Needed to be said that Mr. Brown has succumbed to secret but disgraceful mirth. A good three-quarters of a full-sized handkerchief is already in his mouth. A little more of the cambric and desperate suffocation will adorn the columns of the times in the morning. Sir George, too, what is the matter with him? He is speechless from indignation, one must hope. What ails you, Grandpa? demands Tommy after a full minute's strict examination of him. Oh, nothing, nothing, says Sir George, choking. It is only... That I'm glad you have so thoroughly enjoyed yourself and your harlequin and <laughs> your columbine. Columbine, now mind, and here's this for you, Tommy, because you are such a good boy. He opens the little grandson's hand and presses into the pink palm of it a sovereign. Thank you, says Tommy, in a polite regulation tone he has been taught without a glance at his gift, a touch of etiquette he has been taught to. Then the curious eyes of childhood wander to the palm, and, seeing the unexpected pretty gold thing lying there, he colours up to the tips of his ears with surprise and pleasure. Then sudden compunction sizes on the kindly little heart. The world is strange to him. He knows but one or two here and there. His father is poor. A sovereign, that is a gold piece, would be rare with him. Why not rare with another? Though filled with admiration and gratitude for the giver of so big a gift, the child's heart commands him not to accept it. Oh, it is too much, says he, throwing his arms around Sir George's neck and trying to press the sovereign back into his hand. A shilling I'd like, but that's such a lot of shillings and maybe you'd be wanting it. This is all whispered in the softest, tenderest way. No, no, my boy says Sir George, whispering back, and glad that he must whisper. His voice, even so, sounds a little queer to himself. How often he might have gladdened his child with a present, a small one, and until now... Keep it, says he. He has passed his hand round the little head, and is pressing it against his breast. May I, really, says Tommy, 
emancipating his head with a little jerk and looking at Sir George with searching eyes. You may indeed. God bless you, says Tommy solemnly. It is a startling remark to Sir George, but not so to Tommy. It is exactly what Nurse had said to her daughter the day before she left Ireland with Tommy and Mabel in charge, when her daughter had brought her the half of her wages. Therefore, it must be correct. To supplement this blessing, Tommy flings his arms around Sir George's neck and gives him a resounding kiss. Nurse had done that too to her daughter. God bless you too, my dear, says Sir George, if not quite as solemnly, with considerably more tenderness. Tommy's mother, catching the words and the tone, cheers up. All is not lost yet. The situation is saved. Tommy has won the day. The inconsequent Tommy of all people. Insult to herself, she had endured, but to have the children disliked would have been more than she could bear. But Tommy apparently is not disliked by the old man at all events. That fact will be sweet to Freddy. After all, who could resist Tommy? Tears rise to the mother's eyes. Darling boy, where is his like upon the whole wide earth? Nowhere. She is disturbed in her rivalry by the fact that the originator of it is running toward her with one little closed fist outstretched. How he runs! His fat calves come twingling across the carpet. See, Mummy, what I've got! Grandpa gave it to me! Isn't he nice? Now I'll buy a watch, like puppies! You have made him very happy, says Barbara, smiling at Sir George over her boy's head. She rises as she speaks, and goes to where Lady Monkton is sitting to bid her good-bye. I hope you will come soon again, says Lady Monkton, not cordially, but as if compelled to it. And I hope, too, pausing as if to gather herself together, that when you do come you will bring your sister with you. It will give me, us, pleasure to see her. There is such a verse of pleasure in the tone of the invitation that Barbara feels her wrath rising within her. I thank you, she manages to say very calmly, not committing herself either way, and presently finds herself in the street with her husband and her children. They had declined Lady Monkton's offer of the brougham to take them home. It was a bad time, says Monkton, while waiting at a crossing for a cab to come to them. But you must try and not mind them. If the fact that I'm always with you counts for anything, it may help you to endure it. What help could be like it, says she, tightening her hand on his arm. That old woman, my aunt, she offended you, but you must remember that she offends everybody. You thought her abominable? Oh, no, I only thought her vulgar, says Mrs. Monkton. It is the one revenge she permits herself. Monkton breaks into an irresistible laugh. It isn't perfect. It couldn't be unless she heard you, says he. The cab has come up now, and he puts in the children and then his wife, finally himself. Tommy grounds all, says he with a retrospective smile. Eh? says Tommy, who has the ears of a Midas. Your father says you are a social success, and so does your mother, says Barbara, smiling at the child's puzzled face and then giving him a loving little embrace. End of chapter 34 Recording by Monica Rolly. Chapter 35 of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica Rolly. Why should two hearts in one breast lie, and yet not lodge together? O oh, love, where is thy sympathy, if thus our breasts you sever? Well, did you like the gallery? asks Mrs. Monkton, throwing aside her book to greet Joyce as she returns from Doré's. It is next day, and Barbara had let the girl go to see the pictures without telling her of her meeting with Felix the evening before, she had been afraid to say anything about him, lest that guilty secret of hers might transpire, that deliberate betrayal of Joyce's intended visit to Bond Street on the morrow. If Joyce had heard that, she would, in all probability, have defeared her going there forever, and, 
It was such a chance. Mrs. Monkton, who in her time had said so many hard words about matchmakers, as most women have, and who would have scorned to be classed with them, had promoted and desired this meeting of Felix and Joyce with all the energy and enthusiasm of which she was capable. But that Joyce should suspect her of the truth is a fear that terrifies her. Very much, so did Tommy. He's very graphic in his remarks, says Joyce, sinking listlessly into a chair and taking off her hat. She looks vexed and preoccupied. I think he gave several very original ideas on the subjects of the pictures to doze around. They seemed impressed. You know how far above the foolish feeling mauvaise honte he is. His voice, like a silver clarion rung, Excelsior was outdone. Everybody turned and looked at him with, I hope he was noisy, says Mrs. Monkton nervously. With admiration, I was going to say, but you wouldn't let me finish my sentence. Oh, yes, he was quite a success. One old gentleman wanted to know if he would accept the part of art critic in his paper. It was very exciting. She leans back in her chair, the troubled look on her face growing intensified. She seems glad to be silent and with downcast eyes plays with the gloves lying in her lap. Something has happened, Joyce, says her sister going over to her. Something is happening always, returned Joyce with a rather impatient smile. Yes, but to you just now. You are sure to make me tell you sooner or later, says Miss Kavanagh, and even if I didn't, Tommy would. I met Mr. Dysart at that gallery today. Felix, says Mrs. Monkton, feeling herself an abominable hypocrite, yet afraid to confess the truth. Something in the girl's whole attitude forbids the confession, at this moment at all events. Yes. Well? Well? He was glad to see you, darling, very tenderly. Was he? I don't know. He looked very ill. He said he had had a bad cough. He's coming to see you. You were kind to him, Joyce. I didn't personally insult him, if you mean that. Oh, no, I don't mean that. You know what I mean. He was ill, unhappy. You did not make him more unhappy. It is always for him, cries the girl with jealous anger. Is there never to be a thought for me? Am I nothing to you? Am I never unhappy? Why don't you ask if he was kind to me? Was he ever unkind? Well, you can forget. He said dreadful things to me. Dreadful. I'm not likely to forget them if you are. After all, they did not hurt you. Joyce. Yes, I know. I know everything you would say. I am ungrateful, abominable, but he was unkind to me. He said what no girl would ever forgive, and yet you have not one angry word for him. Never mind all that says Mrs. Monkton soothingly. Tell me what you did today, what you said. As little as possible, defiantly. I tell you, I don't want ever to see him again or hear of him. I think I hate him. And he looked dying. She stops here as if finding a difficulty about saying another word. She coughs nervously, then recovering herself and as if determined to assert herself anew and show how real is the coldness that she has declared. Yes, dying, I think, she says stubbornly. Oh, I don't think he looked as bad as that, says Barbara hastily, unthinkingly filled with grief, not only at this summary dismissal of poor Felix from our earthly sphere, but for her sister's unhappiness, which is as plain to her as though no little comedy had been performed for the concealment of it. You don't, repeats Joyce, lifting her head and directing a piercing glance at her. You, what do you know about him? Why, you just said, stammers Mrs. Monkton, and then breaks down ignominiously. You knew he was in town, says Joyce, advancing to her and looking down on her with clasped hands and a pale face. Barbara, speak. You knew he was here, and never told me. You, with a sudden fresh burst of inspiration, sent him to that place today to meet me. Oh, no, dearest, no, indeed. He himself can tell you. It was only that he asked where I was going to at such and such an hour, and you told him. 
she is still standing over poor mrs monkton in an attitude that might almost be termed menacing i didn't i assure you joyce you are taking it all quite wrongly it was only oh only only says the girl contemptuously do you think i can't read between the lines i'm sure you believe you are sticking to the honest truth barbara but still well bitterly i don't think he profited much by the information you gave him your deception has given him small satisfaction i don't think you should speak to me like that says mrs monkton in a voice that trembles perceptibly i don't care what i say cries joyce with a sudden burst of passion you betray me he betrays me all the world seem arrayed against me and what have i done to anybody she throws out her hands protestingly joyce darling if you would only listen listen i am always listening it seems to me to him to you to every one i am tired of being silent i must speak now i trusted you barbara and you have been bad to me do you want to force him to make love to me that you tell him on the very first opportunity where to find me and in a place where i am without you or any one to will you try to understand says mrs monkton with a light stamp of her foot her patience going as her grief increases he cross-examined me as to where you were and what would be and i i told him i wasn't going to make a mystery of it or you was i i told him that you were going to the doré gallery today with tommy how could i know he would go there to meet you he never said he was going you are unjust joyce both to him and to me do you mean to tell me that for all that you didn't know he would be at that place today turning flashing eyes upon her sister how could i know unless a person says a thing right out how is one to be sure what he is going to do oh that is unlike you it is unworthy of you says joyce turning from her scornfully you did know and it is not turning back again and confronting the now thoroughly frightened barbara with a glance full of pathos it is not that your insincerity that hurt me so much it is i didn't mean to be insincere you are very cruel you do not measure your words you will tell me next that you meant it all for the best with a bitter smile that is the usual formula isn't it well never mind perhaps you did what i object to is you didn't tell me that i was kept designedly in the dark both by him and you am i with sudden fire a child or fool that you should seek to guide me so blindly well drawing a long breath i won't keep you in the dark when i left the gallery and your protege i met mr beauclerc mrs monkton stunned by this intelligence remained silent for a full minute it is death to her hopes if she has met that man again it is impossible to know how things have gone his fatal influence her unfortunate infatuation for him all will be ruinous to poor felix's hopes you spoke to him asked she at last in an emotionless tone yes was felix with you when when you met that odious man mr beauclerc no i dismissed mr dyside as soon as ever i could no doubt and mr beauclerc did you dismiss him as promptly certainly not there was no occasion no inclination either you were kind to him at all events it is only to the man who is honest and sincere that you are deliberately uncivil i hope i was uncivil to neither of them there is no use giving yourself that air with me joyce you are angry with me but why only because i am anxious for your happiness oh that hateful man how i detest him he has made you unhappy once he will certainly make you unhappy again i don't think so says joyce taking up her hat and first with the evident intention of leaving the room and thus putting an end to the discussion you will never think so until it is too late you haven't the strength of mind to throw him over once and for all and give your thoughts to one who is really worthy of you on the contrary you spend your time comparing him favorably 
with the good and faithful Felix. You should put that down. It will do for his tombstone, says Miss Kavanagh with a rather uncertain little laugh. At all events, it would not do for Mr. Beauclerc's tombstone, though I wish it would, and that I could put it there at once. I shall tell Freddy to read the commandments to you, says Joyce with a dreary attempt at mirth. You have forgotten your duty to your neighbour. It is all true, however. You can't deny it, Joyce. You are deliberately, willfully throwing away the good for the bad. I can't bear to see it. I can't look on in silence and see you thus miserably destroying your life. How can you be so blind, darling, appealing to her with hands and voice and eyes? Such determined folly would be strange in any one, stranger far in a girl like you, whose sense has always been above suspicion. Did it ever occur to you, asks Joyce in a slightly bantering tone, that but ill conceals the nervousness that is consuming her. That you might be taking a wrong view of the situation? That I was not so blind after all? That I, what was it you said, that I spent my nights and days comparing the merits of Mr. Beauclerc with those of your friend Felix Dysart to your friend's discomfiture? Now, suppose that I did thus waste my time and gave my veto in favour of Mr. Dysart? How would it be then? It might be so, you know, for all that he or you or anyone could say. It is not so light a matter that you should trifle with it, says Mrs. Monkton, with a faint suspicion of severity in her soft voice. No, of course not, you are right, Miss Kavanagh moves towards the door. After all, Barbara, looking back at her, that applies to most things in this sad old world. What matter under heaven can we poor mortals dare to trifle with? Not one, I think. All bear within them the seeds of grief or joy, sacred seeds, both carrying in their bosoms the germs of eternity. Even when this life is gone from us, we will still face veal or woo. Still, we need not make our own woo, says Barbara, who is a sturdy enemy to all pessimistic thoughts. Wait a moment, Joyce, she hurries after her and lays her hand on the girl's shoulder. Will you come with me next Wednesday to see Lady Monkton? Lady Monkton, why, I thought, yes, I know, I would not take you there before, because she had not expressly asked to see you, but today she made a, she sent you a formal message, at all events she said she hoped I would bring you when I came again. Is that all of it? asks Joyce, gazing at her sister with a curious smile that has troubled, but has still some growing sense of amusement in it. What an involved statement! Surely you have forgotten something? that Mr. Dysart was standing near you, for example, and will probably find that it is absolutely imperative that he should call on Lady Monkton next Wednesday, too? Don't set your heart on that, Barbara. I think, after my interview with him today, he will not want to see Lady Monkton next Wednesday. End of chapter 35 Recording by Monica Rolly. Chapter 36 of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter 36. Children know very little, but their capacity of comprehension is great. I've just been interviewing Tommy on the subject of the pictures, says Mr. Monkton. So far as I can make out, he disapproves of Dory. Oh, Tommy, and all such beautiful pictures out of the Bible, says his mother. I did like them, says Tommy. Only some of them were queer. I wanted to know about them, but nobody would tell me, and— Why, Tommy, I explained them all to you, says Joyce, reproachfully. You did in the first two little rooms, and in the big room afterward, where the velvet seats were. They, looking at his father and raising his voice to an indignant note, wouldn't let me run around on the top of them. 
"'Good heavens!' says Mr. Monkton. "'Can that be true? "'Truly this country is going to the dogs.' "'Where do the dogs live?' asked Tommy. "'What dogs? "'Why does the country want to go to them?' "'It doesn't want to go,' explains his father. "'But it will have to go, "'and the dogs will punish them "'for not letting you reduce "'its velvet seats to powder. "'Never mind. "'Go on with your story, "'so that unnatural aunt of yours "'won't tell you about the pictures, eh?' "'She did in the beginning, "'and when we got into the big room, too, "'a little while, "'she told me about the great large one at the end, "'Christ and the Historian.' though I couldn't see the historian anywhere, and she herself must be a most successful one, says Mr. Monkton, sotto voce. And then we came to the innocence, and I perfectly hated that, says Tommy, twice frightful. Everybody was as large as that, stretching out his arms and puffing out his cheeks, and the babies were all so fat and so horrid, and then Felix came, and Joyce had to talk to him, so I didn't know any more. I think you forgot, says Joyce. There was that picture with lions in it. Mr. Dysart himself explained that to you. Oh, that one, says Tommy, as if dimly remembering. The circus one, the one with the round house. I didn't like that, either. It is rather ghastly for a child, says his mother. That's not the one with the gas, puts in Tommy. The one with the gas is just close to it, and has got Pilates' wife in it. She's very nice. But why didn't you like the other, asks his father. I think it one of the best there. Well, I don't says Tommy, evidently grieved at having to differ from his father, but filled with a virtuous determination to stick to the truth through thick and thin. No? Tis unfair, says Tommy. That has been allowed for centuries, says his father. Then why don't they change it? Change what? asks Mr. Monkton, feeling a little puzzled. How can one change now the detestable cruelties or the abominable habits of the dark ages? But why were they dark? asked Tommy. Mama says they had gas then. I didn't mean that. I... His mother is beginning, but Monkton stops her with a despairing gesture. Don't, says he. It would take a good hour by the slowest clock. Let him believe there was electric light, then, if he chooses. Well, but why can't they change it? persists Tommy, who is evidently full of the picture in question. I have told you. But the painter man could change it. I'm afraid not, Tommy. He is dead. Why didn't he do it before he died, then? Why didn't somebody show him what to do? I don't fancy he wanted any hints. And besides, he had to be true to his ideal. It was a terrible time. They did really throw the Christians to the lions, you know. Of course I know that, says Tommy with a superior air. But why didn't they cast another one? Eh? says Mr. Monkton. That's why it's unfair, says Tommy. There's one poor lion there, and he hasn't got any Christian. Why didn't Mr. Dory give him one? Tabo, Barbara, said Mr. Monkton faintly, after a long pause, is there any brandy in the house? But Barbara is looking horrified. It is shocking, she says. Why should he take such a twisted view of it? He has always been a kind-hearted child, and now... Well, he has been kind-hearted to the lions, says Mr. Monkton. No one can deny that. Oh, if you persist in encouraging him, Freddy, says his wife, with tears in her eyes. Believe me, Barbara, breaks in Joyce at this moment. It is a mistake to be soft-hearted in this world. 
there is something bright but uncomfortable in the steady gaze she directs at her sister one should be hard if one means to live comfortably will you take me soon again to see pictures asks tommy running to joyce and scrambling upon the seat she is occupying do but if you dislike them so much only some and other places may be funnier what day will you take me i don't think i shall again make an arrangement beforehand says joyce rising and placing tommy on the ground very gently some morning just before we start you and i we will make our plans she does not look at barbara this time but her tone is eloquent barbara looks at her however with eyes full of reproach end of chapter 36 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter 37 of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford Chapter 37 Love is its own great loveliness always, and takes new beauties from the touch of time. In bow owes no December and no May, but bears its blossoms into winter's clime. I have often thought what a melancholy world this would be without children. "'Oh, Felix, it is you,' says Mrs. Monkton in a dismayed tone. Her handsome is at the door, and, arrayed in her best bib and tucker, she is hurrying through the hall when Dysart, who has just come, presents himself. He was just coming in, in fact, as she was going out.' "'Don't mind me,' says he. "'There is always to-morrow. "'Oh, yes, but... "'And Miss Kavanagh? "'It is to recover her. "'I am going out this afternoon. "'It is the next day, so soon after her rupture with Joyce, "'that she is afraid to even hint at further complications. "'A strong desire to let him know "'that he might wait and try his fortune once again on her return with joyce is oppressing her mind but she puts it firmly behind her or thinks she does she is lunching at the brabazons she says old friends of ours i promise to lunch there too so as to be able to bring joyce home again she will be back then in an hour and a half at least says mrs monkton who after all is not strong enough to be quite genuine to her better judgments but with a start and a fresh determination to be cruel in the cause of right that would be much too long for you to wait for us i shouldn't think it long says he mrs monkton smiles suddenly at him how charming how satisfactory he is could any lover be more devoted well it would be for all that says she but hesitating in a last vain effort to dismiss and then losing herself suppose you do not abandon your visit altogether that you go away now and get your lunch at your club i feel contritely how inhospitable i am and then come back again here about four o'clock she i will have returned by that time an excellent plan says he his face lighting up then it clouds again if she knows i am to be here ah that is a difficulty says mrs monkton her own pretty face showing signs of distress but anyhow risk it i would rather she knew however says he steadily the idea of entrapping her into a meeting with him is abhorrent to him. He had had enough of that at the Doré gallery, 
though he had been innocent of any intentional deception there. "'I will tell her then,' says Mrs. Monkton, "'and in the meantime go and get your—' At this moment the door on the right is thrown open, and Tommy, with a whir-hoop, descends upon them, followed by Mabel. "'Oh, it's Felix!' cries he joyfully. "'Will you stay with us, Felix?' We've no one to have dinner with us to-day, because Mammy is going away, and Joyce is gone, and Pappy is nowhere, and Nurse isn't a bit of good. She only says, Take care you don't choke yourselves, my dearies. He imitates Nurse to the life, and dinner will be here in a minute. Mary says she's going to bring it upstairs. Oh, do, do stay with us. Sompliments little Mabel, thrusting her small hand imploringly into his. It is plain that he is in high favor with the children, however out of it with certain other members of the family, and feeling grateful to them. Dysart hesitates to say the no that is on his lips. How hard it is to refuse the entreaties of these little clinging fingers! these eager, lovely, upturned faces. "'If I may,' says he at last, addressing Mrs. Monkton, and thereby giving in. "'Oh, as for that, you know you may,' says she, "'but you will perfectly hate it. It is too bad to allow you to accept their invitation. You will be bored to death, and you will detest the boiled mutton.' There is only that and rice, I think. I won't even be sure of the rice. It may be tapioca, and that is worse still. It's rice, says Tommy, who is great friends with the cook, and knows till her secrets. That decides the question, says Felix gravely. Everyone knows that I adore rice. It is my one weakness. At this... Mrs. Monkton gives way to an irrepressible laugh, and he, catching the meaning of it, laughs too. "'You are wrong, however,' says he, "'that other is my one strength. I could not live without it. Well, Tommy, I accept your invitation. I shall stay and lunch. Dine with you. In truth, it seems sweet in his eyes to remain in the house that she, Joyce, occupies. It will be easier to wait, to hope for her return there than elsewhere. Your blood be on your own head, says Barbara solemnly. If, however, it goes too far, I warn you there are remedies. When it occurs to you that life is no longer worth living, go to the library. You will find there a revolver. It is three hundred years old. I am told it is hung very high on the wall to keep it out of Freddy's reach. Blow your brains out with it, if you can. You're awfully good, awfully thoughtful, says Mr. Dysart, but I don't think when the final catastrophe arrives it will be suicide. If I must murder somebody it will certainly not be myself. It will be either the children or the mutton. Mrs. Monkton laughs, then turns a serious eye on Tommy. "'Now, Tommy,' says she, addressing him with a gravity that should have overwhelmed him, "'I am going away from you for an hour or so, and Mr. Dysart has kindly accepted your invitation to lunch with him. I do hope, with increasing impressiveness, you will be good.' "'I hope so, too.' returns Tommy genially. There is an astonished pause, confined to the elders only, and then Mr. Dysart, unable to restrain himself any longer, bursts out laughing. Could anything be more candid, says he, more full of trust in himself, and yet with a certain modesty withal? There, you can go, Mrs. Monkton, with a clear conscience, I am not afraid to give myself up to the open-handed dealing of your son. Then his tone changes. He follows her quickly as she turns from him to the children to bid them good-bye. Miss Kavanagh, says he, is she well, happy, 
she is well says barbara stopping to look back at him with her hand on mabel's shoulder there is reservation in her answer had she any idea that i would call to-day this question is absolutely forced from him how should she even i did not know it certainly i thought you would come some day and soon and she may have thought so too but you should have told me you called too soon impatience is a vice says mrs monkton shaking her head in a very kindly fashion however i suppose when she knows when with a rather sad smile you tell her i am to be here on her return this afternoon she will not come with you oh yes she will i think so i am sure of it but you must understand felix that she is very peculiar difficult is what they call it nowadays and pausing and glancing at him she is angry too about something that happened before you left last autumn i hardly know what i have imagined only and rapidly don't let us go into it but you will know that there was something something yes says he well a trifle probably i have said she is difficult but you failed somewhere and she is slow to pardon where where what does that mean demands the young man a great spring of hope taking life within his eyes ah that hardly matters but she is not forgiving she is the very dearest girl i know but that is one of her faults she has no faults says he doggedly and then well she knows i am to be here this afternoon yes i told her i am glad of that if she returns with you from the barbizons with a quick but heavy sigh there will be no hope in that don't be too hard says mrs monkton who in truth is feeling a little frightened to come back without joyce and encounter a irate young man with freddy goodness knows where she may have other engagements she says she waves him an airy adieu as she makes this cruel suggestion and with a kiss more hurried than usual to the children and a good deal of nervousness in her whole manner runs down the steps to her hansom and disappears felix thus abandoned yields himself to the enemy he gives his right hand to freddy and his left to mabel and lets them lead him captive into the dining-room i expect dinner is cold says tommy cheerfully seating himself with more ado and watching the nurse who is always in attendance at this meal as she raises the cover from the boiled leg of mutton oh no not yet said mr dysart quite as cheerfully raising the carving knife and fork something however ominous in the silence that has fallen on both children make itself felt and without being able exactly to realize it he suspends operation for a moment to look at them he finds four eyes staring in his direction with astonishment generously mingled with pious horror shining in their clear depths eh says he involuntarily aren't you going to say it asks mabel in a severe tone say what says he grace returns tommy with a distinct disprobation oh er yes of course how could i have forgotten it says dysart spasmodically laying down the carvers at once and preparing to distinguish himself he succeeds admirably the children are leaning on the tablecloth in devout expectation that has something however sinister about it nurse is looking on also expectant mr dysart makes a wild struggle with his memory but all to no effect the beginning of various prayers come with malignant readiness to his mind the ends of several psalms the middles of a verse or two but the graces shamelessly desert him in his hour of need good gracious 
What is the usual one, the one they use at home, the, er, he becomes miserably conscious that Tommy's left eye is cocked sideways, and is regarding him with fatal understanding. In a state of desperation he bends forward as low as he well can, wondering vaguely where on earth is his hat, and mumbles something into his plate that might be a bit of a prayer, but certainly is not a grace. Perhaps it is a last cry for help. "'What's that?' demands Tommy promptly. "'I didn't hear one word of it,' says Mabel with indignation. Mr. Dysart is too stricken to be able to frame a reply. "'I don't believe you know one,' continues Tommy, still fixing him with an uncompromising eye. "'I don't believe you were saying anything. Do you, nurse?' "'Oh, fine now, Master Tommy. I heard your ma telling you you were to be good.' Well, so I am good. Tis he isn't good. He won't say his prayers. Do you know one? Turning again to Dysart, who is covered with confusion. What the deuce did he say here for? Why didn't he go to his club? He could have been back in plenty of time. If that confounded grinning woman of a nurse would only go away, it wouldn't be so bad. But... "'Never mind,' says Mabel, with calm resignation. "'I'll say one for you.' "'No, you shan't,' cries Tommy. "'It's my turn.' "'No, it isn't.' "'It is, Mabel. You said it yesterday, and you know you said relieve instead of received, and Mother laughed, and I don't care. It is Mr. Dysart's turn today, and he'll give his to me, won't you, Mr. Dysart?' "'You're a greedy thing,' cries Tommy, wrathfully, "'and you shan't say it. "'I'll tell Mr. Dysart what you did this morning if you do. "'I don't care, with disgraceful callousness. "'I will say it.' "'Then I'll say it, too,' says Tommy, "'with sudden inspiration born of a determination to die rather than give in, "'and instantly four fat hands are joined in pairs.' and two sapphiric countenances are appraised, and two shrill voices at screaming pitch are giving thanks for the boiled mutton at a racing speed that censorious people might probably connect with a desire on the part of each to be first in at the finish. Manfully they fight it out to the bitter end, without a break or a comma and with defiant eyes glaring at each other across the table. There is a good deal of the grace. It is quite a long one when usually said, and yet very little grace in it to-day when all is told. You may go now, nurse, says Mabel presently, when the mutton has been removed and nurse has placed the rice and jam on the table. Mr. Dysart will attend to us. It is impossible to describe the grown-up air with which this command is given. It is so like Mrs. Monkton's own voice and manner that Felix, with a start, turns his eyes on the author of it, and Nurse, with an ill-suppressed smile, leaves the room. That's what Mammy always says when there's only her and me and Tommy, explains Mabel confidently. Then, you— with a doubtful glance, you will attend to us, won't you? I'll do my best, says Felix, in a depressed tone, whose spirits are growing low. After all, there was safety in nurse. I think I'll come up and sit nearer to you, says Tommy affably. He gets down from his chair and pushes it, creaking hideously up to Mr. Dysart's elbow, right under it, in fact. So will I, says Mabel, fired with joy at the prospect of getting away from her proper place and eating her rice in a forbidden spot. But, begins Felix vaguely, do you think your mother would? We always do it when we are alone with Mommy, says Tommy. She says it keeps us warm to get under her wing when the weather is cold, says Mabel, lifting a lovely little face to his 
and bringing her chair down on the top of his toe. She says it keeps her warm, too. Are you warm now, anxiously? Yes, yes, burning, says Mr. Dysart, whose toe is not unconscious of a corn. Ah, I knew you'd like it, says Tommy. Now go on, give us our rice, a little rice and a lot of jam. Is that what your mother does, too? asks Mr. Dysart. Meanly, it must be confessed, but his toe is very bad still. The silence that follows his question and the look of the two downcast little faces is, however, punishment enough. Well, so be it, says he, but even if we do finish the jam, I'm awfully fond of it myself. We must promise faithfully not to be disagreeable about it, not to be ill, that is... Ill? We're never ill, says Tommy, valiantly, whereupon they make an end of the jam in no time. End of chapter 37 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 38 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford Chapter Number 38 Tis said the rose is love's own flower, its blush so bright, its thorns so many. There is no mistake in the joy with which Felix parts from his companions after luncheon. He breathes afresh as he sees them tearing up the staircase to get ready for their afternoon walk, nurse puffing and panting behind them. The drawing-room seems a bower of repose after the turmoil of the late feast, and besides, it cannot be long now before she, they, return. That is, if they, she, return at all. He has, indeed, ample time given him to imagine this last horrible possibility, as not only a probability, but a certainty, before the sound of coming footsteps up the stairs, and the fro-fro of pretty frocks tells him his doubts were harmless. Involuntarily he rises from his chair and straightens himself, out of the rather forlorn position into which he has fallen, and fixes his eyes immovably upon the door. Are there two of them? That is beyond doubt. It is only mad people who chatter to themselves, and certainly Mrs. Monkton is not mad. Barbara has indeed raised her voice a little more than ordinary, and has addressed Joyce by her name on her hurried way up the staircase and across the cushioned recess outside the door. Now she throws open the door and enters, radiant, if a little nervous. Here we are says she very pleasantly, and with all the put-on manner of one who has made up her mind to be extremely joyous under distinct difficulties. You are still here, then, and alone. They didn't murder you. Joyce and I had our misgivings all along. Ah, I forgot you haven't seen Joyce until now. How do you do? says Miss Cavanagh holding out her hand to him, with a calm as perfect as her smile. "'I do hope they were good,' goes on Mrs. Monkton, her nervousness rather increasing. "'You know I have always said they were the best children in the world.' "'Ah!' said, said, repeats Mrs. Monkton, who now seems grateful for the chance of saying anything." What is the meaning of Joyce's sudden amiability? And is it amiability, or 
It is true one can say almost anything, says Joyce quite pleasantly. She nods her head prettily at Dysart. There is no law to prevent them. Barbara thinks you are not sincere. She is not fair to you. You always do mean what you say, don't you? But for the smile that accompanies these words, Dysart would have felt his doom sealed. But could she mean a stab so cruel, so direct, and still look kind? Oh, he is always sincere, says Barbara quickly. Only people say things about one's children, you know, that she stops. They are the dearest children. You are a bad mother. You wrong them, says Joyce, laughing lightly, plainly at the idea of Barbara's affection for her children being impunged. She told me, turning her lovely eyes full on Dysart, with no special expression in them whatsoever, that I should find only your remains after spending an hour with them. Her smile was brilliant. She was wrong. You see, I am still here, says Felix, hardly knowing what he says in his desire to read her face, which is strictly impassive. Yes, still here, says Miss Kavanagh, smiling, always, and apparently meaning nothing at all. Yet to Felix, watching her, there seems to be something treacherous in her manner. Still here? Had she hoped? he would be gone? Was that the cause of her delay? Had she purposely put off coming home to give him time to grow tired and go away? And yet she is looking at him with a smile. I'm afraid you had a bad luncheon and a bad time generally, says Mrs. Monkton quickly, who seemed hurried in every way. But we came home as soon as ever we could, didn't we, Joyce? Her appeal to her sister is suggestive of fear as to the answer, but she need not have been nervous about that. We flew, declares Miss Kavanagh, with delightful zeal. We thought we should never get here soon enough, didn't we, Barbara? There is the very barest, faintest imitation of her sister's voice in this last question a subtle touch of mockery, so slight, so evanescent as to leave one doubtful as to its ever having existed. Yes, yes, indeed, says Barbara, coloring. We flew so fast, indeed, that I am sure you are thoroughly fatigued, says Miss Kavanagh, addressing her. Why don't you run away now and take off your bonnet and lay down for an hour or so? But, begins Barbara, and then stops short, what does it all mean? This new departure of her sister's puzzles her, to so deliberately ask for a tete-a-tete -tete with Felix. To what end? The girl's manner, so bright, filled with such a glittering geniality, so unlike the usual listlessness that has characterized it for so long, both confuses and alarms her. Why is she so amiable now? There has been a little difficulty about getting her back at all, quite enough to make Mrs. Monkton shiver for Dysart's reception by her, and here, now, half an hour later, she is beaming upon him and being more than ordinarily civil. What is she going to do? Oh, no, buts! said Joyce gaily. You know you said your head was aching, and Mr. Dysart will excuse you. He will not be so badly off even without you. He will have me. She turns a full glance on Felix as she says this, and looks at him with lustrous eyes and white teeth showing through her parted lips, the soupon of mockery in her whole air of which all through he has been faintly but uncomfortably aware, has deepened. I shall take care he is not dull. But, says Barbara again rather helplessly, no, no, 
You must rest yourself. Remember we are going to that at home, at the Thizers to-night, and I would not miss it for anything. Don't dwell with such sad looks on Mr. Dysart. I have promised to look after him. You will let me take care of you for a little while, Mr. Dysart, will you not? Turning another brilliant smile upon Felix, who responds to it very gravely. He is regarding her with a searching air. How is it with her? Some old words reoccur to him. There is treachery, O oh, Azea. Why does she look at him like that? He must trust her present attitude. Even that aggressive mood of hers at the Dory Gallery on the last day when they met was preferable to this agreeable but detestable indifference. It is always a pleasure to be with you, says he steadily, perhaps a little doggily. There, see you, says Joyce with a pretty little nod at her sister. Well, I shall take half an hour's rest, says Mrs. Monkton reluctantly, who is, in truth, feeling as fresh as a daisy, but who is afraid to stay. But I shall be back for tea. She gives a little kindly glance to Felix, and, with a heart filled with forebodings, leaves the room. What a glorious day it has been, says Joyce, continuing the conversation with Dysart, in that new manner of hers, quite as if Barbara's going was a matter of small importance, and the fact that she has left him for the first time for all these months alone together of less importance still. She is standing on the hearth rug, and is slowly taking the pins out of her bonnet. She seems utterly unconcerned. He might be the veriest stranger, or else the oldest, the most uninteresting friend in the world. She has taken out all the pins now, and has thrown her bonnet on to the lounge nearest to her, and is standing before the glass in the oriver mantle, patting and pushing into order the soft locks that lie upon her forehead. End of chapter 38 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 39 of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter 39. Ah! Were she pitiful as she is fair, Life's a varied, bright illusion, Joy and sorrow, light and shade. It was almost warm, says she, Turning round to him. She seems to be talking all the time, So vivid is her face, So intense her vitality. I was so glad to see the Barbizons again. You know them, don't you? Kit looked perfect, so lovely, so good in every way. Voice, face, manners, I felt I envied her. It would be delightful to feel that every one must be admiring one, as she does. She glances at him, and he leans a little toward her. No, no, not a compliment, please. I know I am as much behind Kit as the moon is behind the sun. I wasn't going to pay you a compliment, says he slowly. No, she laughs. It was unlike her to have made that remark, and just as unlike her to have taken his rather discourteous reply so good-naturedly. It was a charming visit, she goes on, not in haste, but idly as it were, as if words are easy to her. I quite enjoyed it. Barbara didn't. I think she wanted to get home. She is always thinking of the babies, or—well, I did. 
I am not ungrateful. I take the goods the gods provide, and find honest pleasure in them. I do not think, indeed, I laugh so much for quite a century as to-day with Kit. She is sympathetic, says Felix, with the smallest thought of the person in question in his mind. More than that, surely, though that is a hymn of praise in itself. After all, it is a relief to meet Irish people when one has spent a week or two in solid England. You agree with me? I am English, returns he. Oh, of course, how rude of me. I didn't mean it. However, I had entirely forgotten. Our acquaintance has been confined entirely to Irish soul until this luckless moment. You do forgive me? She is leaning a little forward and looking at him with a careless expression. No, returns he briefly. Well, you should, says she, taking no notice of his cold rejoinder, and treating it, indeed, as if it is of no moment. There was a deeper meaning in his refusal to grant her absolution she declines to acknowledge it. Still, even that Baptiste of mine need not prevent you from seeing some truth in my argument. We have our charms, we Irish, eh? Your charm? Well, mine, if you like, as a type, and, recklessly and with a shrug of her shoulders, if you wish to be personal, she had gone a little too far. I think I have acknowledged that, says he coldly. He rises abruptly and goes over to where she is standing on the hearth rug, shading her face from the fire with a huge Japanese fan. Have I ever denied your charm? His tone has been growing in intensity and now becomes stern. Why do you talk to me like this? What is the meaning of it all? Your altered manner, everything. Why did you grant me this interview? Perhaps because, still with that radiant smile, bright and cold as early frost, like that little soapy boy, I thought you would not be happy till you got it. She laughs lightly. The laugh is the outcome of the smile, and is close imitation. It is perfectly successful, but on the surface only. There is no heart in it. You think I arranged it? Oh, no, how could I? You have just said I arranged it. She shuts up her fan with a little click. You want to say something, don't you? She says, well, say it. You give me permission, then, asks he gravely, despair knocking at his heart. Why not? Would I have you unhappy always? Her tone is jesting throughout. You think taking the hand that holds the fan and restraining its motion for a moment, that if I do speak I shall be happier? Ah, that is beyond me, says she, and yet, yes, to get a thing over is to get rid of fatigue. I have argued it all out for myself, and have come to the conclusion. For yourself? Well, for you, too a little impatiently. After all, it is you who want to speak. Silence to me is golden, but it occurred to me in the silent watches of the night, with another, now rather forced, little laugh, that if you once said to me all you had to say, you would be contented, and go away, and not trouble me any more." I can do that now without saying anything, says he slowly. He has dropped her hand. He is evidently deeply wounded. Can you? Her eyes are resting restlessly on his. Is there magic in them? Her mouth has taken a strange expression. I might have known how it would be, says Dysart, throwing up his head. You will not forgive. It was but a moment, a few words, idle, hardly considered, and—oh, yes, considered, says she slowly. 
They were unmeant, persists he fiercely. I defy you to think otherwise. One great mistake, a second's madness, and you have ordained that it shall wreck my whole life. You, that evening in the library at the court, I had not thought of— Ah! She interrupts him, even more by her gesture, which betrays the first touch of passion she has shown, than by her voice that is still mocking. I knew you would have to say it. You know me, indeed, says he, with an enforced calmness that leaves him very white. My whole heart and soul lies bare to you, to ruin it as you will. It is the merest waste of time, I know, but still I have felt all along that I must tell you again that I love you, though I fully understand I shall receive nothing in return but scorn and contempt. Still, to be able even to say it is a relief to me. And what is it to me? asked the girl, as pale now as he is. Is it a relief, a comfort to me to have to listen to you? She clenches her hands involuntarily. The fan falls with a little crash to the ground. No, he is silent a moment. No, it is unfair, unjust. You shall not be made uncomfortable again. It is the last time. I shall not trouble you again in this way. I don't say we shall never meet again. You, pausing and looking at her, you do not desire that. Oh, no, coldly, politely. If you do, say so at once, with a rather peremptory ring in his tone. I should, calmly. I am glad of that, as my cousin is a great friend of mine, and as I shall get a fortnight's leave soon, I shall probably run over to Ireland and spend it with her. After all, bitterly, why should I suppose it would be disagreeable to you? It was quite a natural idea, says she immovably. However, says he steadily, you need not be afraid that, even if we do meet, I shall ever annoy you in this way again. Oh, I am never afraid, says she, with that terrible smile that seems to f freeze him. Well, good-bye. Holding out his hand, he is quite as composed as she is now, and is even able to return her smile in kind. So soon? But Barbara will be down in to tea in a few minutes. You will surely wait for her? I think not. But really do. I am going to see after the children and give them some chocolate I brought for them. It will probably make them ill, says he, smiling still. No, thank you. I must go now. Indeed, you will make my excuses to Mrs. Monkton, please. Good-bye. Good-bye, says she, laying her hand in his for a second. She has grown suddenly very cold, shivering. It seems almost as if an icy blast from some open portal has been blown in upon her. He is still looking at her. There is something wild, strange in his expression. You cannot realize it, but I can, says he unsteadily. It is good-bye forever, so far as life for me is concerned." He has turned away from her. He is gone. The sharp closing of the door wakens her to the fact that she is alone. Mechanically, quite calmly, she looks around the empty room. There is a little Persian chair cover over there all awry. She rearranges it with a critical eye to its proper appearance, and afterward pushes a small chair into its place. She pats a cushion or two, and finally taking up her bonnet and the pins she had laid upon the chimney-piece, goes up to her own room. Once there, with a rush, the whole thing comes back to her, the entire meaning of it, 
what she has done that word forever the bonnet has fallen from her fingers sinking upon her knees beside the bed she buries her face out of sight presently her slender frame is torn by those cruel yet merciful sob end of chapter thirty nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter Forty of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford. Chapter Forty. The sense of death is most in apprehension. Thus grief still treads upon the heels of pleasure. It is destined to be a day of grief. Monkton, who had been out all the morning, having gone to see the old people, a usual habit of his, had not returned to dinner, a very unusual habit with him. It had occurred, however, once or twice, that he had stayed to dine with them on such occasions, as when Sir George had had a troublesome letter from his elder son, and had looked to the younger to give him some comfort, some of his time to help him to bear it, by talking it all over. Barbara, therefore, while dressing for Mrs. Theaker's at home, had scarcely felt anxiety, and, indeed, it is only now when she has come down to the drawing-room to find Joyce awaiting her, also in gala garb, so far as a gown goes, that a suspicion of coming trouble takes possession of her. He is late, isn't he? she says, looking at Joyce with something nervous in her expression. What can have kept him? I know he wanted to meet the general. And now, what can it be? His mother, probably, said Joyce indifferently. From your description of her, I should say she must be a most thoroughly uncomfortable old person. Yes, not pleasant, certainly. A little of her, as George Ingram used to say, goes a long way. But, still, and these Theser people are friends of his, and— you are working yourself up into a thorough belief in the sensational street accident, says Joyce, who has seated herself well out of the glare of the chandelier. You want to be tragic. It is a mistake, believe me. Something in the bitterness of the girl's tone strikes on her sister's ear. Joyce had not come down to dinner, had pleaded a headache as an excuse for her non-appearance and Mrs. Monkton and Tommy, she could not bear to dine alone, had devoured a meal a deux. Tommy had certainly been anything but dull company. "'Has anything happened, Joyce?' asked her sister quickly. "'She has had her suspicions, of course, but they were of the vaguest order.' Joyce laughs. "'I told you your nerves were out of order,' says she. "'What should happen?' Are you still dwelling on the running over business? I assure you, you wrong, Freddy. He can take care of himself at a crossing, as well as another man, and better. Even a handsome, I am convinced, could do no harm to Freddy. I wasn't thinking of him, said Barbara, a little reproachfully. Perhaps I no. Then you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Here he is cries she suddenly, springing to her feet, as a sound of Monkton's footsteps ascending the stairs can now be distinctly heard. I hope you will explain yourself to him. She laughs again and disappears through the doorway that leads to the second hall outside, as Monkton enters. How late you are, Freddy, says his wife, the reproach in her voice heightened because of the anxiety she has been enduring. I thought you would never. What is it? What has happened, Freddy? There is bad news? Yes, 
very bad, says Monkton, sinking into a chair. Your brother, breathlessly, of late she has always known that trouble is to be expected from him. He is dead, said Monkton in a low tone. Barbara, flinging her opera cloak aside, comes quickly to him. She leans over him and slips her arms round his neck. Dead? says she in an awestruck tone. Yes, killed himself, shot himself. The telegram came this morning when I was with them. I could not come home sooner. It was impossible to leave them. Oh, Freddy, I am so sorry you left them even now. A line to me would have done. Oh, what a horrible thing, and to die like that. Yes, he presses one of her hands, and then, rising, begins to move hurriedly up and down the room. It was a misfortune upon misfortune, he says presently. When I was over there this morning, they had just received a letter filled with, from him? Yes, that is what seemed to make it so much worse later on. Life in the morning, death in the afternoon. His voice grows choked and such a letter as it was, filled with nothing but a most scandalous account of his, oh, he breaks off suddenly as if shocked, oh, he is dead, poor fellow, don't take it like that, says Barbara, following him and clinging to him, you know you could not be unkind, there were debts then, debts, it is difficult to explain just now, my head is aching so, and those poor old people? Well, it means ruin for them. Barbara, of course his debts must be paid, his honor kept intact, for the sake of the old name. But they will let all the houses, the two in town, this one and their own, and, and the old place down in Warwickshire, the home, all must go out of their hands. Oh, Freddy, surely, surely there must be some way. Not one. I spoke about breaking the entile. You know, I, his death, poor fellow, I, yes, yes, dear, but they won't hear of it. My mother was very angry, even in her grief, when I proposed it. They hope that by strict retrenchment the property will be itself again and they spoke about tommy they said it would be unjust to him and to you quickly she would not have him ignored any longer oh as for me i'm not a boy you know tommy is safe to inherit as life goes well so are you said she with a sharp pang at her heart Yes, of course. I am only making out a case. I think it was kind of them to remember Tommy's claim in the midst of their own grief. It was indeed, says she remorsefully. Oh, it was. But if they give up everything, where will they go? They talk of taking a cottage, a small house somewhere. They want to give up everything to pay his infamous. There sharply i am forgetting again but to see them makes one forget everything else he begins to walk up and down the room again as if inaction is impossible to him my mother who has been accustomed to a certain luxury all her life to be now at the very close of it condemned to it would break your heart to see her and she will let nothing be said of him oh no Still there should be justice. I can't help feeling that. Her blameless life and his, and she is the one to suffer. It is often so, says his wife in a low tone. It is an old story, dearest, but I know that when the old stories come home to us individually, they always sound so terribly new. But what do they mean by a small house? asked she presently in a distressed tone well i suppose a small house said he with just a passing gleam of his old jesting manner you know my mother cannot bear the country so i think the cottage idea will fall through freddy 
says his wife suddenly. She can't go into a small house, a London small house. It is out of the question. Could they not come and live with us? She is suggesting a martyrdom for herself, yet she does it unflinchingly. What? My aunt and all? asks he, regarding her earnestly. Oh, of course, of course, poor old thing, says she, unable this time, however, to hide the quaver that desolates her voice. No, says her husband with suspicion of vehemence. He takes her suddenly in his arms and kisses her. Because two or three people are unhappy is no reason why a fourth should be made so, and I don't want your life spoiled, so far as I can prevent it. I suppose you have guessed that I must go over to Nice, where he is. My father could not possibly go alone in his present state. When must you go? Tomorrow, as for you. If we could go home, says she uncertainly, that is what I would suggest. But how will you manage without me? The children are so troublesome when taken out of their usual beat, and their nurse— I often wonder which would require the most looking after, they or she. It occurred to me to ask Dysart to see you across. He is so kind, such a friend, says Mrs. Monkton, but— She might have said more, but at this instant Joyce appeared in the doorway. We shall be late, cries she, and Freddy not even dressed. Why? Oh, has anything really happened? "'Yes, yes,' said Barbara hurriedly. "'A few words explains all. "'We must go home to-morrow, you see, "'and Freddy thinks that Felix would look after us "'until we reach Kensington or North Wall. "'Felix? Mr. Dysart?' "'The girl's face had grown pale "'during the recital of the suicide, "'but now it looks ghastly. "'Why should he come?' cries she in a ringing tone that has actual fear in it do you suppose that we two cannot manage the children between us oh nonsense barbara why tommy is as sensible as he can be and if nurse does prove incapable and a prey to seasickness well i can take baby and you can look after mabel it will be all right we are not going to America, really. Freddy, please say you will not trouble Mr. Dysart about this matter. Yes, I really think we shall not require him, says Barbara. Something in the glittering brightness of her sister's eye warns her to give in at once, and indeed she has been unconsciously a little half-hearted about having Felix or any stranger as a traveling companion. There, Run away, Joyce, and go to your bed, darling. You look very tired. I must still arrange some few things with Freddy. What is the matter with her? asks Monkton, when Joyce has gone away. She looks as if she had been crying, and her matter is so excitable. She has been strange all day, almost repellent. Felix called, and I don't know what happened. She insisted upon my leaving her alone with him, but I am afraid there was a scene of some sort. I know she had been crying, because her eyes were so red, but she would say nothing, and I was afraid to ask her. Better not. I hope she is not still thinking of that fellow, Beau Clark. However, he stops short and sighs heavily. You must not think of her now, says Barbara quickly. Your own trouble is enough for you. Were your brother's affairs so very bad that they necessitate the giving up of everything? It has been going on for years. My father has had to economize, to cut down everything. You know the old place was let to a Mr. Mr. I quite forget the name now, pressing his hand to his brow, a Manchester man, at all events, but we always hoped my father would have been able to take it back from him next year. But now, but you say they think in time that the property will, they think so, I don't, 
but it would be a pity to undeceive them. I am afraid, Barbara, with a sad look at her, you made a bad match, even when the chance comes your way to rise out of poverty it proves a thoroughly useless one it isn't like you to talk like that says she quickly there you are overwrought and no wonder too come upstairs and let us see what you will want for your journey her tone had grown purposely brisk surely on occasion such as this she is a wife a companion in a thousand there must be many things to be considered, both for you and for me, and the thing is to take nothing unnecessary. Those foreign places I hear are so, it hardly matters what I take, says he wearily. Well, it matters what I take, says she briskly. Come and give me help, Freddy. You know how I hate to have servants standing over me. Other people stand over their servants, but they are poor, rich people. I like to see how the clothes are packed. She is speaking not quite truthfully. Few people like to be spared trouble so much as she does, but it seems good in her eyes now to rouse him from the melancholy that is fast growing on him. Come, she says, tucking her arm into his. End of chapter 40 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 41 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 41 It is not tomorrow, ah, were it today. There are two that I know that would be gay. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Ah, I parting wounds so bitterly. It is six weeks later. Spring has come up this way, and all the earth is glad with a fresh birth. Tantarara, the joyous book of spring, lies open, writ in blossoms, not a bird. Of evil augury is seen or heard. Come now, like Pan's old crew will dance and sing, or Oberon's for hill and valley ring, to March's bugle horn earth's blood is stirred march has indeed come boisterous wild terrible in many ways but lovely in others there is a freshness in the air that rouses glad thoughts within the breast vague thoughts sweet as as undefinable and that yet mean life the whole land seems to have sprung up from a long slumber, and to be looking with wide happy eyes upon the fresh marvels nature is preparing for it. Rather naked she stands as yet, rubbing her sleepy lids, having just cast from her her coat of snow, and feeling somewhat bare in the frail garment of bursting leaves and timid grass growths, that as yet is all she can find wherein to hide her charms, but half clothed as she is, she is still beautiful. Everything seems full of eager triumph, hills, trees, valleys, lawns, and bursting streams. All are overflowing with wild enjoyment. All the dull, dingy drapery in which winter had shrouded them has now been cast aside and the resplendent furniture with which each spring delights to deck her home stands revealed. All these past dead months her house has lain desolate, enfolded in death's cements, but now, uprising in her vigorous youth, she flings aside the dull coverings and lets the sweet, brilliant hues that lie beneath shine forth in all their beauty to meet the eye of day. 
earth and sky are in bridal array and from the rich recesses of the woods and from each shrub and branch the soft glad paeans of the mating birds sound like a wedding chant monkton had come back from the sad journey to nice some weeks ago he had had very little to tell on his return and that of the saddest it had all been only too true about those inquisitous debts and the old people were in great distress the two townhouses should be let at once and the old place in warwickshire the home as he called it well there was no hope now that it would ever be redeemed from the hands of the manchester people who held it and sir george had been so sure that this spring he would have been in a position to get back his own and have the old place once more in his possession it was all very sad there is no hope now he will have to let the place to barton for the next ten years said monkton to his wife when he got home barton was the manchester man he is still holding off about doing it but he knows it must be done and at all events the reality won't be a bit worse than the thinking about it poor old governor you wouldn't know him barbara he has gone to skin and bone and such a frightened sort of look in his eyes oh poor poor old man cried barbara who could forget everything in the way of past unkindness where her sympathies were enlisted toward the end of february the guests had begun to arrive at the court lady baltimore had returned there during january with her little son but baltimore had not put in an appearance for some weeks a good many new people unknown to the monktons had arrived there with others whom they did know and after a while dicky brown had come and miss maliphant and the brabazons and some others whom joyce was on friendly terms but even though lady baltimore had made rather a point of the girls being with her joyce had gone to her but sparingly and always in fear and trembling it was so impossible to know who might not have arrived last night or was going to arrive this night besides barbara and freddie were so saddened so upset by the lake death and its consequences that it seemed unkind even to pretend to enjoy oneself joyce grasped at the excuse to say no very often to lady baltimore's kindly longings to have her with her that up to this neither dicer nor beauclerk had come to the court had been a comfort to her but that they might come at any moment kept her watchful and uneasy indeed only yesterday she had heard from lady baltimore that both were expected during the ensuing week that news leaves her rather unstrung and nervous to-day after luncheon having successfully eluded tommy the lynx-eyed she decided upon going for a long walk with a view to working off the depression to which she had become prey this is how she happens to be out of the way when the letter comes for barbara that changes altogether the tenor of their lives the afternoon post brings it the delicious spring day has worn itself almost to a close when monkton entering his wife's room where she is busy at a sewing machine altering a frock for mabel drops a letter over her shoulder into her lap what a queer-looking letter says she staring in amazement at the big official blue envelope aha i thought it would make you shiver says he lounging over to the fire and nestling his back comfortably against the mantelpiece what have you been up to i should like to know no wonder you are turning a lively purple but what can it be says she that just it says he teasingly i hope they aren't going to arrest you that's all 
Five years' penal servitude is not a thing to hanker after. Mrs. Monkton, however, is not listening to this tirade. She has broken open the envelope and is now scanning hurriedly the contents of this important-looking document within. There is a pause, a lengthened one. Presently Barbara rises from her seat, mechanically, as if it were, always with her eyes fixed on the letter in her hand. She has grown a little pale. A little puzzled frown is contracting her forehead. Freddy, says she in a rather strange tone. What? says he quickly. No more bad news, I hope. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I can't quite make it out. But I'm afraid my poor uncle is dead. Your uncle? Yes, yes, my father's brother. I think I told you about him. He went abroad years ago, and we, Joyce and I, believed him dead a long time ago, long before I married you even, but now come here and read it. It is worded so oddly that it puzzles me. Let me see it, says Monkton. He sinks into an easy chair and drags her down on to his knee, the better to see over her shoulder. This satisfactory arranged, he begins to read rapidly the letter she holds up before his eyes. Yes, dead indeed, says he, sotto voice. Go on, turn over, you mustn't fret about that, you know, Barbara. Er, er, reading, what's this, by Jove? What? says his an wife anxiously. What is the meaning of this horrid letter, Freddy? There are a few people who might not call it horrid, says Monkton, placing his arm round her and rising from the chair. He is looking very grave. Even though it brings you news of your poor uncle's death, still it brings you to the information that you are heiress to about a quarter of a million. What? says Barbara faintly. And then, oh no, oh nonsense, there must be some mistake. Well, it sounds like it at all events. Sad occurrence. Hm, hm. Reading. Co Hyrus. Very considerable fortune. He looks to the signature of the letter. Hodgkin and Fair. Very respectable firm. My father has had dealings with them. They say your uncle died in Sydney and has left behind him an immense sum of money. Half a million, in fact to which you and Joyce are co -heiresses. There must be a mistake, repeats Barbara in a low tone. It seems, too, like a fairy tale. It does, and yet lawyers like Hodgkin and Fair are not likely to be led into a cul-de-sac. If, he pauses and looks earnestly at his wife, if it does prove true, Barbara, you will be a very rich woman, and you will be rich with me, she says quickly, in an agitated tone. But, but, yes, it does seem difficult to believe, interrupts he slowly. What a letter! His eyes fall on it again, and she, drawing close to him, reads it once more, carefully. I think there is truth in it, says she at last. It sounds more like being all right, more reasonable, when read a second time. Freddy, she steps a little bit away from him, and rests her beautiful eyes full on his. Have you thought, says she slowly, that if there is truth in this story, how much we shall be able to do for your father and mother? Monkton starts as if stung for them, to do anything for them, for the two who had so wantonly offended and insulted her during all their married life. Is her first thought to be for them? Yes, yes, says she eagerly. We shall be able to help them out of all their difficulties. Oh, I didn't say much to you, but in their grief their troubles have gone to my very heart. I couldn't bear to think of their being obliged to give up their hoses, their comforts, and in their old age, too. Now we shall be able to smooth matters for them. 
End of chapter 41 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 42 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 42 It's we two, it's we two, it's we two for a, All the world and we two, and heaven be our stay. Like a lava rock in the lift, sing, O bonny bride, All the world was Adam once, with Eve by his side. The light in her eyes is angelic. She has laid her hands upon both her husband's arms, as if expecting him to take her into them, as he always does only too gladly on the smallest provocation. Just now, however, he fails her, for the moment only, however. Barbara, says he, in a choked voice, he holds her from him, examining her face critically. His thoughts are painful yet proud, proud beyond telling. His examination does not last long. There is nothing but good to be read in that fair, sweet, lovable face. He gathers her to him with a force that is almost hurtful. Are you a woman at all, or just an angel? says he with a deep sigh. What is it, Freddy? After all they have done to you, their insults, coldness, abominable conduct, to think that your first thought should be for them. Why, look here, Barbara, vehemently, they are not worthy that you should tut, interrupts she, lightly, yet with a little sob in her throat. His praise is so sweet to her. You overrate me. Is it for them I would do it, or for you? There, take all the thought for yourself, and besides, are not you and I one, and shall not your people be my people? Come, if you think of it, there is no such great merit after all. You forget. No, not a word against them. I won't listen, thrusting her fingers into her ears. It is all over and done with long ago, and it is our turn now, and let us do things decently and in order, and create no heart-burnings. But when I think, if thinking makes you look like that, don't think. But I must, I must remember how they scorned and slighted you. It never seems to have come home to me so vividly as now, now when you seem to have forgotten it. O oh, Barbara, he presses back her head and looks long and tenderly into her eyes. I was not mistaken, indeed, when I gave you my heart. Surely you are one among ten thousand. Silly boy, says she, with a little tremendous laugh, glad to her very soul's center, however, because of his words. What is there to praise me for? Have I not warned you that I am purely selfish? What is there I would not do for very love of you? Come, Freddy, shaking herself loose from him, and laughing now with honest delight, let us be reasonable. Oh, poor uncle, it seems hateful to rejoice thus over his death, but his memory is really only a shadow after all, and I suppose he meant to make us happy by his gift, eh, Freddy? Yes, how well he remembered during all these years. He could have formed no other ties. None, naturally. Short pause. There is that black mare of Mike Donovan's, Freddy, that you so fancied. You can buy it now. Monkton laughs involuntarily. Something of the child has always lingered about Barbara. And I should like to get a black velvet gown, says she, her face brightening, and to buy Joyce a... Oh, but Joyce will be rich herself. Yes, 
I'm really afraid you will be done out of the joy of overloading Joyce with gifts. She'll be able to give you something. That will be a change at all events. As for the velvet gown, if this, touching the letter, bears any meaning, I should think you need not confine yourself to one velvet gown. And there's Tommy, says she quickly, her thoughts running so fast that she scarcely hears them. You have always said you wanted to put him in the army. Now you can do it. Yes, says Monkton, with sudden interest. I should like that. But you, you shrank from the thought, didn't you? Well, he might have to go to India, says she nervously. And what of that? Oh, nothing. That is, nothing really. Only there are lions and tigers there, Freddy. Aren't there now? One or two, says Mr. Monkton, if we are to believe travelers' tales, but they are all proverbially false. I don't believe in lions at all myself. I'm sure they are myths. Well, let him go into the navy, then. Lions and tigers don't, as a rule, inhabit the great deep. Oh, no, but sharks do, says she, with a visible shudder. No, no, on the whole, I had rather trust him to the beasts of the field. He could run away from them, but you can't run in the sea. True, says Mr. Monkton, with exemplary gravity. I couldn't, at all events. Monkton had to run across to London about the extraordinary legacy left to his wife and Joyce, but further investigation proved the story true. The money was indeed there, and they were the only heirs. From being distinctly poor they rose to the height of a very respectable income, and Monkton being in town, where the old Monktons still were, also was commanded by his wife to go to them and pay off their largest liabilities, debt contracted by their dead son, and to so arrange that they should not be at the necessity of leaving themselves houseless. The Manchester people who had taken the old place in Warwickshire were now informed that they could not have it beyond the term agreed on. But about this the, the old people had something to say, too. They would not take back the family place. They had but one son now, and the sooner he went to live there, the better. Lady Monkton, completely broken down and melted by Barbara's generosity, went so far as to send her a long letter, telling her it would be the dearest wish of her and Sir George's hearts that she should preside as mistress over the beautiful old homestead, and that it would give them great happiness to imagine the children, the grandchildren, running riot through the big wainscoted rooms. Barbara was not to wait for her. Lady Monkton's death to take up her position as head of the house. She was to go to Warwickshire at once, the moment those detestable Manchester people were out of it, and Lady Monkton, if Barbara would be so good as to make her welcome, would like to come to her for three months every year, to see the children and her son and her daughter. The last was the crowning touch, for the rest Barbara was not to hesitate about accepting the Warwickshire place, as Lady Monkton and Sir George were devoted to town life, and never felt quite well when away from smoky London. This last was true. As a fact, the old people were thoroughly imbued with the desire for the turmoil of city life, and the three months of country Lady Monkton had stipulated for were quite as much as they desired of rustic felicity. Barbara accepted the gift of the old home. Eventually, of course, it would be hers, but she knew the old people meant the present of giving it a sort of return for her liberality, for the generosity that had enabled them to once more lift their heads among their equals. The great news had spread like wildfire through the Irish country, where the Frederick Monktons lived. 
Lady Baltimore was unfeigningly glad about it, and came down at once to embrace Barbara, and say all sorts of delightful things about it. The excitement of the whole affair seemed to dissipate all the sadness and depression that had followed on the death of the elder son, and nothing now was talked of but the great good luck that had fallen into the paths of Barbara and Joyce. The poor old uncle had been considered dead for so many years previously, and was indeed such a dim memory to his nieces that it would have been the purest affection to pretend to feel any deep grief for his demise. Perhaps what grieved Barbara most of all, though she said very little about it, was the idea of having to leave the old house in which they were now living. It did not cheer her to think of the place in Warwickshire, which, of course, was beautiful and full of possibilities. This foolish old Irish home, rich in discomforts, was home. It seemed hard to abandon it. It was not a palatial mansion, certainly. It was even dismal in many ways, but it contained more love in its little space than many a noble mansion could boast. It seemed cruel, ungrateful, to cast it behind her, once it was possible to mount a few steps on the rungs of the worldly ladder. How happy they had all been here together, in the foolish old house, that every severe storm seemed to threaten with final dissolution. It gave her many a secret pang to think that she must part from it for ever before another year should dawn. End of chapter 42 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter number 43 of April Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 43 Looks the heart alone discover, If the tongue its thoughts can tell, Tis in vain you play the lover, You have never felt the spell. Joyce, who had been dreading, with a silent but terrible fear, her first meeting with Dysart, had found it no such great matter after all, when they were at last face to face. Dysart had met her as coolly, with apparently as little concern as though no formal passages had ever taken place between them. His manner was perfectly calm and as devoid of feeling as any one could desire, and it was open to her comprehension that he avoided her whenever he possibly could. She told herself this was all she could, or did, desire, yet nevertheless she writhed beneath the certainty of it. Beauclerk had not arrived until a week later than Dysart, until, indeed, the news of the marvellous fortune that had come to her was well authenticated, and then had been all that could possibly be expected of him. His manner was perfect. He sat still and gazed with delightfully friendly eyes into Miss Maliphant's pleased countenance, and anon skipped across room or lawn to whisper beautiful nothings to Miss Kavanagh. The latter's change of fortune did not, apparently, seem to affect him in the least. After all, even now she was not as good a parte as Miss Maliphant, where money was concerned, but then there were other things. Whatever his outward manner might lead one to suspect, beyond doubt he thought a great deal at this time, and finally came to a conclusion. Joyce's fortune had helped her in many ways. It had helped many of the poor around her, too. 
but it did even more than that. It helped Mr. Beauclerk to make up his mind with regard to his matrimonial prospects. Sitting in his chambers in town with Lady Baltimore's letter before him that told him of the change in Joyce's fortune, of the fortune that had changed her, in fact, from a pretty penniless girl to a pretty rich one, he told himself that, after all, she had certainly been the girl for him since the commencement of their acquaintance. She was charming, not a whit more now than then. He would not belie his own taste so far as to admit that she was more desirable in any way now in her prosperity than when first he saw her and paid her the immense compliment of admiring her. He permitted himself to grow a little enthusiastic, however, to say out loud to himself, as it were, all that he had hardly allowed himself to think up to this. She was, beyond question, the most charming girl in the world. Such grace, such finish, a girl worthy of the love of the best of men, presumably himself. He had always loved her, always. He had never felt so sure of the, that delightful fact now. He had had a kind of knowledge, even when afraid to give ear to it that she was the wife best suited to him to be found anywhere. She understood him. They were thoroughly en rapport with each other. Their marriage would be a success in the deepest, sincerest meaning of the word. He leant luxuriously among the cushions of his chair, lit a fragrant cigarette, and ran his mind backward over many things. Well, perhaps so, but yet, if he had refrained from proposing to her until now, now when fate smiles upon her, it was simply because he dreaded dragging her into a marriage where she could not have all those little best things of life that so peerless a creature had every right to demand. Yes, it was for her sake alone he had hesitated. He feels sure of that now. He has thoroughly persuaded himself the purity of the motives that kept him tongue-tied when honor called aloud to him for speech. He feels himself so exalted that he metaphorically pats himself upon the back and tells himself he is a righteous being, a very brutus where honor is concerned. Any other man might have hurried that exquisite creature into a squalid marriage for the mere sake of gratifying an overpowering affection, but he had been above all that. He had considered her. The man's duty is ever to protect the woman. He had protected her, even from herself, for that she would have been only too willing to link her sweet fate with his at any price, was patent to all the world. Few people have felt as virtuous as Mr. Beauclerk as he comes to the end of this thread of his imaginings. Well, he will make it up to her. He smiles benignly through the smoke that rises round his nose. She shall never have reason to remember that he had not fallen on his knees to her, as a less considerate man might have done, when he was without the means to make her life as bright as it should be. The most eager of lovers must live, and eating is the first move towards that conclusion. Yet if he had given way to selfish desires they would scarcely, he and she, have had sufficient bread of any delectable kind to fill their mouths but now all would be different she clever girl had supplied the blank she had squared the difficulty having provided the wherewithal to keep body and soul together in a nice respectable fashionable modern sort of way her constancy shall certainly be rewarded he will go straight down to the court 
and declare her to the sentiments that have been warming his breast silently all these past months what a dear girl she is and so fond of him that in itself is an extra charm in her very delightful character and those fortunate thousands quite a quarter of a million isn't it well of course no use saying they won't come in handy no use being hypocritical over it horrid thing a hypocrite well those thousands naturally have their charm too he rose flung his cigarette aside it was finished as far as careful enjoyment would permit and rang for his servant to pack his portmanteau he was going to the court by the morning train now that he is here however he restrains the ardour that no doubt is consuming him with altogether admirable patience and waits for the chance that may permit him to lay his valuable affections at joyce's feet a dinner to be followed by an impromptu dance at the court suggests itself as a very fitting opportunity he grasps it yes to-morrow evening will be an excellent and artistic opening for a thing of this sort all through luncheon even while conversing with joyce and miss maliphant on various outside topics his versatile mind is arranging a picturesque spot in the garden enclosures wherein to make joyce a happy woman lady swansdown glancing across the table at him laughs lightly always disliking him she has still been able to read him very clearly and his determination to now propose to joyce amuses her nearly as much as it annoys her frivolous to the last degree as she is an honest regard for joyce has taken hold within her breast lord baltimore too is disturbed by his brother's present End of chapter 43 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 44 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org recording by Linda Marie Nielsen Vancouver BC April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford chapter 44 love took up the harp of life and smote on all the chords with might smoked the chord of self that trembling passed in music out of sight Lady Swansdown is startled into a remembrance of the present by the entrance of somebody. After all, Dicky, the troublesome, was right. This is no spot in which to sleep or dream. Turning her head with an indolent impatience to see who has come to disturb her, she meets Lady Baltimore's clear eyes. Some sharp pang of remorse, of fear, perhaps, compels her to spring to her feet and gaze at her hostess with an expression that is almost defiant dicky's words had so far taken effect that she now dreads and hates to meet the woman who once had been her staunch friend lady baltimore unable to ignore the look in her rival's eyes still advances toward her with unfaltering step perhaps a touch of disdain of contempt is perceptible in her own gaze because lady swansdown paling moves toward her she seems to have lost all self-control she is trembling violently it is a crisis what is it says lady swansdown harshly why do you look at me like that has it come to a close between us isabel oh if so vehemently it is better so i don't think i understand you says lady baltimore who has grown very white her tone is haughty 
she has drawn back a little as if to escape from contact with the other. Ah, that is so like you, says Lady Swansdown, with a rather fierce little laugh. You pretend, 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 from morning till night. You entrench yourself behind your pride, and— You know what you are doing, Beatrice, says Lady Baltimore, ignoring this outburst completely and speaking in a calm, level tone, yet with a face like marble. Yes, and you know too, says Lady Swanston, then, with an overwhelming vehemence, why don't you do something? Why don't you assert yourself? I shall never assert myself, says Lady Baltimore slowly. You mean that whatever comes you will not interfere. That exactly, turning her eyes full onto the other's face with terrible disdain. I shall never interfere in this or any other of his flirtations. It is a sharp stab, Lady Swanston winces visibly. What a woman you are, cries she. Have you ever thought of it, Isabel? You are unjust to him, unfair. You, passionately, treat him as though he were the dust beneath your feet, and yet you expect him to remain immaculate for your sake, pure as any acolyte, a thing of ice. No, coldly, you mistake me. I know too much of him to expect perfection, nay, common decency from him, but you, it was you whom I hoped to find immaculate. You expected too much, then. One iceberg in your midst is enough, and that you have kindly suggested in your own person. Put me out of the discussion altogether. Ah, I, you have made that impossible. I cannot do that. I have known you too long. I have liked you too well. I have, with a swift but terrible glance at her, loved you. Isabel! No, no, not a word. It is too late now. True, says Lady Swanston, bringing back the arms she had extended and letting them fall into a sudden, dull vehemence to her sides. Her agitation is uncontrolled. That was so long ago that, no doubt, you have forgotten all about it. You, bitterly, have forgotten a good deal. And you, says Lady Baltimore, very calmly, what have you not forgotten? Your self-respect, deliberately, among other things. Take care, take care, says Lady Swanston in a low tone. She has turned furiously upon her. Why should I take care? She throws up her small bead scornfully. Have I said one word too much? Too much indeed, says Lady Swansdown distinctively, but faintly. She turns her head, but not her eyes, in Isabel's direction. I am afraid you will have to endure for one day longer, she says in a low voice. After that you shall bid me a farewell that shall last for ever. You have come to a wise decision, says Lady Baltimore immovably. There is something so contemptuous in her whole bearing that it maddens the other. How dare you speak to me like that, cries she with sudden violence not to be repressed. You of all others, do you think you are not in fault at all? that you stand blameless before the world? The blood has flamed into her pale cheeks. Her eyes are on fire. She advances towards Lady Baltimore with such a passion of angry despair in look and tone that involuntarily the latter retreats before her. Who shall blame me? demands Lady Baltimore hotly. I, I for one, icicle that you are, how can you know what love means? You have no heart to feel, no longing to forgive. And what has he done to you? Nothing, nothing that any other woman would not gladly condone. You are a partisan, says Lady Baltimore coldly. You would plead his cause, and to me. 
You are violent, but that does not put you in the right. What do you know of Baltimore that I do not know? By what right do you defend him? There is such a thing as friendship. Is there? says the other with deep meaning. Is there, Beatrice? Oh, think, think. A little bitter smile curls the corners of her lips. That you should advocate the cause of friendship to me, says she, her words falling with cruel scorn one by one slowly from her lips. You think me false, says Lady Swanston. She is terribly agitated. There was an old friendship between us. I know that. I feel it. You think me altogether false to it? I think of you as little as I can help, says Isabel contemptuously. Why should I waste a thought on you? True, indeed, one so capable of controlling her emotions as you are need never give way to superfluous or useless thoughts. Still, give one to Baltimore. It is our last conversation together. Therefore bear with me, hear me. All his sins lie in the past. He, you must be mad to talk to me like this, interrupts Isabel, flushing crimson. Has he asked you to intercede for him? Could even he go so far as that? Is it a last insult? What are you to him that you thus adopt his cause? Answer me, cries she imperiously. All her coldness, her stern determination to suppress herself, seems broken up. Nothing, returns Lady Swanston, becoming calmer as she notes the other's growing venomance. I never shall be anything. I have but one excuse for my interference. She pauses. And that? I love him, steadily but faintly. Her eyes have sought the ground. Ah, says Lady Baltimore, it is true, slowly, it is equally true that he does not love me. Let me then speak. All his sins, believe me, lie behind him. That woman, that friend of yours who told you of his renewed acquaintance with Madame Istre, lied to you. There was no truth in what she said. I can quite understand you're not wishing to believe in that story, says Lady Baltimore with an undisguised sneer. Like all good women, you can take pleasure in inflicting a wound, says Lady Swanston, controlling herself admirably. But do not let your detestation of me blind you to the fact that my words contain truth. If you will listen, I can. Not a word, says Lady Baltimore, making a movement with her hands as if to efface the other. I will have none of your confidences. It seems to me, quickly, you are determined not to believe. You are at liberty to think as you will. The time may come, says Lady Swanston, when you will regret you did not listen to me today. Is that a threat? No, but I am going. There will be no further opportunity for you to hear me. You must pardon me if I say that I am glad of that says Lady Baltimore, her lips very white. I could have borne little more. Do what you will, go where you will, with whom you will, with deliberate insult, but at least spare me a repetition of such a scene as this. She turns, and with indescribably haughty gesture, leaves the room. End of chapter 44 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter number 45 of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 45 
The name of the slough was Despond. Dancing is going on in the small drawing room. A few night broghams are still arriving, and young girls, accompanied by their brothers only, are making the room look lovely. It is quite an impromptu affair, quite informal. Dicky Brown, altogether in his element, is flitting from flower to flower, saying beautiful nothings to any of the girls who are kind enough or silly enough to waste a moment on so irreclaimable a butterfly. He is not so entirely engrossed by his pleasing occupations, however, as to be lost to the more serious matters that are going on around him. He is specially struck by the fact that Lady Swansdown, who had been in charming spirits all through the afternoon and afterward at dinner, is now dancing a great deal with Beauclerk, of all people, and making herself apparently very delightful to him. His own personal belief up to this had been that she detested Beauclerk, and now to see her smiling upon him and favoring him with waltz after waltz upset Dicky's power of penetration to an almost fatal extent. I wonder what the deuce she is up to now, says he to himself, leaning against the wall behind him and giving voice unconsciously to the thoughts within him. Eh? says somebody in his ear. He looks round hastily to find Miss Maliphant has come to anchor on his left, and that her eyes, too, are directed on Beauclerk, who, with Lady Swansdown, is standing at the lower end of the room. A to you, says he brilliantly. I always rather fancied that Mr. Beauclerk and Lady Swansdown were antipathetic, says Miss Maliphant, in her usual heavy, downright way. There was room for it, says Mr. Brown gloomily. For it? Your fancy. Yes, so I think. Lady Swansdown has always seemed to me to be rather, rather a... Decidedly so, agrees Mr. Brown. As for Beauclerk, he is quite too dreadfully rather, don't you think? I don't know, I am sure. He has often seemed to me a little light, but only on the surface. You've read him, says Mr. Brown, with a confidential nod. Light on the surface, but deep, deep, as a draw well. I don't think I mean what you do, says Miss Maliphant quickly. However, we are not discussing Mr. Beauclerk, beyond the fact that we wonder to see him so genial with Lady Swansdown. They used to be thoroughly antagonistic, and now, why, they seem quite good friends, don't they? Quite thick, eh? With her usual graceful phraseology. Thick as thieves in Valambrosia, says Mr. Brown, with increasing gloom. Miss Maliphant turns to regard him doubtfully. Leaves, suggests she. Thieves, persists he immovably. Ah, uh, oh, ah, uh, it's a joke, perhaps, says she, the doubt growing. Mr. Brown fixes a stern eye upon her. Is thy servant a dog, says he, and stalks indignantly away, leaving Miss Maliphant in the throes of uncertainty. Yet I am sure it wasn't the right word, says she to herself with a wonderful frown of perplexity. However, I may be wrong, often I am, and, after all, Spain, we're told, is full of them. Whether thieves or leaves, she doesn't explain, and presently her mind wanders entirely away from Mr. Brown's moderating to the subject that so much more nearly interests her. Beauclerk has not been quite so impressé in his manner to her tonight, not so altogether delightful, 
he has indeed it seems to her shirked her society a good deal and has not been so assiduous about the scribbling of his name upon her card as usual and then this sudden friendship with lady swansdown what does he mean by that what does she mean if she had only known if the answer to her latter question had been given to her her mind would have grown easier and the idea of lady swansdown in the form of a rival would have been laid at rest for ever as a fact lady swansdown hardly understands herself to-night that scene with her hostess has upset her mentally and bodily and created in her a wild desire to get away from herself and from baltimore at any cost some idle freak has induced her to use beauclerk who is detestable to her as a safeguard from both and he unsettled in his own mind and eager to come to conclusions with joyce and her fortune has lent himself to the wiles of his waldom foe and is permitting himself to be charmed by her fascinating if vagrant mood perhaps in all her life lady swanston has never looked so lovely as to-night excitement and mental disturbance have lent a dangerous brilliancy to her eyes a touch of color to her cheek there is something electric about her that touches those who gaze on her and warms herself that a crisis is at hand up to this she has been able to elude all baltimore's attempts at conversation has refused all his demands for dance yet this same knowledge that the night will not go by without a denouement of some kind between her and him is terribly present to her to-night the last night she will ever see him in all human probability the exaltation that enables her to endure this thought is fraught with such agony that brave and determined as she is it is almost too much for her yet she isabel she should learn that old friendship between them was no fable to-night it would bear fruit false she believed her well she should see in a way she clung to beauclerk as a means of escaping baltimore throwing out a thousand wiles to charm him to her side and succeeding three times she had given a smiling no to lord baltimore's demand for a dance and regardless of opinion had flung herself into a wild and open flirtation with beauclerk but it is growing toward midnight and her strength is failing her these people will they never go will she never be able to seek her own room and solitude and despair without calling down comment on her head and giving isabel that cold woman the chance of sneering at her weakness a sudden sense of the uselessness of it all has taken possession of her her heart sinks it is at this moment that baltimore once more comes up to her this dance says he it is halfway through you are not engaged i suppose as you are sitting down may i have what remains of it she makes a little gesture of acquiescence and rising places her hand upon his arm end of chapter forty five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c